Section 15 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Death of Charles the Bold, A.D. 1477. Louis XI unites Burgundy with the crown of France by Philippe de Comines. During the greater part of his rule as Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold was at war with Louis XI of France, notwithstanding the Treaty of Peron, 1468, which the French monarch accepted under duress. Meanwhile, it was the constant aim of Charles to enlarge his dukedom, and when, in 1475, he had made another peace with Louis, the duke turned anew to his scheme of conquest. Charles soon made himself master of Lorraine, which he had long coveted, and then, 1476, invaded Switzerland. It was reserved for a small people, already celebrated for their heroic valor and their love of liberty, to beat this powerful man. Crossing the Jura, Charles besieged the little town of Grandson, and after its capitulation, he hanged or drowned all the defenders. When the news of this barbarity had spread through Switzerland, the eight cantons arose, and almost under the walls of Grandson, the Swiss inflicted upon Charles a crushing defeat. In June, 1476, the duke saw his second army destroyed by the Swiss and the Lorrainers, whom Comines calls Germans. In the following winter, Charles assembled a third army and marched against Nancy, the capital of Lorraine, which was then held by the same allies. They were commanded by the Duke of Lorraine, who went to the relief of the garrison at Nancy from Saint Nicolas, six miles away. Comines, whose account is given below, was a French statesman and historian, who, after being for a time in the service of Charles the Bold, went over to Louis and became his personal counselor. He was therefore intimately versed in the history of these times. The Duke of Lorraine and his army of Germans broke up from Saint Nicolas and advanced toward the Duke of Burgundy with the resolution to give him battle. The Count of Campobasso joined them that very day and carried off with him about eight score men at arms, and it grieved him much that he could do his master no greater mischief. The garrison of Nancy had intelligence of his design which in some measure encouraged them to hold out. Besides, another person had got over the works and assured them of relief, otherwise they were just upon surrendering and would have capitulated in a little time had it not been for the treachery of this count. But God had determined to finish this mystery. The Duke of Burgundy, having intelligence of the approach of the Duke of Lorraine's army, called a kind of council, contrary to his custom, for generally he followed his own will. It was the opinion of most of his officers that his best way would be to retire to pont a mousson which was not far off, and dispose his army in the towns about Nancy. Affirming that, as soon as the Germans had thrown a supply of men and provisions into Nancy, they would march off again, and the Duke of Lorraine, being in great want of money, it would be a great while before he would be able to assemble such an army again, and that their supplies of provisions could not be so great but, before half the winter was over, they would be in the same straits as they were now, and that in the meantime the duke might raise more forces and recruit himself, for I have been told by those who ought to know best that the Duke of Burgundy's army did not then consist of full four thousand men, and of that number not above one thousand two hundred were in a condition to fight. Money he did not want, for in the castle of Luxembourg, which was not far off, there were in ready cash 450,000 crowns, which would have raised men enough. But God was not so merciful to him as to permit him to take this wise counsel, or discern the vast multitude of enemies who on every side surrounded him. Therefore he chose the worst plan, and, like a rash and inconsiderate madman, resolved to try his fortune and engage the enemy with his weak and shattered army. Notwithstanding, the Duke of Lorraine had a numerous force of Germans, and the king's army was not far off. As soon as the Count of Campobasso arrived in the Duke of Lorraine's army, 
the Germans sent him word to leave the camp immediately, for they would not entertain such traitors among them. Upon which message he retired with his party to Condé, a castle and pass not far off, where he fortified himself with carts and other things as well as he could, in hopes that, if the Duke of Burgundy were routed, he might have an opportunity of coming in for a share of the plunder, as he did afterward. Nor was this practice with the Duke of Lorraine the most execrable action that Campobasso was guilty of, but before he left the army, he conspired with several other officers, finding it was impracticable to attempt anything against the Duke of Burgundy's person, to leave him just as they came to the charge. For at that time he supposed it would put the army into the greatest terror and consternation. And if the duke fled, he was sure he could not escape alive, for he had ordered thirteen or fourteen sure men to run as soon as the Germans came up to charge them, and others to watch the duke of Burgundy and kill him in the rout. Which was well enough contrived, for I myself have seen two or three of those who were thus employed to kill the duke. Having thus settled his conspiracy at home, he went over to the Duke of Lorraine upon the approach of the German army, but, finding they would not entertain him, he retired to Condé, as I said before. The German army marched forward, and with them a considerable body of French horse, whom the king had given leave to be present in that action. Several parties lay in ambush not far off, that, if the Duke of Burgundy were routed, they might surprise some person of quality, or take some considerable booty. By this everyone may see into what a deplorable condition this poor duke had brought himself by his contempt of good counsel. Both armies being joined, the Duke of Burgundy's forces, which had been twice beaten before, and were weak and ill-provided besides, were quickly broken and entirely defeated. Many saved themselves by flight, the rest were either taken or killed, and among them the Duke of Burgundy himself was killed on the spot. Not having been in the battle myself, I will say nothing of the manner of his death, but I was told by some that they saw him beaten down, but being prisoners themselves, they were not able to assist him. Yet, while they were in sight, he was not killed, but a great body of men coming that way afterward, they killed and stripped him in the throng, not knowing who he was. This battle was fought on January 5th, 1476, upon the eve of the twelfth day. The king, having established posts in all parts of his kingdom, which before never had been done, he was not long ere he received the news of the Duke of Burgundy's defeat, and he was in hourly expectation of the report, for letters of advice had reached him before, importing that the German army was advancing toward the Duke of Burgundy's, and that a battle was expected between them. Upon which, many persons kept their ears open for the news, in order to carry it to the king. For his custom was to reward liberally any person who brought him the first tidings of any news of importance, and to remember the messenger besides. His majesty also took great delight in talking of it before it arrived, and would say, I will give so much to any man who first brings me such and such news. The lord, Du Bouchage, and I, being together, happened to receive the first news of the Battle of Morat, and we went with it to the king who gave each of us two hundred marks of silver. The Lord du Lude, who lay without the Plessis, had the first news of the arrival of the courier, with the letters concerning the Battle of Nancy. He commanded the courier to deliver him the packet, and as he was a great favorite of the king's, he durst not refuse him. By break of day the next morning, the Lord du Lude knocked at the door next to the king's chamber, and, it being opened, he delivered in the packet from the Lord of Craon and the other officers, but none of the first letters gave any certainty of the Duke's death. They only stated that he was seen to run away and that it was supposed he had made his escape. The king was at first so transported with joy at the news he scarce knew how to behave himself. However, his majesty was still in some perplexity. On one hand, he was afraid that if the Duke should be taken prisoner by the Germans, by means of his money, of which he had great store, he would make some composition with them. On the other hand, he was doubtful if the duke had made his escape, though defeated for the third time, whether he should seize upon his towns in Burgundy or not, which he judged not very difficult to do, since most of the brave men of that country had been slain in those three battles. 
As to this last point, he came to this resolution, which I believe few were acquainted with but myself, that if the duke were alive and well, he would command the army which lay ready in Champagne and Barrois to march immediately into Burgundy and seize upon the whole country while it was in that state of terror and consternation. And when he was in possession of it, he would inform the duke that the seizure he had made was only to preserve it for him and secure it against the Germans, because it was held under the sovereignty of the crown of France, and therefore he was unwilling it should fall into their hands, and whatever he had taken should be faithfully restored. And truly, I am of opinion his majesty would have done it, though many people who are ignorant of the motives that guided the king will not easily believe it. But this resolution was altered as soon as he was certain of the Duke of Burgundy's death. Upon the king's receiving the above-mentioned first letter, which gave no account of the duke's death, he immediately sent to Tours to summon all of his captains and other great personages to attend him. Upon their arrival, he communicated his letters to them. They all pretended great joy, but to such as more narrowly observed their behavior, it was easy to be discerned that most of them did but feign it. And notwithstanding all their outward dissimulation, they had been better pleased if the Duke of Burgundy had been successful. The reason of this might be, because the king was greatly feared, and now, if he should find himself clear and secure from his enemies, they were afraid they would be reduced, or at least their offices and pensions retrenched, for there were several present who had been engaged against him with his brother, the Duke of Guienne, in the confederacy called the public good. After his majesty had discourse with them for some time, he went to mass and then ordered dinner to be laid in his chamber and made them all dine with him, there being with him his chancellor and some other lords of his council. The king's discourse at dinner time was about this affair, and I well remember that myself and others took particular notice how those who were present dined. But to speak truth, whether for joy or sorrow I cannot tell, there was not one of them that half filled his belly, and certainly it could not have been from modesty or bashfulness before the king, for there was not one among them but had dined with his majesty many times before. As soon as the king rose from table he retired, and distributed to some person certain lands belonging to the Duke of Burgundy, as though he had been dead. He dispatched the bastard of Bourbon, admiral of France, and myself into those parts, with full power to receive the homage of all such as were willing to submit and become his subjects. He ordered us to set out immediately, and gave us commission to open all his letters and packets which we might meet by the way, that thereby we might ascertain whether the duke was dead or alive. We departed with all speed, though it was the coldest weather I ever felt in my life. We had not ridden above half a day's journey when we met a courier, and commanding him to deliver his letters we learned by them that the Duke of Burgundy was slain, and that his body had been found among the dead and recognized by an Italian page that attended him, and by one Monsieur Loup, a Portuguese, who was his physician, and who assured the Lord of Craon that it was the Duke his master, and the Lord of Craon notified the same at once to the king. Upon receiving this news, we rode directly to the suburbs of Abbeville, and there were the first that announced the intelligence to the duke's adherents in those parts. We found the inhabitants of the town in treaty with the Lord of Torcy, for whom they had held a great affection for a long time. The soldiers and officers of the Duke of Burgundy negotiated with us, by means of a messenger whom he had sent to them beforehand. And in confidence of success, they dismissed four hundred Flemings, who were then quartered in the town. The citizens, laying hold of this opportunity, opened the gates immediately to the Lord of Torcy, to the great prejudice and disadvantage of the captains and officers of the garrison, for there were seven or eight of them to whom, by virtue of the king's authority, we had promised money and pensions for life but they never enjoyed the benefit of that promise, because the town was not surrendered by them. Abbeville was one of the towns that Charles the Seventh delivered up by the Treaty of Arras in the year 1435, which towns were to return to the crown of France upon default of issue mail, so that their admitting us so easily is not so much to be wondered at. From thence we marched to Dourlan and sent a summons to Arras, the chief town in Artois, 
and formerly part of the patrimony of the earls of Flanders, which for want of heirs male always descended to the daughters. The lord of Ravestein and the lord de Corde, who were in the town of Arath, offered to enter into a treaty with us at Mount St. Aloy and to bring some of the chief citizens with them. It was concluded that I and some others should meet them in the king's behalf, but the admiral refused to go himself because he presumed they would not consent to grant all our demands. I had not been long at the place of appointment when the two above-mentioned lords of Ravestein and de Corde arrived, attended by several persons of quality, and by certain commissioners on the part of the city, one of whom was their pensionary, named Monsieur Jean de la Vacquerie, whom they appointed to be their spokesman, and who since that time has been made first president of the Parliament of Paris. We demanded in the king's name to have the gates immediately opened and to be received into the town, for both the town and the whole country belonged to the king by right of confiscation, and if they refused to obey this summons, they would be in danger of being besieged and compelled to submit by force, since their duke was defeated and his dominions utterly unprovided with means of defense upon account of their irrecoverable losses in the three late battles. The lords returned answer by their speaker, Monsieur Jean de la Vacquerie, that the county of Artois belonged to the Lady of Burgundy, daughter of Duke Charles, and descended to her in a right line from Margaret, Countess of Flanders, Artois, Burgundy, Nevers, and Rethel, who was married to Philip I, Duke of Burgundy, son of King John of France, and younger brother to King Charles V. Wherefore they humbly entreated the king that he would observe and continue the truce that had existed between him and the late Duke of Burgundy, her father. Our conference was but short, for we expected to receive this answer, but the chief design of my going thither was to have a private conference with some persons that were there to try if I could bring them over to the king's interest. I made overtures to some of them, who soon afterward did his majesty's signal service. We found the whole country in a state of great consternation, and not without cause, for in eight days' time they would scarce have been able to raise eight men-at-arms, and for other soldiers there were not in the whole country above one thousand five hundred, reckoning horse and foot together, that had escaped from the battle in which the Duke of Burgundy was slain, and they were quartered about Namur and Hainaut. Their former haughty language was much altered now, and they spoke with more submission and humility. Not that I would upbraid them with excessive arrogance in times past, but, to speak impartially, in my time they thought themselves so powerful that they spoke neither of nor to the king with the same respect as they have done since. And if people were wise, they would always use such moderate language in their days of prosperity that in the time of adversity they would not need to change it. I returned to the admiral, to give him an account of our conference. And there I was informed that the king was coming toward us, and that upon receiving the news of the duke's death, he immediately set out, having dispatched several letters in his own and his officers' names, to send after him what forces could presently be assembled, with which he hoped to reduce the provinces I have just mentioned to his obedience. The king was overjoyed to see himself rid of all those whom he hated and who were his chief enemies. On some of them he had been personally revenged, as on the constable of France, the Duke of Nemours, and several others. His brother, the Duke of Guienne, was dead, and His Majesty came to the succession of the duchy. The whole house of Anjou was extinct. René, King of Sicily, John and Nicholas, son of Calabria, and since then their cousin, the Count Dumaine, afterward made Count of Provence. The Count d'Armagnac had been killed at Lestor, and the king had got the estates and movables of all of them. But the house of Burgundy, being greater and more powerful than the rest, having maintained war with Charles the Seventh, our master's father, for two and thirty years together without any cessation, by the assistance of the English, and having their dominions bordering upon the kings and their subjects always inclinable to invade his kingdom, the king had reason to be more than ordinarily pleased at the death of that duke, and he triumphed more in his ruin than in that of all the rest of his enemies, as he thought that nobody, for the future, either of his own subjects or his neighbors, would be able to oppose him or disturb the tranquility of his reign. 
he was at peace with England and made it his chief business to continue so. Yet though he was freed in this manner from all his apprehensions, God did not permit him to take such courses in the management of his affairs as were most proper to promote his own interests and designs. And certainly, although God Almighty has shown, and does still show, that his determination is to punish the family of Burgundy severely, not only in the person of the duke, but in its subjects and estates, yet I think the king our master did not take right measures to gain his end, for, if he had acted prudently, instead of pretending to conquer them, he should rather have endeavored to annex all those large territories to which he had no just title to the crown of France by some treaty of marriage, or to have gained the hearts and affections of the people, and so have brought them over to his interest, which he might without any great difficulty have effected, considering how their late afflictions had impoverished and dejected them. If he had acted after that manner, he would not only have prevented their ruin and destruction, but extended and strengthened his own kingdom, and established them all in a firm and lasting peace. He might by this means have eased his own country of its intolerable grievances, and particularly of the marches and countermarches of his troops, which are commanded continually up and down from one end of the kingdom to the other, sometimes upon very slight occasions. In the Duke of Burgundy's lifetime, the king often talked with me about this affair, and told me what he would do if he should outlive the duke, and his discourse at that time was very rational and wise. He told me he would propose a match between his son and the Duke of Burgundy's daughter, and if she would not consent to that, on the ground that the Dauphin was too young, he would then endeavor to marry her to some young prince of his kingdom, by which means he might keep her and her subjects in amity, and obtain without war what he intended to lay claim to for himself. And this was his resolution, not more than a week before he heard of the Duke of Burgundy's death. But the very day he received that news, his mind began to change, and this wise counsel was laid aside when the admiral and I were dispatched into those provinces. However, the king spoke little of what he intended to do, only to some few that were about him he promised sundry of the duke's lordships and possessions. As the king was upon the road toward us, he received from all parts the welcome news of the delivering up the castles of Han and Bouhain, and that the inhabitants of Saint-Quentin had secured that town for themselves, and opened their gates to their neighbor, the lord of Mouy. He was certain of Peron, which was commanded by Master William Biche, and by the overtures that we and several other persons had made him, he was in great hopes that the lord de Cordes would strike in with his interest. To Ghent he sent his barber, Master Oliver, born in a small village not far off, and other agents he sent to other places, with great expectations from all of them, and most of them promised him very fair, but performed nothing. Upon the king's arrival near Peron, I went to wait on his majesty, and at the same time William Biche and others brought him the surrender of the town of Peron, with which he was extremely pleased. The king stayed there that day, and I dined with him, according to my usual custom, for it was his humor to have seven or eight always with him at table, and sometimes many more. After dinner he withdrew, and seemed not to be at all pleased with the admiral's little exploit and mine. He told us he had sent his barber, Master Oliver, to Ghent, and he doubted not, but he would persuade that town to submit to him, and Robinet d'Audenfort to Saint-Omer, as he had great interest there. And these his majesty extolled as fit persons to manage such affairs, to receive the keys of great towns, and to put garrisons of his troops into them. He also mentioned others whom he had employed in the same negotiation and other places. While the king was busy in subduing towns and places in the marches of Picardy, his army was in Burgundy, under the command, apparently, of the Prince of Orange a native and subject of the county of Burgundy, but one who had recently, for the second time, become an enemy of Duke Charles, so that the king made use of him, because he was a powerful noble in both the country and duchy of Burgundy, and likewise well-connected and greatly beloved. But the lord of Craon was the king's lieutenant, and had the real charge of the army, and was the person in whom the king reposed most confidence, for he was a man of great wisdom, 
and thoroughly devoted to his master, though somewhat too fond of gain. This lord of Craon, when he drew near Burgundy, sent forward the prince of Orange and others to Dijon to use persuasion and require the people to render obedience to the king, and they managed the matter so adroitly, principally by means of the prince of Orange, that the city of Dijon and all the other towns in the duchy of Burgundy together with many in the country, gave their allegiance to the king. End of section 15 Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. Section 16 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mira Williams. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Inquisition Established in Spain, A.D. 1480, by William H. Rule. Inquisition Established in Spain, A.D. 1480, William H. Rule, James Balms. Prior to the twelfth century, the church authorities had been content with defining heresy, while the treatment of heretics was left to secular magistrates. But the spread of heresy at the end of the twelfth century caused the episcopal authorities to look for some occasion for enlarging their prerogatives. In 1204, Pope Innocent III appointed a papal delegate with authority to judge and punish misbelievers. From this germ sprung the Holy Office, commonly known as the Inquisition. This papal act met with some opposition from the bishops upon whose prerogatives it encroached, and it provoked rebellion among those against whom it was directed, the Albigenses of southern France, whose doctrines were spreading into Italy. In 1208, Innocent began a crusade against them, which was led by Arnold of Citeaux and Simon de Montfort, and proved a bloody war of extermination lasting several years. Meanwhile, the papacy gradually proceeded into the design of creating a tribunal under its own direct control. Such a tribunal was soon practically instituted. Its leading spirit was St. Dominic, founder of the Dominican Order of Preaching Friars, but the title of Inquisitor was not yet adopted at the time of his death in 1221. St. Dominic, however, is with good reason regarded as the founder of the Inquisition. After the death of St. Dominic, the Inquisition gradually assumed a more definite and avowed character, and its repressive hand, inflicting terrible punishments upon accused heretics, was soon felt throughout southern Europe and later in the Netherlands, the Order of St. Dominic at first furnishing its principal agents. But later the Inquisition entered upon another stage, under Spanish direction, through a specific organization— practically independent of papal or royal control, though acting under the sanction of both church and state. It became, quote, the most formidable and irresponsible engines in the annals of religious institutions, end quote. Two points of view, Protestant and Catholic, are here represented of the Spanish history of the Holy Office. William H. Rule, quote, better and happier luck for Spain, end quote. I translate the words of Mariana, quote, was the establishment in Castile, which took place about this time, of a new and holy tribunal of severe and grave judges, for the purpose of making inquest and chastising heretical pravity and apostasy, judges other than bishops, on whose charge and authority this office was anciently incumbent. For this intent the Roman pontiffs gave them authority, and order was given that the princes should help them with their favor and arm. These judges were called inquisitors, because of the office which they exercised of hunting out and making inquest, a custom now very general in Italy, France, Germany, and also in the kingdom of Aragon. Castile henceforth would not suffer any nation to go beyond her in the desire which she always had to punish such enormous and wicked excesses. We find mention before this of some inquisitors who discharged this function, but not in the manner and force of those who followed them. The chief author and instrument of this salutary grant was the Cardinal of Spain, Mendoza, who had seen that, in consequence of the great liberty of past years, and from the mingling of the Moors and Jews with Christians in all sorts of conversation and trade, 
many things went out of order in the kingdom. With that liberty it was impossible that some of the Christians should not be infected, many more leaving the religion which they had voluntarily embraced as converts from Judaism, again apostatized and returned to their old superstition, an evil which prevailed more in Seville than in any other part. In that city, therefore, secret searches were first made, and they severely punished those whom they found guilty. If their delinquency was considerable, after having kept them long time imprisoned, and after having tormented them, they burned them. If it was light, they punished the offenders, with the perpetual dishonor of their family. Of not a few they confiscated the goods and condemned them to imprisonment for life. On most of them they put a San Benito, which is a sort of scapulary of yellow color, with a red St. Andrew's cross, that they might go marked among their neighbors, and bear a signal that should affright and scare by the greatness of the punishment and of the disgrace, a plan which experience has shown to be very salutary, although, at first, it seemed very grievous to the natives. End quote. Cardinal Mendoza might have been an instrument of establishing the new tribunal in Spain, but no author was wanted for that work. Pope Gregory the Ninth, fit successor of Innocent the Third, had completed in Spain, as in the county of Toulouse and Kingdom of France, the scheme which his uncle Innocent began. By a bull, dated May 26, 1232, he appointed Dominican friars inquisitors in Aragon, and forthwith proceeded to confer the same benefits on the kingdoms of Navarre, Castile, and Portugal, Grenada being in possession of the Moors. Ten years later, in a council at Tarragona, the chief technicalities of the Spanish Inquisition were settled. At the invitation of Peter, Archbishop of Tarragona, Raymond of Peñaforte, the Pope's penitentiary, presided. The definitions of the council are notable for the determination they evidence to conduct the affairs of the tribunal with entire legal precision and formality. The vocabulary was now settled, and one has only to turn to the acts of the Council of Tarragona to find the exact meaning of, quote, heretic, believer, suspected, simple, vehement, most vehement, favorer, concealer, receiver, receptacle, defender, a better, relapsed. End quote. As everyone may well know, no inconsiderable part of the Spanish population consisted of Jews, many of whose ancestors had taken refuge in that country, or had settled there for purposes of commerce, ages before the birth of our Lord, and their number had been increased from time to time in consequence of imperial edicts which drove them from Italy, or by the attractions of honor and wealth in Spain. They were the most industrious and therefore the most wealthy people in those kingdoms, and had possessed great influence. Their learned men occupied important stations such as physicians, agents of government, and even officers of the state, while the new Christians, or Jews professedly converted to Christianity, were intermarried with the highest families in Spain, and all this had taken place in spite of the enmity which clergy, popular bigotry, and the adverse legislation of Cortes or parliaments. But the wealth which procured Jews and new Christians so much worldly influence became the occasion of great suffering. The old Christians, being less industrious and therefore less affluent, were frequently their debtors. And although usury was checked by legislators, who dreaded its pressure on themselves, and debts were often repudiated, the Jews maintained their position of creditors. And as the Cartilla says, creditors are often unreasonable persons, or at least are considered to be such. Christians of pure blood, therefore, finding themselves involved in long reckonings, became increasingly impatient, and, under a cloak of zeal for the Catholic religion, were incessantly embroiling them with the magistracy or stirring up the populace against them. Urente estimates the number of Jews who perished under the fury of mobs in the year 1391 at upwards of 100,000. To evade persecution, multitudes submitted to be baptized. More than a million had changed name at the end of the 14th century. After those tumults, controversial preachers such as San Vicente Ferrer declaimed for popery against Judaism, and in the first ten years of the 15th century a second multitude of forced converts threw themselves into the bosom of the Romish church, to the discouragement of their brethren, and to their own confusion at last. 
They were set under the keenest vigilance of the inquisitors, without being able even to counterfeit any attachment to the church, whose most grievous yoke they had put on, but which in heart they hated. Now the church gloried over the declension of Judaism. In presence of Benedict the Thirteenth, Antipope, a Spaniard, wandering in Spain, because in Rome they would not own him, a formal disputation was carried on for sixty-nine days between Jerome de Santve and other converts, or as the Jews not improperly called them, apostates, on the one side, and a company of rabbis on the other. Such a controversy, carried on even in the presence of a half-pope, could only come to the prescribed conclusion. And after seeing all persuasion and corruption exhausted to bring over the Hebrews to his sect, but without much success, Benedict closed the debate, pronounced the Jews vanquished, and gave them notice of severer measures. The richer from interest, the poorer from bigotry, and the priesthood from instinct poured contempt on even proselytes, whom they classified according to their supposed degrees of heredoxy. Some were called converts, to note the newness of their Christianity. Others confessed, to tell that they had confessed the falseness of Judaism. Sometimes they were branded as Maranos, from the word Maranatha, which the priests in their ignorance took to mean accursed. The whole were spoken of as a generation of Maranos, or, worst of all in the imagination of the papist, Jews. Goaded by the cowardly persecution, the proselytes groaned after deliverance, a few even dared to renounce the profession of a faith they never held, and many resumed the practice of Jewish rites in private. This opened a new field to the zeal of inquisitors, but the labor of suppressing a revolt so widely spread, so rapidly extending, and even infecting the Romish families with whom the imperfect converts were united, was more than the inquisitors could undertake without a more powerfully organized system of their own. I believe that the fear of the Bible and the hatred of the Jews of Spain first imprinted in the page of history by the Council of Illiberis in the beginning of the fourth century, was in course of time much aggravated by the earnest love of the Spanish Jews for the original scriptures of the Old Testament. It was not until the eleventh century that rabbinical tradition gained much hold in the Jewish mind in Spain, but, from the first, Christians had cursed Jews in sincere but blind zeal against the descendants, as they thought, of those who had crucified our Lord in Jerusalem. Yet the Sephardim in Spain could have no knowledge of the crucifixion until some weeks at soonest after it had taken place, and perhaps never knew of the hostility of the Jews in Jerusalem against the Savior. Until the dispersion of the Eastern colleges in the eleventh century, no great rabbis came into Spain with pretension of authority to enforce Talmudical traditions. When zealots of the sort did come, they found a community of Hebrews far superior to the Jews of Palestine. No Assyrian had bribed them to worship the gods of Nineveh. Their neighbors, the Carthaginians, so long as Carthage stood, had persisted in worshiping the Baal and the Ashtaroth that recreant Israelites in Samaria and Jews in Jerusalem worshipped for ages. But while those gods had altars in Sidon and in Carthage, we do not hear of any altars being raised to them in the captivity of Jerusalem which is in Sepharad, or Spain, Obadiah 20. Neither do we hear that those Jews betrayed any ambition to make a hedge to protect God's law, instead of taking care to keep it. But the first propagators of traditionism in Spain came from the East, on the breaking up of the great schools of Babylonia by the Persians. Ancient or Karite synagogues remained in Spain until the expulsion of Jews at the close of the 15th century, and yet much later in the provinces that were not annexed to the United Kingdom of Castilla and Leon under Ferdinand and Isabella. Some of the strongest features of biblical learning imparted to the literature of the Reformation in its earliest stages proceeded from the converted Jews of Spain. About the year 1470, when the persecution of both Jews and Mohammedans was at its height, except in the kingdom of Grenada, and when the testimony quoted from the Old Testament against worship of images must have been extremely galling to the worshippers, the priests thought it necessary to enforce the prohibition of vernacular versions of the Bible. Such versions, we know, were then circulated more freely in France, Spain, and Portugal. In Spain, one of the chief translators was Rabbi Moses of Toledo. To put a stop to Bible reading, an appeal was made to Pope Paul II, 
who prohibited the translation of the Holy Scriptures, quote, into the languages of the nations, end quote. This authority was quoted in the Council of Trent by Cardinal Pacheco in justification of the practice of the Church of Rome in his day, but another cardinal, Madrucci, arguing against him, replied with cutting calmness that, quote, Paul of Popes II, end quote, or any other pope, might be easily deceived in judging of the fitness or unfitness of a law, but not so Paul the Apostle, who taught that God's words should never depart from the mouth of the faithful. During the persecutions of the 15th century, while Ferdinand and Isabella made progress in reconquering the kingdom of Grenada from the Moors, and Mohammedanism, like Judaism, was declining, the Moriscos, a middle class, resembling new Christians, and not less dangerous to Romanism, also challenged the powers of the Inquisition. No other country in popedom was at that time more deeply imbued with disaffection of the doctrines and worship of the Church of Rome. Then, in 1477, one Brother Philip de Barbary, a Sicilian inquisitor, came to the court of Ferdinand and Isabella, who were sovereigns of Sicily, to solicit the confirmation of some privileges recently granted to the Holy Office in that island, and, having observed the peril of the Church within the enlarged and united dominions of the Catholic kings, under whose rule nearly all Spain was comprehended, advised the creation of one undivided court of inquisition, like that of Sicily, as the only means of defense against the Moranos, Moriscos, Jews, and Mussulmans. The advice was quickly taken, first of all from the Dominicans, and after them the dignitaries of the secular clergy, crowded round the throne to pray for a reformation of the Inquisition after the Sicilian model. They appealed to the greed of King Ferdinand by offering him the proceeds of a confiscation which might be rapidly effected, in pursuance of laws of the Church that to that intent provided. They appealed to the piety of Queen Isabella, and were careful that tales of Jewish murders and Jewish desecrations should be poured incessantly into the royal ear. Ferdinand had no scruple. He sincerely prayed the Pope to sanction such a measure, and, swiftly as couriers could bring it, came the desired bull. Isabella could not blame the zeal of priests and monks, for she too was a zealot. She could not gainsay the urgency of the nuncio. She could not quench in her husband's bosom the thirst for gold. But she had brought half the kingdom as her dower, and therefore some deference was due to her conscience and judgment, and both in conscience and judgment she desired gentler measures. During two or three years her orator and confessor wrote books, and preachers were permitted to publish arguments, and disputants to enter into conferences for the conviction of the Jews. At Her Majesty's request, Cardinal Mendoza issued a constitution in Seville, in 1478, containing, quote, the form that should be observed with a Christian from the day of his birth, as well as the sacrament of baptism, as in all other sacraments which he ought to receive, and of what he should be taught and ought to do and believe as a faithful Christian, every day, and at all times of his life, until the day of his death. And he ordered this to be published in all the churches of the city, and put in tables in each parish, as a settled constitution. He also published a summary of what curates and clerks should teach their parishioners, and what the parishioners should observe and show to their children." Thus does Hernando de Pulgar, in his Chronicle of the Catholic Sovereigns, describe what some too hastily call a catechism. It was merely a standard of things to be believed and done, set forth by authority. The king and queen also, not the cardinal, commanded, quote, some friars, clerks, and other religious persons to teach the people, end quote. But no true Jew would let himself be taught that idolatry is not damnable, and even the less discouraging issues of controversy with the vacillating or the ignorant were not honestly reported. The constitution of Cardinal Mendoza and the harangues of the friars were ineffectual, as well they might be, for the Jews knew that the Christians had a sacred book, said to be written by divine inspiration, as well as the law of Moses, and if that book was not put into their hands, they could scarcely be expected to believe a religion whose chief written authority was kept out of sight. That it was, indeed, kept out of sight was undeniable, and the notorious Alfonso de Castro, chaplain of Philip II, boasted in his book against the heresies that there was, quote, an edict of the most illustrious and Catholic sovereigns of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, in which, under the severest penalties, 
They forbade anyone to translate the Holy Scriptures into a vulgar language, or to have any such version in his possession. For they were afraid, lest any occasion of error should be given to the people over whom God had made them governors. End quote. The clergy maintained that conversion to the truth by argument was impossible, and, at their insistence, the bull was no longer kept in reserve, but was published in 1480. The Queen's trial of humanity was ended, but a question of policy remained. The King and Queen remembered that they had an interest in Spain as well as the Pope, but they scarcely knew how that interest could be guarded if the Inquisitors were allowed absolute power over the persons and property of their subjects. To have proposed lay assessors in open court would have provoked a quarrel with the Pope, then powerful enough to raise Europe in arms against them. Therefore they modestly requested no more than some priests nominated by the king should be associated with some others nominated by the Pope, or that the king should name all and the Pope confirm his nominations. The Catholic sovereigns calculated that nominees of Rome would, of course, prefer the rights of the Church to those of the crown, but they fancied, or they wished to fancy, that priests of their own choice would prefer their interests to those of a stranger. This was an illusion, and therefore Rome made little difficulty. And after due correspondence and some changes, the Supreme Council of the Spanish Inquisition was constituted thus. Inquisitor General, Friar Thomas de Torquemada, of whom Urente says that it was hardly possible that there could have been another man so capable of fulfilling the attentions of King Ferdinand, by multiplying confiscations those of the court of Rome, by propagating their jurisdictional and pecuniary maxims, and those of the projectors of the Inquisition, by infusing terror into the people by public executions. Two assessors, Juan Gutierrez de Chambes and Tristan de Medina, juris consults, three kings councillors, Don Alonso Carrillo, a bishop-elect, with Sancho's Velasquez de Cuellar and Poncio de Valencia, doctors of civil law. In matters relating to royal power, they were to have a definite vote, but in affairs of spiritual jurisdiction, they could only be suffered to offer an opinion, insomuch as spiritual power resided with the chief inquisitor alone. Under the jurisdiction of the Supreme Council were four subordinate tribunals, and eventually several others were added, while some inquisitors, hitherto holding special powers from the Pope, were stripped of their independence, that the court of Rome might have one uniform action throughout Spain. As the Holy Office advanced in labor and experience, the Supreme Council was enlarged, and at last it consisted of a president, inquisitor-general for the time being, six councillors with the title of apostolic, a fiscal, a secretary of the chamber, two secretaries of the council, an alguazil-in-chief, or sheriff, one receiver, two reporters, four apparitors, one solicitor, and as many consultors as circumstances might require. Of course, these were all maintained in a style worthy of their office. The inquisitor-general, or president of the council, exerted an absolute power over every Spanish subject, so that he almost ceased to be himself a subject. He alone consulted with the king concerning the appointment of inquisitors to preside over all the provincial tribunals. Each of those inferior inquisitions was managed by three inquisitors, two secretaries, one under-sheriff, one receiver, and a certain number of triers and consultors. Their functions were considerably restricted, leaving all capital cases and ultimate decisions in the hands of the Madrid Supreme. But while Ferdinand, Isabella, Torquemada, and the Nuncio were concerting their plans and preparing death for heretics, what said Spain to it? Neither was clergy nor laity content. After the bull of Sixtus IV empowering the king to name inquisitors furnished with absolute authority and to remove them at pleasure had arrived, but lay unpublished in consequence of the queen's repugnance, a provincial synod sat at Seville, where the regal court then was, 1478. Had the clergy of Castile desired the inquisition, the synod would have said so but so far were they from approving of such a tribunal to which every bishop would be subject, but where no bishop would any longer have a voice, that they passed over the affair of heresy in silence, not consenting to accept the Inquisition, yet not presuming to remonstrate against it. Then would have been the time for the clergy to add their power to that of the throne for the suppression of false doctrine, believing, as they did believe, that forcible suppression was not only lawful, but meritorious in the sight of God. And so they would probably have done if inquisitor and bishop 
were to have had coordinate jurisdiction, as in the first Inquisition of Toulouse, and in the early Italian Inquisition. But they saw with alarm that the Episcopate was to be despoiled of its authority at a stroke. A few months before the publication of the bull, but long after every person in Spain knew the purport of its contents and in the certainty that it would be carried into execution, the Cortes of Toledo met, but instead of avoiding any act that would interfere with the new jurisdiction then to be introduced, they made several provisions for separating Jews and Christians by the enclosure of Jewries in the towns, and for compelling the former to wear a peculiar garb, and abstain from exercising the vocation of surgery or physician or innkeeper or barber or apothecary among Christians. The Parliament plainly ignored the Inquisition in making this enactment of their own authority. And what said the magistracy of the people? Seville represented the general state of feeling at the time. There, when the company of inquisitors presented themselves, conducted into the city by men and horses which had been impressed for the purpose of the royal order, the civil authorities refused to help them, notwithstanding the injunctions of the bull, the obligations of canon law, and a mandate from the crown. The new inquisitors found themselves unable to act for want of help. Meanwhile, the objects of their mission forsook the city and found shelter in the neighboring districts and Ferdinand had to issue specific orders to overpower the hostility of all the classes of the people and to compel the magistrates to assist the new set of officers ecclesiastic. These orders were most reluctantly obeyed. Thus fortified, the inquisitors took up their abode in the Dominican convent of St. Paul and issued their first mandate January 2, 1481. They said that they were aware of the flight of the new Christians and commanded the Marquis of Cadiz the Count of Arcos, and all the dukes, marquises, counts, gentlemen, rich men, and others of the kingdom of Castile, to arrest the fugitives and send them to Seville within a fortnight, sequestrating their property. All who failed to do this were excommunicated as abettors of heresy, deposed from their dignities and deprived of their estates, and their subjects were to be absolved from homage and obedience. Crowds of fugitives were driven back into Seville, bound like felons. The dungeons and apartments of the convent overflowed with prisoners, and the king assigned the castle of Triana, on the opposite bank of the Guadalquivir, to the new and holy tribunal, to be a place of safe custody. There the inquisitors, elate with triumph over the reluctant magistrates and panic-stricken people, shortly afterward erected a tablet with an inscription in memory of the first establishment of the modern inquisition in Western Europe. The concluding sentences of the inscription were, quote, God grant that, for the protection and augmentation of the faith, it may abide unto the end of time. Arise, O Lord, judge thy cause. Catch ye the foxes. End quote. Their second edict was one of grace. It summoned all who had apostatized to present themselves before the inquisitors within a term appointed, promising that all who did so with true contrition and purpose of amendment should be exempted from confiscation of their property. It was understood that they should be punished in some other way, but threatening that, if they allowed that term to pass over without repentance, they should be dealt with according to the utmost rigor of the law. Many ran to the convent of St. Paul, hoping to merit some small measure of indulgence, but the inquisitors would not absolve them until they had disclosed the names, calling, residence, and given a description of all others whom they had seen, heard, or understood to have apostatized in like manner. After getting this information, they bound the terrified informers to secrecy. This first object being accomplished, they sent out a third monition, requiring all who knew that any had apostatized into the Jewish heresy to inform against them within six days, under the usual penalties. But they had already marked the very men, and those suspected converts suddenly saw the apparitors inside their houses, and were dragged away to the dungeons. New Christians who had preserved any of the familiar usages of their forefathers, such as putting on clean clothes on Saturday, who stripped the fat from beef or mutton, who killed poultry with a sharp knife, covered the blood, and muttered a few Hebrew words, who had eaten flesh and lint, blessed their children, laying hands on their heads, who observed any peculiarity of diet or distinction of feast or fast, mourned for the dead after their ancient manner, or whose friends had presumed to turn the face toward a wall when in the agony of death, all such being vehemently suspected of apostasy, were to be punished accordingly. Thirty-six elaborate articles were furnished whereby everyone was instructed how to ensnare his neighbor. 
But what shall we say of a faith that could only hope to be kept alive in the world by the extinction of charity, honor, pity, and humanity? Llorente describes the immediate issue. Quote, Such opportune measures for multiplying victims could not but produce the desired effect. Hence, on January 6, 1481, there were burned six unhappy persons, sixteen on March 26th, many on April 21st, and by November 4th, 298 in all. Besides these, the inquisitors condemned seventy-nine to perpetual imprisonment, and all this in the city of Seville only, since, as regards the territories of this archbishopric and of the bishopric of Cadiz, Juan de Mariana says that, in the single year of 1481, two thousand Judaizers were burned in person, and very many in effigy, of whom the number is not known besides 17,000 subjected to cruel penance. Among those burned were many principal persons and rich inhabitants whose property went into the treasury. Quote, As so many persons were to be put to death by fire, the governor of Seville caused a permanent raised pavement or platform of masonry to be constructed outside the city, which has lasted to our time, bracket, until the French invasion if not later, close bracket retaining its name of Quemadero, burning place, and at the four corners four large hollow statues of limestone, within which they used to place the impenitent alive, that they might die by slow heat. I leave my readers to consider whether this punishment of an error of understanding was consistent or not with the doctrine of the gospel. Fear caused an immense multitude of others of the same class of new Christians to emigrate to France, Portugal, and even Africa, but many others, whose effigies had been burned, appealed to Rome, complaining of the injustice of these proceedings, in consequence of which appeals the Pope wrote, on January 29, 1482, to Ferdinand and Isabella, saying that there were innumerable complaints against the Inquisitors. Fray Miguel Murillo and Fray Juan de San Martin especially, because they had not confined themselves to canon law, but declared many to be heretics that were not. His Holiness said that, but for the royal nomination, he would have deprived them of their office, but that he revoked the power he had given to the sovereign to nominate others, supposing that fit persons would be found among those nominated by the general or the provincial of the Dominicans, to whom the privilege belonged, and in prejudice of whose privilege the former nomination by Ferdinand and Isabella had been allowed. End quote. So adroitly did the Pope take the absolute control of the Inquisition into his own hands under pretense of impartial justice, and leave the weaker tyrant to eat the fruit of his doings. But since that time Pope and King have been again united in the management of the Holy Office, the latter, however, in abject subservience to the former. Neither in the appeals nor in the belief was there anything that could divert Torquemada from the prosecution of his purposes, and therefore he hastened to bring Aragon under his jurisdiction. Ferdinand convened the Cortes of that kingdom in the city of Tarragon, April 1484, in that assembly appointed a junta to prepare measures for the establishment of another tribunal, and then Torquemada, in pursuance of the latest pontifical decision, created Friar Caspar Inglar, a preacher of the Dominican community, and Pedro Arbues de Apila, a canon of the Metropolitan Church, inquisitors. The king gave a mandate to the civil authorities, a firman it might be called, compelling them to lend aid to the new officers, and on September 13th following, the Grand Justice of Aragon, with his five lieutenants of the long robe and various other magistrates, swore upon the Holy Gospels that they would give men and arms to defend and to enforce the authority of the Holy Inquisition. And as they swore thus, the king's chief secretary for Aragon, the Prenthonotary, the vice-chancellor, the royal treasurer, whose own father and grandfather were Jews, and persecuted by the old inquisitors, together with a multitude of persons of high rank and office in whose veins flowed Jewish blood, and whose descendants are now among the first families in Spain, looked on with dismay, and sent a deputation to Rome, bearing remonstrance against the newly created Inquisition, and deputed others to present their appeal to the same effect at the court of Ferdinand and Isabella. 
All these deputies were afterward proceeded against as hinderers of the holy office, and meanwhile the inquisitors, in contempt of opposition, set themselves to work without delay. In the months of May and June, 1485, two acts of faith were celebrated in Saragossa, capital of Aragon, and a large number of new Christians burned alive. The public was enraged, certainly, but helpless. Yet not so helpless, but that many awoke to a conviction that, since the inquisitors had resorted to terror for the conversion of the faith, they ought to be restrained by terror in their turn. In the night of September 14th, 1485, one of the inquisitors, Pedro Arbues, covered as usual with a coat of mail under his robes, and wearing a steel skull-cap under his hat, for he was every moment conscious of guilt and apprehensive of retribution, took a lantern in one hand and a bludgeon in the other, and like a sturdy soldier of his peculiar church, walked from his house to the cathedral of that same Saragossa to join in Mountains. He knelt down by one of the pillars, setting his lantern on the pavement. His right hand held the weapon of defense, yet stealthily half-covered with the cloak. The cannons in their places were chanting hymns. Two men came and knelt down near him. They understood, as most Spaniards do, how most effectually to attack a man, and how to kill him quickest. Therefore one of them suddenly disabled him on one side by a blow on the left arm, the other swung his cudgel at the back of his head, just below the edge of the skullcap, and laid him prone. He never spoke again, but expired in a few hours. This murder, as might be expected, was well made use of by the priests, serving them to plead the necessity of an inquisition to repress violence, and the inhabitants of the city were instantly overawed by a display of high judicial authority which they had no power to resist. Queen Isabella, horrified at the murder of her confessor, for confessor of the kings, was an honorary dignity conferred on each inquisitor in Spain erected a monument to his memory at her own expense, and when the murders perpetrated by Arbus himself had somewhat faded out of public memory, he was beautified at Rome, and a chapel was constructed for his veneration in the church where he had fallen. Therein his remains were laid, and over the spot where he received the mortal blow a stone was placed with the inscription, Siste Viator, etc. Quote, Stay, traveller, thou adorest the place. Locomodorus, where the blessed Pedro de Arbois was laid low by two missiles. Apella gave him birth. The city gave him a canonry. The apostolic see elected him to be the first father inquisitor of the faith. Because of his zeal, he became hateful to the Jews, by whom slain he fell here a martyr in the year 1485. The most serene Ferdinand and Isabella reared a marble mausoleum where he became famous for miracles. Alexander the Seventh, Pontifex Maximus, wrote him into a number of holy and blessed martyrs on the seventeenth day of April in the year 1664. The tomb having been opened, the sacred ashes were translated and placed under the altar of the chapel, built by the chapter, with the material of the tomb, in the space of sixty-five days. With solemn rite and veneration, on the twenty-third day of September, in the year 1664. End quote. The intelligence of that murder threw all Aragon into commotion. The powers, ecclesiastical and royal, panted for vengeance, and the murderers were put to a most painful death. The Jews and new Christians trembled with terror and rage. The inhabitants of many towns, Tyrell, Valencia, Lerida, and Barcelona included, compelled the inquisitors to cease from inquest, and it was only by means of military force, after edicts and bulls had failed, that the king and the pope together could quash two years' public resistance. In Saragossa, where the murder had been contrived by a party of chief inhabitants, a consciousness of guilt weakened their hands, and they endeavored to save themselves by flight. Thousands of people deserted the city, although they had no participation in the deed and were everywhere treated as rebels. And in that migration incidents occurred which might throw a tinge of horrible romance on our history. Let me briefly mention two. An inhabitant of Saragossa found his way to Toledo, and there begged for shelter and concealment in the house of Don Jaime Infante of Navarre, legitimate son of the Queen of Navarre, and nephew of King Ferdinand himself. The Infante could not refuse asylum and hospitality to an innocent fugitive. 
he allowed the man to hide himself for a few days and then pass on to France. For this act of humanity, Don Jaime was arrested by the Inquisitors, thrown into prison as an impeder of the Holy Office, brought thence to Saragossa, a place quite beyond the jurisdiction of Navarre, and there made to do open penance in the cathedral, in presence of a great congregation at high mass. And what penance! The Archbishop of Saragossa presided, but this Archbishop was a boy of seventeen, an illegitimate son of the king, and he it was that commanded two priests to flog his father's lawful nephew, the Infante of Navarre, with rods. They whipped Don Jaime around the church accordingly. The other case was diabolical. Gaspar de Santa Cruz escaped to Toulouse, where he died and was buried after his effigy had been burned in Saragossa. In this city lived a son of his who, in duty bound, had helped him to make good his retreat. The son was delated as an impeder of the holy office, arrested and brought out as an act of faith, made to read a condemnation of his deceased father and then sent to the Inquisitor at Toulouse, who took him to his father's grave, and compelled him to dig up the corpse and burn it with his own hands. Whether the Inquisitors were most barbarous, or the young man most vile, it may be difficult to say. But it is a most infamous glory of the Inquisition that, for satisfaction of its own requirements, the expressed laws of God and man, and the first instincts of humanity, are equally set at naught. The Arch-Inquisitor of Spain, shortly after his accession to office, summoned the subalterns from their stations to meet him at Seville, and framed with them a set of instructions for uniform administration. They were published, twenty-eight in number, on October twenty ninth, 1484. On January nine, 1485, eleven more were added. The spirit of these instructions pervades the directory of Imeric into which they were incorporated by his commentator. It is only important to mention here that on the present occasion an agent was appointed to represent this inquisition at Rome, and there to defend the inquisitors on occasion of appeals from the subjects of inquisitorial violence, or from their friends or their survivors. And this was in spite of a bull sent into Spain two years before, appointing the Archbishop of Seville sole judge of such appeals. But that bull was a mere feint for conciliation, and was never acted on at Rome. We must not fail to mark this point in the history, for as much as here begins the practically juridical relation between the court of Rome as supreme and the provinces of the Roman Church as subordinate in matters concerning Inquisition. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mira Williams. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Inquisition Established in Spain, A.D. 1480, by James Balmes. As to the Spanish Inquisition, which was only an extension of that which was established in other countries, we must divide it, with respect to its duration, into three great periods. We omit the time of its existence in the Kingdom of Aragon, before its introduction into Castile. The first of these comprehends the time when the Inquisition was principally directed against the relapsed Jews and Moors, from the day of its installation under the Catholic sovereigns until the middle of the reign of Charles V. The second extends from the time when it began to concentrate its efforts to prevent the introduction of Protestantism into Spain until that danger entirely ceased. That is, from the middle of the reign of Charles V till the coming of the Bourbons. The third and last period is that when the Inquisition was limited to repress infamous crimes and exclude the philosophy of Voltaire, this period was continued until its abolition in the beginning of the 19th century. It is clear that, the institution being successfully modified according to the circumstances at these different epochs, although it always remained fundamentally the same, the commencement and termination of each of these three periods which we have pointed out cannot be precisely marked. Nevertheless, these three periods really existed in its history, and present us with very different characters. 
Everyone knows the peculiar circumstances in which the Inquisition was established in the time of the Catholic sovereigns, yet it is worthy of remark that the bull of establishment was solicited by Queen Isabella, that is, by one of the most distinguished sovereigns in our history, by that queen who still, after three centuries, preserves the respect and admiration of all Spaniards. Isabella, far from opposing the will of the people in this measure, only realized the national wish. The Inquisition was established chiefly against the Jews. Before the Inquisition published its first edict, dated Seville in 1481, the Cortes of Toledo in 1480 had adopted severe measures on the subject. To prevent the injury which the intercourse between Jews and Christians might occasion to the Catholic faith, the Cortes had ordered that unbaptized Israelites should be obliged to wear a distinctive mark, dwell in separate quarters, called joiveries, and return there before night. Ancient regulations against them were renewed. The professions of doctor, surgeon, shopkeeper, barber, and tavern-keeper were forbidden to them. Intolerance was, therefore, popular at that time. If the Inquisition be justified in the eyes of friends to the monarchy, by conformity with the will of the kings, it has an equal claim to be so in the eyes of lovers of democracy. No doubt the heart is grieved at reading the excessive severities exercised at that time against the Jews, but must there not have been very grave causes to provoke such excesses? The danger which the Spanish monarchy, not yet well established, would have incurred if the Jews, then very powerful on account of their riches and their alliances with the most influential families, had been allowed to act without restraint, has been pointed out as one of the most important of these causes— it was greatly to be feared that they would league with the Moors against the Christians. The respective positions of the three nations rendered this league natural. This is the reason why it was looked upon as necessary to break a power which was capable of compromising anew the independence of the Christians. It is necessary also to observe that at the time when the Inquisition was established, the war of eight hundred years against the Moors was not yet finished. The Inquisition was projected before 1474, it was established in 1480, and the conquest of Grenada did not take place till 1492. Thus it was founded at the time when the obstinate struggle was about to be decided. It was yet to be known whether the Christians would remain masters of the whole peninsula, or whether the Moors should retain possession of one of the most fertile and beautiful provinces. Whether these enemies, shut up in Grenada, should preserve a position excellent for their communication with Africa, and a means for all the attempts which, at a later period, the Crescent might be disposed to make against us. Now the power of the Crescent was very great, as was clearly shown by its enterprises against the rest of Europe in the next century. In such emergencies, after ages of fighting, and at the moment which was to decide the victory forever, have combatants ever been known to conduct themselves with moderation and mildness? It cannot be denied that the system of repression pursued in Spain, with respect to the Jews and the Moors, was inspired in great measure by the instinct of self-preservation. We can easily believe that the Catholic princes had this motive before them when they decided on asking for the establishment of the Inquisition in their dominions. The danger was not imaginary, it was perfectly real. In order to form an idea of the turn which things might have taken if some precaution had not been adopted, it is enough to recollect the insurrections of the last Moors in later times. Yet it would be wrong in this affair to attribute all to the policy of royalty, and it is necessary here to avoid exalting too much the foresight and designs of men. For my part, I am inclined to think that Ferdinand and Isabella naturally followed the generality of the nation— in whose eyes the Jews were odious when they persevered in their creed and suspected when they embraced the Christian religion. Two causes contributed to this hatred and animadversion. First, the excited state of religious feeling then general in all Europe, and especially in Spain. Second, the conduct by which the Jews had drawn upon themselves the public indignation. The necessity of restraining the cupidity of the Jews for the sake of the independence of the Christians, was of ancient date in Spain. The old assemblies of Toledo had attempted it. In the following centuries the evil reached its height. A great part of the riches of the peninsula had passed into the hands of the Jews, and almost all the Christians found themselves their debtors. Thence the hatred of the people against the Jews. 
thence the frequent troubles which agitated some towns of the peninsula, thence the tumults which more than once were fatal to the Jews, and in which their blood flowed in abundance. It was difficult for a people accustomed for ages to set themselves free by force of arms to resign themselves peacefully and tranquilly to the lot prepared for them by the artifices and exactions of a strange race, whose name, moreover, bore the recollection of a terrible malediction. In later times an immense number of Jews were converted to the Christian religion, but the hatred of the people was not extinguished thereby, and mistrust followed these converts into their new state. It is very probable that a great number of these conversions were hardly sincere, as they were partly caused by the sad position in which the Jews who continued in Judaism were placed. In default of conjectures found on reason in this respect, we will regard as a sufficient corroboration of our opinion the multitude of Judaizing Christians who were discovered as soon as care was taken to find out those who had been guilty of apostasy. However this may be, it is certain that the distinction between new and old Christians was introduced. The latter denomination was a title of honor, and the former a mark of ignominy. The converted Jews were contemptuously called Moranos, impure men, pigs. With more or less foundation, they were accused of horrible crimes. In their dark assemblies they committed, it was said, atrocities which could hardly be believed for the honor of humanity. For example, it was said that, to revenge themselves on the Christians and in contempt of religion, they crucified Christian children, taking care to choose for the purpose the greatest day among Christian solemnities. There is the often repeated history of the knight of the house of Guzman, who, being hidden one night in the house of a Jew whose daughter he loved, saw a child crucified at the time when the Christians celebrated the institution of the sacrifice of the Eucharist. Besides infanticide, there were attributed to the Jews sacrileges, poisonings, conspiracies, and other crimes. That these rumors were generally believed by the people is proved by the fact that the Jews were forbidden by law to exercise the professions of doctor, surgeon, barber, and tavern-keeper. This shows what degree of confidence was placed in their morality. It is useless to stay to examine the foundations for these sinister accusations. We are not ignorant how far popular credulity will go, above all when it is under the influence of excited feelings, which makes it view all things in the same light. It is enough for us to know that these rumors circulated everywhere and with credit, to understand what must have been the public indignation against the Jews, and consequently how natural it was that authority, yielding to the impulse of the general mind, should be urged to treat them with excessive rigor. The situation in which the Jews were placed is sufficient to show that they might have attempted to act in concert to resist the Christians. What they did after the death of St. Peter Arbus shows what they were capable of doing on other occasions. The funds necessary for the accomplishment of the murder, the pay of the assassins, and the other expenses required for the plot were collected by means of voluntary contributions imposed on themselves by all the Jews of Aragon. Does not this show an advanced state of organization which might have become fatal if it had not been watched? In alluding to the death of St. Peter Arbues, I wish to make an observation on what has been said on this subject as proving the unpopularity of the establishment of the Inquisition in Spain. What more evident proof, we shall be told, can you have than the assassination of the Inquisitor? Is it not a sure sign that the indignation of the people was at its height? and that they were quite opposed to the Inquisition. Would they otherwise have been hurried into such excesses? If by the people you mean the Jews and their descendants, I will not deny that the establishment of the Inquisition was indeed very odious to them, but it was not so with the rest of the nation. The event we are speaking of gave rise to a circumstance which proves just the reverse. When the report of the death of the Inquisitor was spread through the town, they went in crowds in pursuit of the new Christians, so that a bloody catastrophe would have ensued had not the young Archbishop of Saragossa, Alphonsus of Aragon, presented himself to the people on horseback and calmed them by the assurance that all the rigor of the laws should fall on the heads of the guilty. Was the Inquisition as unpopular as it had been represented? 
and will it be said that its adversaries were the majority of the people? Why, then, could not the tumult of Saragossa have been avoided in spite of all the precautions which were no doubt taken by the conspirators, at that time very powerful by their riches and influence? At the time of the greatest rigor against the Judaizing Christians, there is a fact worthy of attention. Persons accused or threatened with the pursuit of the Inquisition took every means to escape the action of that tribunal. They left the soil of Spain and went to Rome. Would those who imagine that Rome has always been the hotbed of intolerance, the firebrand of persecution, have imagined this? The number of causes commenced by the Inquisition and summoned from Spain to Rome is countless during the first fifty years of the existence of that tribunal. And it must be added that Rome always inclined to the side of indulgence. I do not know that it would be possible to cite one accused person who, by appealing to Rome, did not ameliorate his condition. The history of the Inquisition at that time is full of contests between the kings and the popes, and we constantly find on the part of the Holy See a desire to restrain the Inquisition within the bounds of justice and humanity. The line of conduct prescribed by the court of Rome was not always followed as it ought to have been. Thus, we see the popes compelled to receive a multitude of appeals, and mitigate the lot that would have befallen the appellants if their cause had been definitely decided in Spain. We also see the pope name the judge of the appeal at the solicitation of the Catholic sovereigns who desired that causes should be finally decided in Spain. The first of these judges was Inigo Manrique, Archbishop of Seville. Nevertheless, at the end of a short time, the same pope, in a bull of August 2, 1483, said that he had received new appeals made by a great number of the Spaniards of Seville, who had not dared to address themselves to the judge of appeal for fear of being arrested. Such was then the excitement of the public mind. Such was at that time the necessity of preventing injustice or measures of undue severity. The pope added that some of those who had had recourse to his justice had already received the absolution of the apostolic penitentiary, and that others were about to receive it. He afterward complained that indulgences granted to diverse accused persons had not been sufficiently respected at Seville. In fine, after several other admonitions, he observed to Ferdinand and Isabella that mercy toward the guilty was more pleasing to God than the severity which it was desired to use. And he gave the example of the good shepherd, following the wandering sheep. He ended by exhorting the sovereigns to treat with mildness those who voluntarily confessed their faults, desiring them to allow them to reside at Seville or in some other place that they might choose, and to allow them the enjoyment of their property, as if they had not been guilty of the crime of heresy. Moreover, it is not to be supposed that the appeals admitted to Rome, and by virtue of which the lot of the accused was improved, were founded on errors of form and injustice committed in the application of the law. If the accused had recourse to Rome, it was not always to demand reparations for an injustice, but because they were sure of finding indulgence. We have a proof of this in the considerable number of Spanish refugees convicted at Rome of having fallen into Judaism. Two hundred fifty of them were found at one time, yet there was not one capital execution. Some penances were imposed on them, and, when they were absolved, they were free to return home without the least mark of ignominy. This took place at Rome in 1498. It is a remarkable thing that the Roman Inquisition was never known to pronounce the execution of capital punishment, although the Apostolic See was occupied during that time by popes of extreme rigor and severity in all that relates to the civil administration we find in all parts of Europe scaffolds prepared to punish crimes against religion. Scenes which sadden the soul were everywhere witnessed. Rome is an exception to the rule. Rome, which it has been attempted to represent as a monster of intolerance and cruelty. It is true that the popes have not preached, like Protestants, universal toleration, but facts show the differences between popes and Protestants. The popes, armed with a tribunal of intolerance, have not spilled a drop of blood. Protestants and philosophers have shed torrents. What advantage is it to the victim to hear his executioners proclaim toleration? 
It is adding the bitterness of sarcasm to his punishment. The conduct of Rome in the use which she made of the Inquisition is the best apology of Catholicity against those who attempt to stigmatize her as barbarous and sanguinary. In truth, what is there in common between Catholicity and the excessive severity employed in this place or that, in the extraordinary situation in which many rival races were placed, in the presence of danger which menaced one of them, or in the interest which the kings had in maintaining the tranquillity of their states and securing their conquests from all danger? I will not enter into a detailed examination of the conduct of the Spanish Inquisition with respect to Judaizing Christians, and I am far from thinking that the rigor which it employed against them was preferable to the mildness recommended and displayed by the popes. What I wish to show here is that rigor was the result of extraordinary circumstances. The effect of the national spirit and the severity of customs in Europe at that time. Catholicity cannot be reproached with the excesses committed for these different reasons. Still more, if we pay attention to the spirit which prevails in all the instructions of the popes relating to the Inquisition, if we observe their manifest inclination to range themselves on the side of mildness and to suppress the marks of ignominy with which the guilty, as well as their families, were stigmatized, we have a right to suppose that, if the popes had not feared to displease the kings too much, and to excite divisions which might have been fatal, their measures would have been carried still further. If we recollect the negotiations which took place with respect to the noisy affair of the claims of the Cortes of Aragon, we shall see to which side the court of Rome leaned. As we are speaking of intolerance with regard to the Judaizers, let us say a few words as to the disposition of Luther toward the Jews. Does it not seem that the pretended reformer, the founder of independence of thought, the furious declaimer against the oppression and tyranny of the popes, should have been animated with the most humane sentiments toward that people? No doubt the eulogists of this chieftain of Protestantism ought to think thus also. I am sorry for them, but history will not allow us to partake of this delusion. According to all appearances, if the apostate monk had found himself in the place of Torquemada, the Judaizers would not have been in a better position. What, then, was the system advised by Luther, according to Seckendorf, one of his apologists? Quote, their synagogues ought to be destroyed, their houses pulled down, their prayer books, the Talmud, and even the books of the Old Testament to be taken from them. Their rabbis ought to be forbidden to teach and be compelled to gain their livelihood by hard labor. End quote. The Inquisition, at least, did not proceed against the Jews, but against the Judaizers. That is, against those who, after being converted to Christianity, relapsed into their errors, and added sacrilege to their apostasy by the external profession of a creed which they detested in secret, and which they profaned by the exercise of their old religion. But Luther extended his severity to the Jews themselves, so that according to his doctrines, no reproach can be made against the sovereigns who expelled the Jews from their dominions. The Moors and the Morescos no less occupied the attention of the Inquisition at that time, and all that has been said on the subject of the Jews may be applied to them with some modifications. They were also an abhorred race, a race which had been contended with for eight centuries. When they retained their religion, the Moors inspired hatred. When they abjured it, mistrust. The popes interested themselves in their favor also in a peculiar manner. We ought to remark a bull issued in 1530, which is expressed in language quite evangelical. It is there said that the ignorance of these nations is one of the principal causes of their faults and errors. The first thing to be done to render their conversion solid and sincere was, according to the recommendation contained in this bull, to endeavor to enlighten their minds with sound doctrine. It will be said that the Pope granted to Charles V the bull which released him from the oath taken in the Cortes of Saragossa in the year 1519, an oath by which he had engaged not to make any change with respect to the Moors, whereby, it is said, the Emperor was enabled to complete their expulsion. But we must observe that the Pope for a long time resisted that concession, and that if he at length complied with the wishes of the Emperor, it was only because he thought that the expulsion of the Moors was indispensable to secure the tranquillity of the kingdom. Whether this was true or not, the emperor and not the pope was the better judge. The latter placed at a great distance could not know the real state of things in detail. 
Moreover, it was not the Spanish monarch alone who thought so. It is related that Francis I, when a prisoner at Madrid, one day conversing with Charles V, told him that tranquility would never be established in Spain if the Moors and Morescos were not expelled. End of section 17「Section 18 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. Edited by Charles F. Horne. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd. Murder of the Princes in the Tower, A.D. 1483, James Gardner. The brief reign of Richard III, 1483 to 1485, left for historians one subject of dispute, which even to our own day has not been finally determined. His alleged murder of his nephews, King Edward V, and Richard, Duke of York, sons of Edward IV. These princes, at the supposed time of their death, were about thirteen and nine years of age, respectively. Before his usurpation, Richard III, last of the Plantagenet line, was known as the Duke of Gloucester. He served in the Wars of the Roses, and on the death of Edward IV, April 1483, he seized the young Edward V and caused himself to be proclaimed protector. He then caused his parliament to set the two princes aside as illegitimate and they were imprisoned in the Tower of London. On June the 26th, 1483, Richard assumed the crown and soon after the death of the princes was publicly announced. In Gardner's discussion, we have the results of the best historical inquiries concerning this most important question of Richard's career. A great amount of public anxiety prevailed touching the two young princes in the tower. They were virtually prisoners, and their confinement created great dissatisfaction. A movement in their behalf was gotten up in the south of England while Richard was away. In Kent, Sussex and Essex, in Hampshire, Wiltshire and Dorset, even as far west as Devonshire, cabals were formed for their liberation, which all appear to have been parts of one great conspiracy organised in secret by the Duke of Buckingham. By the beginning of October, some disturbances had actually taken place, and the following letter was written in consequence by the Duke of Norfolk to one of his dependents in Norfolk. To my right well-beloved friend, John Paston, be this delivered in haste. Right well, beloved friend, I commend me to you. It is so that the Kentish men be up in the weald and say that they will come and rob the city, which I shall let, i.e. prevent, if I may. Therefore I pray you that with all diligence you make you ready and come hither and bring with you six tall fellows in harness, and ye shall not lose your labour, that knoweth God, who have you in his keeping. Written at London, the 10th day of October, your friend, J. Norfolk. The rumour of the projected movement in behalf of the princes was speedily followed by the report that they were no more. Of course, they had been removed by violence. Regarding the time and manner of the deed, no news could then be obtained but the news that the deposed king and his brother had been assassinated was spread with horror and amazement through the land. Among all the inhumanities of the late civil war, there had been nothing so unnatural as this. To many, the tale seemed too cruel to be true. They believed that the princes must have been sent abroad to defeat the intrigues of their friends. But time passed away and they never appeared again. After many years, indeed, an impostor counterfeited the younger, but even he, to give credit to his pretensions, expressly admitted the murder of his elder brother. Nevertheless, there have been writers in modern days 
who have shown plausible grounds for doubting that the murder really took place. Two contemporary writers, they say, mention the fact only as a report. A third certainly states it, incorrectly at least, in point of time. And Sir Thomas More, who is the only one remaining, relates it with certain details which it does seem difficult to accept as credible. More's account, however, must bear some resemblance to the truth. It is mainly founded upon the confession of two of the murderers, and is given by the writer as the most trustworthy report he had met with. If, therefore, the murder be not itself a fiction, and the confession, as has been surmised, a forgery, we should expect the account given by Sir Thomas More to be in the main true, clear and consistent, though Horace Walpole and others have maintained that it is not so. The substance of the story is as follows. Richard, some time after he had set out on his progress, sent a special messenger and confidant, by name John Green, to Sir Robert Brackenbury, the constable of the tower, commanding him to put the two princes to death. Brackenbury refused to obey the order, and Green returned to his master at Warwick. The king was bitterly disappointed. "'Whom shall a man trust?' he said. "'When those who I thought would most surely serve me, at my command, will do nothing for me?' The words were spoken to a private attendant or page, who told him, in reply, that there was one man lying on a pallet in the outer chamber who would hardly scruple to undertake anything whatever to please him. This was Sir James Tyrrell, who is described by Moore as an ambitious, aspiring man, jealous of the ascendancy of Sir Richard Ratcliffe and Sir William Catesby. Richard at once acted upon the hint, and calling Tyrrell before him, communicated his mind to him and gave him a commission for the execution of his murderous purpose. Tyrrell went to London with a warrant authorising Brackenbury to deliver up to him for one night all the keys of the tower. Armed with this document, he took possession of the place and proceeded to the work of death by the instrumentality of Miles Forrest, one of the four jailers in whose custody the princes were, and John Dighton, his own groom. When the young princes were asleep, these men entered their chamber and, taking up the pillows, pressed them hard down upon their mouths till they died by suffocation. Then, having caused Sir James to see the bodies, they buried them at the foot of a staircase. But, it was rumoured, says Moore, that the king disapproved of their being buried in so vile a corner, whereupon they say that a priest of Sir Robert Brackenbury's took up the bodies again and secretly interred them in such place as, by the occasion of his death, could never come to light. Sir James, having fulfilled his mission, returned to the king, from whom he received great thanks, and who, Sir Thomas informs us, as some say, there made him a knight. It has been maintained that this story will not bear criticism. What could have induced Richard to time his cruel policy so ill and to arrange it so badly? The order for the destruction of the children could have been much more easily, safely and secretly executed when he was in London than when he was at Gloucester or Warwick. Fewer messages would have sufficed and neither warrants nor letters would have been necessary. Was it a sudden idea which occurred to him upon his progress? If so, he might surely have waited for a better opportunity. If not, he might at least have taken care to sift Brackenbury before leaving London, so as to be sure of the two he intended to employ. Is it likely that Richard would have given orders for the commission of a crime, without having good reason to rely upon his intended agent's boldness and depravity? But... Having tried Sir Robert's scruples and found them somewhat stronger than he anticipated, what follows? It might have been expected that Sir Robert's respect for his master, if he had any, would have been diminished, that the favour of his sovereign would have been withdrawn from him, and perhaps that the tyrant, having seen an instance of the untrustworthiness of men in matters criminal and dangerous, 
would have learned to become a little more circumspect. But the facts are quite otherwise. Sir Robert continued long after in the good graces of his sovereign, always remained faithful to him, even when many others deserted him, and finally fell in battle, bravely fighting in his cause. Richard did not become more cautious, but, on the contrary, more imprudent than ever. He complained loudly of his disappointment, even in the presence of a page. This page is nameless in the story, but he serves to introduce to the king no less a person than Sir James Tyrrell, who is represented as willing to do anything to obtain favour, and envious of the influence possessed by others. He undertakes and executes the task which Brackenbury had refused, and for this service we are told he was knighted. All this greatly misrepresents Sir James's position and influence, if not his character. He not only was a knight long before this, but had been in the preceding year created by Richard himself a knight banneret for his distinguished services during the Scotch campaign. He had been, during Edward the Fourth's reign, a commissioner for executing the office of Lord High Constable. He was then master of the king's henchmen, or pages. He was also master of the horse. If his mere position in the world did not make him disdain to be a hired assassin, he at least did not require to be recommended through the medium of that nameless page. Moreover, it appears that the fact of the prince's having been murdered was held in great doubt for a long time afterward. Even Moore himself, writing about thirty years later, is obliged to acknowledge that the thing had so far come in question that some remained long in doubt whether they were in Richard's days destroyed or no. This is certainly remarkable when it is considered that it was of the utmost importance for Henry the Seventh to terminate all controversy upon the question. Yet Sir Thomas tells us that these doubts arose not only from the uncertainty men were in whether Perkin Warbeck was the true Duke of York, but for that also that all things were so covertly demeaned, one thing pretended and another meant, that there was nothing so plain and openly proved, but that yet for the common custom of close and covert dealing, men had it ever inwardly suspect. All this, it is urged, may very well suggest that the doubts were reasonable, and that the princes in reality were not destroyed in the days of Richard III. And, indeed, when we consider how many persons, according to Moore's account, took part in the murder, or had some knowledge of it, it does appear not a little strange that there should have been any difficulty in establishing it on the clearest evidence. For besides Tyrrell, Dighton and Forrest, the chief actors, there were Brackenbury, Green the Page, one Black Will, or Will Slaughter, who guarded the princes, and the priest who buried them, all fully aware of the circumstances of the crime. In Henry the Seventh's time, Brackenbury was dead, and so it is said was the priest. Forrest, too, had ended his days miserably in a sanctuary. But it does not appear what had become of either Green or the page. Tyrrell and Dighton were the only persons said to have been examined, and though we are told that they both confessed, yet there is a circumstance that makes the confession look exceedingly suspicious. Tyrrell was detained in prison, and afterward executed, for a totally different offence, while, as Bacon tells us, John Dighton, who it seemeth spake best for the king, was forthwith set at liberty. Taking Bacon's view of the circumstances of the disclosure as if it were infallible, the sceptics here find matter of very grave suspicion. In truth, says Walpole, every step of this pretended discovery, as it stands in Lord Bacon, warns us to give no heed to it. Dighton and Tyrrell agreed both in a tale, as the king gave out. Their confession, therefore, was not publicly made, and as Sir James Tyrrell too was suffered to live, but was shut up in the tower, and put to death afterward, for we know not what treason, 
What can we believe but that Dighton was some low mercenary wretch, hired to assume the guilt of a crime he had not committed, and that Sir James Tyrrell never did, never would, confess what he had not done, and was therefore put out of the way on a fictitious imputation? It must be observed, too, that no inquiry was made into the murder on the accession of Henry the Seventh, the natural time for it, when the passions of men were heated, and when the Duke of Norfolk, Lord Lovell, Catesby, Ratcliffe, and the real abettors or accomplices of Richard were attainted and executed. No mention of such a murder was made in the very act of Parliament that attainted Richard himself, and which would have been the most heinous aggravation of his crimes. And no prosecution of the supposed assassins was ever thought of till eleven years afterward on the appearance of Perkin Warbeck. Such are the striking arguments by which it has been sought to cast a doubt upon the murder, and particularly Moore's account of it. To all of which it may be replied, in the first place, that it is by no means necessary to suppose Moore's narrative, though it appeared to him the most credible account he had heard, absolutely correct in all its details, especially in those which he mentions as mere reports. His authority was evidently the alleged confession of Tyrrell and Dighton, obtained second-hand. This, though true in the main, may not have been absolutely correct, even as it was first delivered, and may have been somewhat less accurate as it was reported to Sir Thomas, who perhaps added from hearsay a few errors of his own, like that about Sir James Tyrrell's knighthood. Secondly, the argument with regard to Richard's imprudence in pursuing the course ascribed to him goes but little way to discredit the facts, unless it can be shown that caution and foresight were part of his ordinary character. The prevailing notion of Richard the Third, indeed, is of a cold, deeply politic, scheming and calculated villain. But I confess I am not satisfied of the justice of such a view. Not only Richard, but all his family, appear to me to have been headstrong and reckless as to consequences. His father lost his life by a chivalrous and quixotic impetuosity. His brother Edward lost his kingdom once by pure carelessness. His brother Clarence fell, no less by lack of wisdom than by lack of honesty. And he himself, at Bosworth, threw away his life by his eagerness to terminate the contest in a personal engagement. Had Richard fully intended to murder his nephews at the time he determined upon dethroning the elder, I have very little doubt that he would have kept his northern forces in London to preserve order in the city till after the deed was done. I, for my part, do not believe that such was his intention from the first. How much more probable, indeed, that after he had left London, the contemplated rising in favour of the princes, suggested to him an action which cost him his peace of mind during the whole of his afterlife. Thirdly, the doubts of contemporaries do not appear to have been very general. The expression of Sir Thomas More is only that some remained in doubt, and More is not a writer who would have glossed over a fact to please the court. As to Perkin Warbeck, who pretended to be the younger of the princes, Henry the Seventh's neglect to confute his pretensions may have arisen from other causes than a suspicion that he was the true Duke of York. There is no reason to suppose that his followers in England were numerous. The belief in the murder appears to have been general. It was mentioned as a fact by the Chancellor of France in addressing the Estates General, which met at Tours in the following January. It was acknowledged to be true in part by Warbeck himself, who, it has been shown since Walpole's time, in personating the Duke of York, admitted that his brother Edward had been murdered, though he asserted that he himself had providentially escaped. It is evident that no one dreamed in those days that the story of the murder was altogether a fiction. The utmost that any well-informed person could doubt was whether it had been successfully accomplished as to both the victims. With regard to the confessions of Tyrrell and Dighton, Bacon has certainly spoken without warrant in stating that they were examined at the time of Warbeck's appearance. 
The time when they were examined is stated by Sir Thomas More to have been when Tyrrell was confined in the Tower for treason against Henry the Seventh, which was in 1502, three years after Warbeck's execution. Before that date, there is no ground for believing that Tyrrell's guilt in regard to the murder was generally known. Before that date, indeed, the world seems to have had no conception in what manner the crime was committed, and the common story seems to have been that Richard had put his nephews to the sword. But the confession of Tyrrell at once put an end to this surmise, and we hear of it no longer. Henry the Seventh assuredly did not for a long time treat him as a criminal, for not only did he hold under Henry the office of Captain of Guine, but he was employed by the king in an expedition against Flanders. Nay, even after Warbeck had been taken and confessed his imposture, Tyrrell was employed on an important embassy to Maximilian, King of the Romans. It was quite clear, therefore, that he was never questioned about the murder in consequence of Warbeck's pretensions. But being afterward condemned to death on a charge of treason, not an unknown charge, as Walpole imagines, but a charge of having treasonably aided the escape of the Earl of Suffolk, he was then, as Moore says, examined about it in the Tower, having probably made a voluntary confession of guilt to ease his conscience before his execution. No doubt, after all, the murder rests upon the testimony of only a very few original authorities, but this is simply owing to the scantiness of contemporary historians. It is true also that of these there are two who only mention it as a report, but it must be observed that neither of them expresses the smallest doubt of its truth, and one of them more than hints that he believes it as a fact. How, indeed, could there possibly be two opinions about a rumour of this kind, seeing that it was never contradicted by the king himself? Assuredly from this time the conduct both of Richard and his enemies was distinctly governed by the belief that his nephews were no longer alive. Moreover, the truth of the story seems to be corroborated by a discovery which took place in the reign of Charles the Second. In the process of altering the staircase leading to the chapel in the White Tower, the skeletons of two young lads, whose apparent ages agreed with those of the unfortunate princes, were found buried under a heap of stones. Their place of sepulture corresponded with the situation mentioned in the confession of the murderers, so that the report alluded to by Moore of the removal of the bodies seems to have been a mistake. The antiquaries of the day had no doubt they were the remains of young Edward V and his brother, and King Charles caused them to be fittingly interred in Henry VII's chapel at Westminster. A Latin inscription marks the spot and tells of the discovery. We have no doubt, therefore, that the dreadful deed was done. It was done indeed in profound secrecy. The fact, I suspect, remained some little time unknown, and for years after there was no certainty as to the way it was performed. Years elapsed even before the world suspected the foul blot upon Tyrrell's knighthood, and he enjoyed the favour both of Richard and of his successor, but at last the truth came out. As to the other agents in the business, various entries in the patent rolls and in the docket book of King Richard's grants show that they did not pass unrewarded. Before the murder, Green had been appointed a comptroller of the customs at Boston and had also been employed to provide horse meat and litter for the king's stables. Afterward, if we may trust a note by Stripe, but I own I cannot find his authority, he was advanced to be receiver of the Isle of Wight and of the castle and lordship of Porchester. To Dighton was granted the office of bailiff of Ayton in Staffordshire. Forrest died soon after, and it appears he was keeper of the wardrobe at Barnard Castle, but whether appointed before or after the murder, there is no evidence to show. Brackenbury received several important grants, some of which were of lands of the late Lord Rivers. And yet hitherto Richard's life, though not unmarked by violence, had been free from violence to his own flesh and blood. Even his most unjustifiable measures were somewhat in the nature of self-defence. 
or if in any case he had stained his hands with the blood of persons absolutely innocent, it was not in his own interest, but in that of his brother, Edward the Fourth. The rough and illegal retribution which he dealt out to Rivers, Vaughan, Hort, Lord Richard Grey and Lord Hastings were not more severe than perhaps law itself might have authorised. The disorders of civil war had accustomed the nation to see justice sometimes executed without the due formalities, and his neglect of those formalities had not hitherto made him unpopular. But the licence of unchecked power is dangerous, no less to those who wield than to those who suffer it, and it was peculiarly so to one of Richard's violent and impatient temper. He had been allowed so far to act upon his own arbitrary judgment or will, that expediency was fast becoming his only motive, and extinguishing within him both humanity and natural affection. Nevertheless, he was not yet sunk so low as to regard his own unnatural conduct with indifference. Deep and bitter remorse deprived him of all that tranquillity in the possession of power for the attainment of which he had imbrued his hands in blood. "'I have heard by credible report,' says Sir Thomas More, "'of such as were secret with his chamberers, "'that after this abominable deed done, "'he never had quiet in his mind, "'he never thought himself sure. "'Where he went abroad, his eyes whirled about, "'his body privily fenced, his hand ever on his dagger, his countenance and manner like one always ready to strike again. He took ill rest at nights, lay long waking and musing, sore wearied with care and watch, he rather slumbered than slept. Troubled with fearful dreams, suddenly sometimes started he up, leapt out of his bed and ran about the chamber. So was his restless heart continually tossed and tumbled, with a tedious impression and stormy remembrance of his most abominable deed. Such was the awful retribution that overtook this inhuman king during the two short years that he survived his greatest crime, till the Battle of Bosworth completed the measure of his punishment. His repentance came too late. End of section 18「Section 19 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 19. Conquest of Granada, A.D. 1490. Part 1. By Washington Irving. Although the Moors held Spain for over 750 years, they never had possession of the entire country. In the north, Fragments of the Visigothic Christian kingdoms survived, and at length these grew into a strong power, destined to drive out the Arabs, who had so long made the Spanish peninsula a seat of Mahometan civilization. The Moorish power reached its height in the 10th century, and gradually declined in the 11th, when it broke up into petty, and short-lived kingdoms. The Almoravides from Africa began their rule in Spain about 1090. This dynasty was overthrown by the Almohades in 1145, and the latter became extinct in Spain in 1257. After the disruption of the realm of the Almohades, the Moorish kingdom of Granada was established, and was held in vassalage to Castile, of which Ferdinand and Isabella, in 1474, became joint sovereigns. The Moors made Granada, their capital, a large and powerful city, 
And there, in the 13th century, they built their magnificent palace and citadel, the Alhambra, the finest example of Moorish architecture and decorative art. In 1482, having prepared themselves for what proved a final struggle with the Moors, Ferdinand and Isabella began the war against Boabdil, the king of Granada who, the year before, had seized the throne from his father, Muli Hassan. After some early reverses and later interruptions, during which the wavering Ferdinand was held to his purpose by the rebukes and encouragement of his stout-hearted queen, the Christian sovereigns reduced the strongholds of the Moors until, by 1490, the more important half of the kingdom of Granada had been conquered. The city and its small surrounding district alone remained to Boabdil. On April 23, 1491, Ferdinand and Isabella encamped before Granada with 50,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 horse, and the last contest began. Though Granada was shorn of its glories and nearly cut off from all external aid, still its mighty castles and massive bulwarks seemed to set all attacks at defiance. Being the last retreat of Moorish power, it had assembled within its walls the remnants of the armies that had contended step by step with the invaders in their gradual conquest of the land. All that remained of high-born and high-bred chivalry was here. All that was loyal and patriotic was roused to activity by the common danger, and Granada, that had so long been lulled into inaction by vain hopes of security, now assumed a formidable aspect in the hour of its despair. Ferdinand saw that any attempt to subdue the city by main force would be perilous and bloody. Cautious in his policy, and fond of conquest gained by art rather than valor, he determined to reduce the place by famine. For this purpose, his armies penetrated into the very heart of the Alpujarras, and ravaged the valleys and sacked and burned the towns upon which the city depended for its supplies. Scouting parties also ranged the mountains behind Granada and captured every casual convoy of provisions. The Moors became more daring as their situation became more hopeless. Never had Ferdinand experienced such vigorous sallies and assaults. Musa, at the head of his cavalry, harassed the borders of the camp and even penetrated into the interior, making sudden spoil and ravage and leaving his course to be traced by the slain and wounded. To protect his camp from these assaults, Ferdinand fortified it with deep trenches and strong bulwarks. It was of a quadrangular form, divided into streets like a city, the troops being quartered in tents and in booths constructed of bushes and branches of trees. When it was completed, Queen Isabella came in state with all her court and the prince and princess to be present at the siege. This was intended to reduce the besieged to despair by showing the determination of the sovereigns to reside in the camp until the city should surrender. Immediately after her arrival, the queen rode forth to survey the camp and its environs. Wherever she went, she was attended by a splendid retinue, and all the commanders vied with each other in the pomp and ceremony with which they received her. Nothing was heard from morning until night, but shouts and acclamations and bursts of martial music, so that it appeared to the Moors 
as if a continual festival and triumph reigned in the Christian camp. The arrival of the queen, however, and the menaced obstinacy of the siege had no effect in damping the fire of the Moorish chivalry. Musa inspired the youthful warriors with the most devoted heroism. We have nothing left to fight for, said he, but the ground we stand on. When this is lost, we cease to have a country and a name. Finding the Christian king forbore to make an attack, Musa incited his cavaliers to challenge the youthful chivalry of the Christian army to single combat or partial skirmishes. Scarce a day passed without gallant conflicts of the kind. In sight of the city and the camp, the combatants rivaled each other in the splendor of their armor and array, as well as in the prowess of their deeds. Their contests were more likely the stately ceremonials of tilts and tournaments than the rude conflicts of the field. Ferdinand soon perceived that they animated the fiery moors with fresh zeal and courage, while they cost the lives of many of his bravest cavaliers. He again, therefore, forbade the acceptance of any individual challenges, and ordered that all partial encounters should be avoided. The cool and stern policy of the Catholic sovereign bore hard upon the generous spirits of either army, but roused the indignation of the Moors when they found that they were to be subdued in this inglorious manner. Of what avail, said they, are chivalry and heroic valor? The crafty monarch of the Christians has no magnanimity in warfare. He seeks to subdue us through the weakness of our bodies, but shuns to encounter the courage of our souls. When the Moorish knights beheld that all courteous challenges were unavailing, they sought various means to provoke the Christian warriors to the field. Sometimes a body of them, fleetly mounted, would gallop up to the skirts of the camp and try who should hurl his lance farthest within the barriers, having his name inscribed upon it, or a label affixed to it containing some taunting defiance. These bravados caused great irritation, but still the Spanish warriors were restrained by the prohibition of the king. Among the Moorish cavaliers was one named Yarfi, renowned for his great strength and daring spirit, but whose courage partook of fierce audacity rather than chivalric heroism. In one of these sallies, when they were skirting the Christian camp, this arrogant Moor outstripped his companions, overleaped the barriers, and galloping close to the royal quarters, launched his lance so far within that it remained quivering in the earth close by the pavilions of the sovereigns. The royal guards rushed forth in pursuit, but the Moorish horsemen were already beyond the camp and scouring in a cloud of dust for the city. Upon wresting the lance from the earth, a label was found upon it, importing that it was intended for the queen. Nothing could equal the indignation of the Christian warriors at the insolence of the bravado and the discourteous insult offered to the queen. Hernando Perez del Pulgar, surnamed He of the Exploits, was present and resolved not to be outbraved by this daring infidel. Who will stand by me, said he, in an enterprise of desperate peril? The Christian cavaliers well knew the hair-brained valor of Hernando del Pulgar, yet not one hesitated to step forward. He chose fifteen companions, all men of powerful arm and dauntless heart. In the dead of the night he led them forth from the camp and approached the city cautiously until he arrived at a postern gate 
which opened upon the Darro and was guarded by foot soldiers. The guards, little thinking of such an unwanted and partial attack, were for the most part asleep. The gate was forced, and a confused and chance medley skirmish ensued. Hernando del Pulgar stopped not to take part in the affray. Putting spurs to his horse, he galloped furiously through the streets, striking fire out of the stones at every bound. Arrived at the principal mosque, he sprang from his horse, and kneeling at the portal, took possession of the edifice as a Christian chapel, dedicating it to the Blessed Virgin. In a testimony of the ceremony, he took a tablet which he had brought with him, on which was inscribed in large characters, Ave Maria, and nailed it to the door of the mosque with his dagger. This done, he remounted his steed and galloped back to the gate. The alarm had been given. The city was in an uproar. Soldiers were gathering from every direction. They were astonished at seeing a Christian warrior galloping from the interior of the city. Hernando del Pulgar overturned some, cut down others, rejoined his companions, who still maintained possession of the gate by dint of hard fighting, and all made good their retreat to the camp. The Moors were at a loss to imagine the meaning of this wild and apparently fruitless assault. But great was their exasperation on the following day, when the trophy of hardihood and prowess, the Ave Maria, was discovered thus elevated in bravado in the very center of the city. The mosque thus boldly sanctified by Hernando del Pulgar was actually consecrated into a cathedral after the capture of Granada. The royal encampment lay at such a distance from Granada that the general aspect of the city only could be seen as it rose gracefully from the Vega, covering the sides of the hills with palaces and towers. Queen Isabella had expressed an earnest desire to behold, nearer at hand, a city whose beauty was so renowned throughout the world, and the Marquis of Cadiz, with the accustomed courtesy, prepared a great military escort and guard to protect the queen and the ladies of the court while they enjoyed this perilous gratification. A magnificent and powerful train issued forth from the Christian camp. The advance guard was composed of legions of cavalry, heavily armed, that looked like moving masses of polished steel. Then came the king and the queen, with the prince and princess and the ladies of the court, surrounded by the royal bodyguard, sumptuously arrayed, composed of the sons of the most illustrious houses of Spain. After these was the rear guard, composed of a powerful force of horse and foot, for the flower of the army sallied forth that day. The Moors gazed with fearful admiration at this glorious pageant, wherein the pomp of the court was mingled with the terrors of the camp. It moved along in a radiant line, across the vega, to the melodious thunders of martial music, while banner and plume and silken scarf and rich brocade gave a gay and gorgeous relief to the grim visage of iron war that lurked beneath. The army moved toward the hamlet of Zubia, built on the skirts of the mountain to the left of Granada, and commanding a view of the Alhambra and the most beautiful quarter of the city. As they approached the hamlet, the Marquis of Elena, the Count of Urena, and Don Alonso de Aguilar filed off with their battalions, and were soon seen glittering along the side of the mountain above the village. In the meantime, the Marquis of Cadiz, the Count of Tendilla, the Count de Cabra, 
and Don Alonso Fernandez, Senor of Alcandrete and Montemayor, drew up their forces in battle array on the plain below the hamlet, presenting a living barrier of loyal chivalry between the sovereigns and the city. Thus securely guarded, the royal party alighted, and, entering one of the houses of the hamlet, which had been prepared for their reception, enjoyed a full view of the city from its terraced roof. While grim tranquillity prevailed along the Christian line, there rose a mingled shout and sound of laughter near the gate of the city. A Moorish horseman, armed at all points, issued forth, followed by a rabble, who drew back as he approached the scene of danger. The Moor was more robust and brawny than was common with his countrymen. His visor was closed. He bore a huge buckler and a ponderous lance. His scimitar was of a Damascus blade, and his richly ornamented dagger was wrought by an artificer of Fez. He was Yarfi, the most insolent yet valiant of the Moslem warriors. As he rode slowly along in front of the army, his very steed, prancing with fiery eye and distended nostril, seemed to breathe defiance to the Christians. But what were the feelings of the Spanish cavaliers when they beheld, tied to the tail of his steed, and dragged in the dust the inscription Ave Maria, which Hernando Perez del Pilgar had affixed to the door of the mosque. A burst of horror and indignation broke forth from the army. Hernando del Pulgar was not at hand, but one of his young companions in arms, Garcelaso de la Vega by name, putting spurs to his horse, galloped to the hamlet of Zubia, threw himself on his knees before the king, and besought permission to accept the defiance of this insolent infidel and to revenge the insult offered to our blessed lady. The request was too pious to be refused. Garcelaso remounted his steed. He closed his helmet, graced by four sable plumes, grasped his buckler of Flemish workmanship and his lance of matchless temper, and defied the haughty moor in the midst of his career. A combat took place in view of the two armies and of the Castilian court. The Moor was powerful in wielding his weapons and dexterous in managing his steed. He was of larger frame than Garcilaso and more completely armed, and the Christians trembled for their champion. The shock of their encounter was dreadful. Their lances were shivered and sent up splinters in the air. Garcilaso was thrown back in the saddle. His horse made a wild career before he could recover, gather up the reins, and return to the conflict. They now encountered each other with swords. The moor circled round his opponent as a hawk circles whereabout to make a swoop. His Arabian steed obeyed his rider with matchless quickness. At every attack of the infidel it seemed as if the Christian knight must sink beneath his flashing scimitar. But if Garcilaso were inferior to him in power, he was superior in agility. Many of his blows he parried. Others he received upon his Flemish shield, which was proof against the Damascus blade. The blood streamed from numerous wounds received by either warrior. The Moor, seeing his antagonist exhausted, availed himself of his superior force, and grappling, endeavored to wrest him from his saddle. They both fell to earth. The Moor placed his knee upon the breast of his victim, and brandishing his dagger, aimed a blow at his throat. A cry of despair was uttered by the Christian warriors when suddenly they beheld the moor rolling lifeless in the dust. 
Garcilaso had shortened his sword, and as his adversary raised his arm to strike, had pierced him to the heart. The laws of chivalry were observed throughout the combat. No one interfered on either side. Garcilaso now despoiled his adversary, then rescuing the holy inscription of Ave Maria from its degrading situation. He elevated it on the point of his sword and bore it off as a signal of triumph amid the rapturous shouts of the Christian army. The sun had now reached the meridian, and the hot blood of the Moors was inflamed by its rays and by the sight of the defeat of their champion. Musa ordered two pieces of ordnance to open a fire upon the Christians. A confusion was produced in one part of their ranks. Musa called to the chiefs of the army, Let us waste no more time in empty challenges. Let us charge upon the enemy. He who assaults has always an advantage in the combat. So saying, he rushed forward, followed by a large body of horse and foot and charged so furiously upon the advance guard of the Christians that he drove it in upon the battalion of the Marcus of Cadiz. The gallant Marcus now gave the signal to attack. Santiago was shouted along the line, and he pressed forward to the encounter with his battalion of twelve hundred lances. The other cavaliers followed his example, and the battle instantly became general. When the king and queen beheld the armies thus rushing to the combat, they threw themselves on their knees and implored the Holy Virgin to protect her faithful warriors. The prince and princess, the ladies of the court, and the prelates and friars who were present did the same and the effect of the prayers of these illustrious and saintly persons was immediately apparent. The fierceness with which the Moors had rushed to the attack had suddenly cooled. They were bold and adroit for a skirmish, but unequal to the veteran Spaniards in the open field. A panic seized upon the foot soldiers. They turned and took to flight. Musa and his cavaliers in vain endeavored to rally them. Some took refuge in the mountains, but the greater part fled to the city in such confusion that they overturned and trampled upon each other. The Christians pursued them to the very gates. Upward of two thousand were either killed, wounded, or taken prisoners and the two pieces of ordnance brought off as trophies of the victory. Not a Christian lance but was bathed that day in the blood of an infidel. Such was the brief but bloody action which was known among the Christian warriors by the name of the Queen's Skirmish, for when the Marcus of Cadiz waited upon Her Majesty, he attributed the victory entirely to her presence. The queen, however, insisted that it was all owing to her troops being led on by so valiant a commander. Her majesty had not yet recovered from her agitation at beholding so terrible a scene of bloodshed, though certain veterans present pronounced it as gay and gentle a skirmish as they had ever witnessed. The ravages of war had, as yet, spared a little portion of the Vega of Granada. A green belt of gardens and orchards still flourished around the city, extending along the banks of the Zenel and the Darro. They had been the solace and delight of the inhabitants in their happier days, and contributed to their sustenance in this time of scarcity. Ferdinand determined to make a final and exterminating ravage to the very walls of the city, so that there should not remain a single green thing for the sustenance of man or beast. As the evening advanced, the bustle in the camp subsided. Everyone sought repose, preparatory to the next day's trial. 
the king retired early that he might be up with the crowing of the cock to head the destroying army in person the queen had retired to the innermost part of her pavilion where she was performing her orisons before a private altar while thus at her prayers she was suddenly aroused by a glare of light and wreaths of suffocating smoke in an instant the whole tent was in a blaze there was a high gusty wind which whirled the light flames from tent to tent and wrapped the whole in one conflagration isabella had barely time to save herself by instant flight her first thought on being extricated from her tent was for the safety of the king she rushed to his tent but the vigilant ferdinand was already at the entrance of it starting from bed at the first alarm and fancying it an assault of the enemy he had seized his sword and buckler and sallied forth undressed with his cuirass upon his arm the late gorgeous camp was now a scene of wild confusion the flames kept spreading from one pavilion to another glaring upon the rich armor and golden and silver vessels which seemed melting in the fervent heat the ladies of the court fled shrieking and half dressed from their tents there was an alarm of drum and trumpet and a distracted hurry about the camp of men half armed the idea that this was a stratagem of the moors soon subsided but it was feared they might take advantage of it to assault the camp the marquis of cadiz therefore sallied forth with three thousand horse to check any advance from the city when they emerged from the camp they found the whole firmament illuminated the flames whirled up in long light spires and the air was filled with sparks and cinders a bright glare was thrown upon the city revealing every battlement and tower turbaned heads were seen gazing from every roof and armor gleamed along the walls yet not a single warrior sallied from the gates the moors suspected some stratagem on the part of the christians and kept quietly within their walls by degrees the flames expired the city faded from sight all again became dark and quiet and the marquis of cadiz returned with his cavalry to the camp when the day dawned on the christian camp nothing remained of that beautiful assemblage of stately pavilions but heaps of smouldering rubbish the fire at first had been attributed to treachery but on investigation it proved to be entirely accidental the wary ferdinand knew the sanguine temperament of the moors and hastened to prevent their deriving confidence from the night's disaster at break of day the drums and trumpets sounded to arms and the christian army issued from among the smoking ruins of their camp in shining squadrons with flaunting banners and bursts of martial melody as though the preceding night had been a time of high festivity instead of terror the moors had beheld the conflagration with wonder and perplexity when the day broke and they looked toward the christian camp they saw nothing but a dark smoking mass their scouts came in with the joyful intelligence that the whole camp was a scene of ruin scarce had the tidings spread throughout the city when they beheld the christian army advancing toward their walls they considered it a feint to cover their desperate situation and prepare for a retreat boabdil had one of his impulses of valor he determined to take the field in person and to follow up the signal blow which allah had inflicted on the enemy the christian army approached close to the city and were laying waste the gardens and orchards when boabdil sallied forth surrounded by all that was left of the flower and chivalry of granada 
there was not so much one battle as a variety of battles. Every garden and orchard became a scene of deadly contest. Every inch of ground was disputed with an agony of grief and valor by the Moors. Every inch of ground that the Christians advanced they valiantly maintained, but never did they advance with severer fighting or greater loss of blood. The cavalry of Musa was in every part of the field. Wherever it came, it gave fresh ardor to the fight. The Moorish soldier, fainting with heat, fatigue, and wounds, was roused to new life at the approach of Musa. And even he who lay gasping in the agonies of death turned his face toward him and faintly uttered cheers and blessings as he passed. The Christians had by this time gained possession of various towers near the city, from whence they had been annoyed by crossbows and arquebuses. The Moors, scattered in various actions, were severely pressed. Boabdil, at the head of the cavaliers of his guard, displayed the utmost valor, mingling in the fight in various parts of the field, and endeavoring to inspirit the foot soldiers in the combat. But the Moorish infantry was never to be depended upon. In the heat of the action, a panic seized upon them. They fled, leaving their sovereign exposed with his handful of cavaliers to an overwhelming force. Boabdil was on the point of falling into the hands of the Christians when, wheeling round with his followers, they threw the reins on the necks of their fleet steeds and took refuge by dint of hoof within the walls of the city. Musa endeavored to retrieve the fortune of the field. He threw himself before the retreating infantry, calling upon them to turn and fight for their homes, their families, for everything that was sacred and dear to them. It was all in vain. They were totally broken and dismayed, and fled tumultuously for the gates. Slowly and reluctantly, Musa retreated to the city, and he vowed never more to sally forth with foot soldiers to the field. In the meantime, the artillery thundered from the walls and checked all further advances of the Christians. King Ferdinand therefore called off his troops and returned in triumph to the ruins of his camp, leaving the beautiful city of Granada wrapped in the smoke of her fields and gardens and surrounded by the bodies of her slaughtered children. Such was the last sally made by the Moors in defense of their favorite city. They now shut themselves up gloomily within their walls. There were no longer any daring sallies from their gates. For a time they flattered themselves with hopes that the late conflagration of the camp would discourage the besiegers, that, as in former years, their invasion would end with the summer, and that they would again withdraw before the autumnal rains. The measures of Ferdinand and Isabella soon crushed these hopes. They gave orders to build a regular city upon the site of their camp to convince the Moors that the siege was to endure until the surrender of Granada. Nine of the principal cities of Spain were charged with the stupendous undertaking, and they emulated each other with a zeal worthy of the cause. To this city it was proposed to give the name of Isabella, so dear to the army and the nation, but that pious princess, calling to mind the holy cause in which it was erected, gave it the name of Santa Fe, or the city of the holy faith, and it remains to this day a monument of the piety and glory of the Catholic sovereigns. End of section 19. Read by Kerry Adams, your book voice at Mesa, Arizona, on the 23rd of November, 2021. Section 20 
of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 20. Conquest of Granada, A.D. 1490. Part 2. Washington Irving. In the meantime, the besieged city began to suffer the distress of famine. Its supplies were all cut off. A cavalcade of flocks and herds and mules, laden with money, coming to the relief of the city from the mountains of the Alpujarras, was taken by the Marquis of Cadiz, and led in triumph to the camp in sight of the suffering moors. Autumn arrived, but the harvests had been swept from the face of the country. A rigorous winter was approaching, and the city was almost destitute of provisions. The people sank into deep despondency. They called to mind all that had been predicted by astrologers at the birth of their ill-starred sovereign, and all that had been foretold of the fate of Granada at the time of the capture of Zahara. Boabdil was alarmed by the gathering dangers from without and by the clamors of his starving people. He summoned a council composed of the principal officers of the army, the Alcaids of the fortresses, the Zikis, or sages of the city, and the Alfakis, or doctors of the faith. They assembled in the great hall of audience of the Alhambra, and despair was painted in their countenances. Boabdil demanded of them what was to be done in their present extremity, and their answer was, surrender. The venerable Abul Qasim Abdomalik, governor of the city, represented its unhappy state. Our granaries are nearly exhausted, and no further supplies are to be expected. The provender for the war horses is required as sustenance for the soldiery. The very horses themselves are killed for food. Of seven thousand steeds which once could be sent into the field, Three hundred only remain. Our city contains two hundred thousand inhabitants, old and young, with each a mouth that calls piteously for bread. The Zikis and principal citizens declared that the people could no longer sustain the labors and sufferings of a defense. And of what avail is our defense, said they, when the enemy is determined to persist in the siege? What alternative remains but to surrender or to die? The heart of Boabdil was touched by this appeal, and he maintained a gloomy silence. He had cherished some faint hope of relief from the Sultan of Egypt or the Barbary powers, but it was now at an end. Even if such assistance were to be sent, he had no longer a seaport where it might debark. The councillors saw that the resolution of the king was shaken, and they united their voices in urging him to capitulate. The valiant Musa alone arose in opposition. It is yet too early, said he, to talk of a surrender. Our means are not exhausted. We have yet one source of strength remaining, terrible in its effects, and which often has achieved the most signal victories. It is our despair. Let us rouse the mass of the people. Let us put weapons in their hands. Let us fight the enemy to the very utmost until we rush upon the points of their lances. I am ready to lead the way into the thickest of their squadrons, and much rather would I be numbered among those who fell in the defense of Granada than of those who survived to capitulate to her surrender. The words of Musa were without effect. Boabdil yielded to the general voice. It was determined to capitulate with the Christian sovereigns, and the venerable Abul Qasim was sent forth to the camp 
empowered to treat for terms. The old governor was received with great distinction by Ferdinand and Isabella, who appointed Gonsalvo of Cordova and Fernando de Safra, secretary to the king, to confer with him. All Granada awaited, in trembling anxiety, the result of his negotiations. After repeated conferences, he at length returned with the ultimate terms of the Catholic sovereigns. They agreed to suspend all attack for seventy days, at the end of which time, if no succor should arrive to the Moorish king, the city of Granada was to be surrendered. All Christian captives should be liberated without ransom. Boabdil and his principal cavaliers should take an oath of fealty to the Castilian crown, and certain valuable territories in the Alpujara mountains should be assigned to the Moorish monarch for his maintenance. The Moors of Granada should become subjects of the Spanish sovereigns, retaining their possessions, their arms, and horses, and yielding up nothing but their artillery. They should be protected in the exercise of their religion, and governed by their own laws, administered by Cades of their own faith, under governors appointed by the sovereigns. They should be exempted from tribute for three years, after which term they should pay the same that they had been accustomed to render to their native monarchs. Those who chose to depart for Africa within three years should be provided with a passage for themselves and their effects free of charge from whatever port they should prefer. For the fulfillment of these articles, four hundred hostages from the principal families were required, previous to the surrender, to be subsequently restored. The son of the king of Granada and all other hostages in possession of the Castilian sovereigns were to be restored at the same time. Such were the conditions that the vizier Abul Qasim laid before the Council of Granada as the best that could be obtained from the besieging foe. When the members of the council found that the awful moment had arrived, when they were to sign and seal the perdition of their empire and blot themselves out as a nation, all firmness deserted them, and many gave way to tears. Musa alone retained an unaltered mien. Leave, signors, cried he, this idle lamentation to helpless women and children. We are men. We have hearts, not to shed tender tears, but drops of blood. I see the spirit of the people so cast down that it is impossible to save the kingdom. Yet there still remains an alternative for noble minds, a glorious death. Let us die defending our liberty and avenging the woes of Granada. Our mother earth will receive her children into her bosom, safe from the chains and oppressions of the conqueror, or should any fail a sepulchre to hide his remains, he will not want a sky to cover him. Allah forbid it should be said the nobles of Granada feared to die in her defense. Musa ceased to speak, and a dead silence reigned in the assembly. Boabdil looked anxiously around and scanned every face, but he read in them all the anxiety of careworn men, in whose hearts enthusiasm was dead, and who had grown callous to every chivalrous appeal. Allah Akbar, God is great, exclaimed he. There is no God but God, and Mohammed is his prophet. It is in vain to struggle against the will of heaven. Too surely was it written in the book of fate that I should be unfortunate and the kingdom expire under my rule. Allah Akbar, God is great, echoed the viziers and al-Fakis. The will of God be done. So 
they all accorded with the king that these evils were preordained, that it was hopeless to contend with them, and that the terms offered by the Castilian monarchs were as favorable as could be expected. When Musa saw that they were about to sign the Treaty of Surrender, he rose in violent indignation. Do not deceive yourselves, cried he, nor think the Christians will be faithful to their promises or their king as magnanimous in conquest as he has been victorious in war. Death is the least we have to fear. It is the plundering and sacking of our city, the profanation of our mosques, the ruin of our homes, the violation of our wives and daughters, cruel oppression, bigoted intolerance, whips and chains, the dungeon, the faggot, and the stake. Such are the miseries and indignities we shall see and suffer. At least those groveling souls will see them who now shrink from an honorable death. For my part, by Allah, I will never witness them. With these words, he left the council chamber and strode gloomily through the court of lions and the outer halls of the Alhambra, without deigning to speak to the obsequious courtiers who attended in them. He repaired to his dwelling, armed himself at all points, mounted his favorite war horse, and issuing forth from the city by the gate of Elvira, was never seen or heard of more. The capitulation for the surrender of Granada was signed on November 25, 1491, and produced a sudden cessation of those hostilities which had raged for so many years. Christian and Moor might now be seen mingling courteously on the banks of the Zeno and the Darro, where to have met a few days previous would have produced a scene of sanguinary contest. Still, as the Moors might be suddenly aroused to defense if, within the allotted term of seventy days, succors should arrive from abroad, and as they were at all times a rash, inflammable people, the wary Ferdinand maintained a vigilant watch upon the city, and permitted no supplies of any kind to enter. His garrisons in the seaports and his cruisers in the Straits of Gibraltar were ordered likewise to guard against any relief from the Grand Sultan of Egypt or the Princes of Barbary. There was no need of such precautions. Those powers were either too much engrossed by their own wars or too much daunted by the success of the Spanish arms to interfere in a desperate cause and the unfortunate Moors of Granada were abandoned to their fate. The month of December had nearly passed away. The famine became extreme, and there was no hope of any favorable event within the term specified in the capitulation. Boabdil saw that to hold out to the end of the allotted time would but be to protract the miseries of his people. With the consent of his council, he determined to surrender the city on January 6th. On December 30th, he sent his grand vizier, Yusuf Abin Kumiksa, with the 400 hostages to King Ferdinand to make known his intention, bearing him, at the same time, a present of a magnificent scimitar and two Arabian steeds, superbly caparisoned, the unfortunate Boabdil was doomed to meet with trouble to the end of his career. The very next day, the Santon, or Dervis, Hamid Abin Zarax, who had uttered prophecies and excited commotions on former occasions, suddenly made his appearance. Whence he came, no one knew. It was rumored that he had been in the mountains of the Alpajaras and on the coast of Barbary, endeavoring to rouse the Moslems to the relief of Granada. He was reduced to a skeleton. His eyes glowed like coals in their sockets, 
and his speech was little better than frantic raving. He harangued the populace in the streets and squares, inveighed against the capitulation, denounced the king and nobles as Moslems only in name, and called upon the people to sally forth against the unbelievers, for that Allah had decreed them a signal victory. Upward of 20,000 of the populace seized their arms and paraded the streets with shouts and outcries. The shops and houses were shut up. The king himself did not dare to venture forth, but remained a kind of prisoner in the Alhambra. The turbulent multitude continued roaming and shouting and howling about the city during the day and a part of the night. Hunger and a wintry tempest tamed their frenzy, and when morning came, the enthusiast who had led them on had disappeared. Whether he had been disposed of by the emissaries of the king or by the leading men of the city is not known. His disappearance remains a mystery. The Moorish king now issued from the Alhambra, attended by his principal nobles, and harangued the populace. He set forth the necessity of complying with the capitulation from the famine that reigned in the city, the futility of defense, and from the hostages having already been delivered into the hands of the besiegers. The volatile population agreed to adhere to the capitulation, and there was even a faint shout of long live Boabdil the unfortunate, and they all returned to their homes in perfect tranquility. Boabdil immediately sent missives to King Ferdinand, apprising him of these events, and of his fears lest further delay should produce new tumults. He proposed, therefore, to surrender the city on the following day. The Castilian sovereigns assented with great satisfaction, and preparations were made in city and camp for this great event that was to seal the fate of Granada. It was a night of doleful lamentings within the walls of the Alhambra, for the household of Boabdil were preparing to take a last farewell of that delightful abode. All the royal treasures and the most precious effects of the Alhambra were hastily packed upon mules. The beautiful apartments were despoiled with tears and wailings by their own inhabitants. Before the dawn of day, a mournful cavalcade moved obscurely out of a postern gate of the Alhambra and departed through one of the most retired quarters of the city. It was composed of the family of the unfortunate Boabdil, which he sent off thus privately, that they might not be exposed to the eyes of scoffers or the exultation of the enemy. The city was yet buried in sleep as they passed through its silent streets. The guards at the gate shed tears as they opened it for their departure. They paused not, but proceeded along the banks of the Zenil on the road that leads to the Alpujarras, until they arrived at a hamlet at some distance from the city, where they halted and waited until they should be joined by King Boabdil. The sun had scarcely begun to shed his beams upon the summits of the snowy mountains which rise above Granada when the Christian camp was in motion. A detachment of horse and foot, led by distinguished cavaliers, and accompanied by Hernando de Talavera, Bishop of Avila, proceeded to take possession of the Alhambra and the towers. It had been stipulated in the capitulation that the detachment sent for this purpose should not enter by the streets of the city. A road had therefore been opened outside of the walls, leading by the Puerta de los Melinos, or Gate of the Mills, to the summit of the Hill of Martyrs, and across the hill to a postern gate of the Alhambra. When the detachment arrived at the summit of the hill, the Moorish king came forth from the gate, attended by a handful of cavaliers, leaving his vizier, Yusuf Abin Kumiksa, to deliver up the palace. Go, senor, said he to the commander of the detachment. Go, 
and take possession of those fortresses which Allah has bestowed upon your powerful sovereigns in punishment of the sins of the Moors. He said no more, but passed mournfully on along the same road by which the Spanish cavaliers had come, descending to the Vega to meet the Catholic sovereigns. The troops entered the Alhambra, the gates of which were wide open, and all its splendid courts and halls silent and deserted. In the meantime, the Christian court and army poured out of the city of Santa Fe and advanced across the Vega. The king and queen, with the prince and princess, and the dignitaries and ladies of the court, took the lead, accompanied by the different orders of monks and friars, and surrounded by the royal guards splendidly arrayed. The procession moved slowly forward and paused at the village of Armila, at the distance of half a league from the city. The sovereigns waited here with impatience, their eyes fixed on the lofty tower of the Alhambra, watching for the appointed signal of possession. The time that had elapsed since the departure of the detachment seemed to them more than necessary for the purpose and the anxious mind of Ferdinand began to entertain doubts of some commotion in the city. At length they saw the silver cross, the great standard of this crusade, elevated on the Torre di Lavalla, or the great watchtower, and sparkling in the sunbeams. This was done by Hernando de Talavera, Bishop of Avila. Beside it was planted the pennon of the glorious apostle St. James, and a great shout of Santiago, Santiago, rose throughout the army. Lastly was reared the royal standard by the king of arms, with a shout of Castile, Castile, for King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. The words were echoed by the whole army with acclamations that resounded across the Vega. At sight of these signals of possession, the sovereigns sank upon their knees, giving thanks to God for this great triumph. The whole assembled host followed their example, and the choristers of the royal chapel broke forth into the solemn anthem of Dideum Laudamus. The procession now resumed its march with joyful alacrity to the sound of triumphant music until they came to a small mosque near the banks of the Zeno and not far from the foot of the Hill of Martyrs, which edifice remains to the present day, consecrated as the Hermitage of St. Sebastian. Here the sovereigns were met by the unfortunate Boabdil, accompanied by about fifty cavaliers and domestics. As he drew near, he would have dismounted in token of homage, but Ferdinand prevented him. He then proffered to kiss the king's hand, but this sign of vassalage was likewise declined, whereupon, not to be outdone in magnanimity, he leaned forward and kissed the right arm of Ferdinand. Queen Isabella also refused to receive this ceremonial of homage and to console him under his adversity, delivered to him his son, who had remained as hostage ever since Boabdil's liberation from captivity. The Moorish monarch pressed his child to his bosom with tender emotion, and they seemed mutually endeared to each other by their misfortunes. He then delivered the keys of the city to King Ferdinand with an air of mingled melancholy and resignation. These keys, said he, are the last relics of the Arabian Empire in Spain. Thine, O King, are our trophies, our kingdom, and our person. Such is the will of God. Receive them with the clemency thou hast promised and which we look for at thy hands. King Ferdinand restrained his exultation with an air of serene magnanimity. Doubt not our promises, replied he, nor that thou shalt regain from our friendship 
the prosperity of which the fortune of war has deprived thee. On receiving the keys, King Ferdinand handed them to the queen. She, in her turn, presented them to her son, Prince Juan, who delivered them to the Count de Tendilla. That brave and loyal cavalier, being appointed Alcaid of the city and Captain General of the Kingdom of Granada, having surrendered the last symbol of power, the unfortunate Boabdil continued on toward the Alpujarras, that he might not behold the entrance of the Christians into his capital. His devoted band of cavaliers followed him in gloomy silence but heavy sighs burst from their bosoms as shouts of joy and strains of triumphant music were borne on the breeze from the victorious army. Having rejoined his family, Boabdil set forward with a heavy heart for his allotted residence in the valley of Porcina. At two leagues' distance, the cavalcade, winding into the skirts of the Alpujarras, ascended an eminence commanding the last view of Granada. As they arrived at this spot, the Moors paused involuntarily to take a farewell gaze at their beloved city, which a few steps more would shut from their sight forever. The Moorish cavaliers gazed with a silent agony of tenderness and grief upon that delicious abode, the scene of their loves and pleasures. While they yet looked, a light cloud of smoke burst forth from the citadel, and presently a peal of artillery, faintly heard, told that the city was taken possession of, and the throne of the Moslem kings was lost forever. The unhappy Boabdil was not to be consoled. His tears continued to flow. Allah Akbar! exclaimed he. When did misfortunes ever equal mine? From this circumstance, the hill, which is not far from the Padur, took the name of Feg Allah Akbar. But the point of view commanding the last prospect of Granada is known among the Spaniards by the name of El Ultimo Suspiro del Moro the last sigh of the moor. The sovereigns did not enter the city on this day of its surrender, but waited until it should be fully occupied by their troops and public tranquility ensured. In a little while, every battlement glistened with Christian helms and lances. The standard of the faith and of the realm floated from every tower, and the thundering salvos of the ordnance told that the subjugation of the city was complete. The grandees and cavaliers now knelt and kissed the hands of the king and queen and the prince Juan, and congratulated them on the acquisition of so great a kingdom, after which the royal procession returned in state to Santa Fe. It was on January 6th, the day of kings and festival of the Epiphany, that the sovereigns made their triumphal entry. The king and queen looked on this occasion as more than mortal. The venerable ecclesiastics, to whose advice and zeal this glorious conquest ought in a great measure to be attributed, moved along with hearts swelling with holy exultation but with chastened and downcast looks of edifying humility, while the hardy warriors, in tossing plumes and shining steel, seemed elevated with a stern joy at finding themselves in possession of this object of so many toils and perils. As the streets resounded with the tramp of steed and swelling peals of music, the Moors buried themselves in the deepest recesses of their dwellings. There they bewailed in secret the fallen glory of their race, but suppressed their groans, lest they should be heard by their enemies, and increase their triumph. The royal procession advanced to the principal mosque, which had been consecrated as a cathedral. 
Here the sovereigns offered up prayers and thanksgivings, and the choir of the royal chapel chanted a triumphant anthem, in which they were joined by all the courtiers and cavaliers. Nothing could exceed the thankfulness to God of the pious King Ferdinand for having enabled him to eradicate from Spain the empire and name of that accursed heathen race, and for the elevation of the cross in that city wherein the impious doctrines of Mohammed had so long been cherished. In the fervor of his spirit, he supplicated from heaven a continuance of its grace, and that this glorious triumph might be perpetuated. The prayer of the pious monarch was responded by the people, and even his enemies were for once convinced of his sincerity. It had been a last request of the unfortunate Boabdil, and one which showed how deeply he felt the transition of his fate, that no person might be permitted to enter or depart by the gate of the Alhambra through which he had sallied forth to surrender his capital. His request was granted. The portal was closed up and remains so to the present day, a mute memorial of that event. The Spanish sovereigns fixed their throne in the presence chamber of the palace, so long the seat of Moorish royalty. Hither the principal inhabitants of Granada repaired to pay them homage and kiss their hands in token of vassalage, and their example was followed by deputies from all the towns and fortresses of the Alpujarras which had not hitherto submitted. Thus terminated the war of Granada after ten years of incessant fighting, equaling the far-famed siege of Troy in duration, and ending, like that, in the capture of the city. Thus ended also the dominion of the Moors in Spain, having endured 778 years from the memorable defeat of Roderick, the last of the Goths, on the banks of the Guadalete. This great triumph of our holy Catholic faith took place in the beginning of January 1492, being 3,655 years from the population of Spain by the Patriarch Tubal, 3,797 from the General Deluge, 5,453 from the creation of the world, according to Hebrew calculation. And in the month Rabbik, in the 897th year of the Hegera, or Flight of Muhammad. End of section 20. Read by Kerry Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 10th of December, 2021. Section 21 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Columbus Discovers America, A.D. 1492, by Christopher Columbus. The year 1492 in which Columbus discovered America is adopted by some writers as separating the modern from the medieval period in history. It marks the culmination of the wonderful achievements in discovery for which the 15th century is so memorable. By 1492, the world had advanced far beyond the ignorance of the period when Marco Polo made and described his famous travels from Europe to the East, 1324, and when Sir John Mandeville's extravagant account of Eastern journeys, 1357 to 1371, was published. European knowledge of the Orient had been greatly increased by the Crusades, and this, together with the spread of commerce, had quickened the desire of Western peoples for still further explorations of the world. During the first half of the 15th century, 
the Portuguese were most enterprising in the work of discovery, and before 1500 they had searched the western coast of Africa, passed the equator, and seen the Cape of Good Hope, which Vasco de Gama doubled in 1497 on his way to India. Meanwhile, Christopher Columbus, a native of Genoa, a famous maritime city, was planning a route of his own for a voyage to the East Indies, the great object at that period of all ambitious navigators. As the Portuguese sought and at last found an ocean route by the east around Africa, so Columbus meditated a westward voyage and was the first to seek India in that direction. After vainly submitting his plan to John II of Portugal, to the Genoese government, and to Henry VII of England, he appealed, at first without success, to Ferdinand and Isabella of Castile. But at the end of their war with Granada, 1492, he obtained a better hearing, and gained the favor of Isabella, who joined the Pinzons, merchants of Pelos, in fitting out for him three small vessels, the Niña, the Santa Maria, and the Pinta. With the concurrence of Ferdinand, she made Columbus, for himself and his heirs, admiral in all the regions that he should discover, and viceroy in any lands acquired by him for Spain. When the bold mariner sailed from Saltes, an island near Palos, a small town in the province of Huelva, Spain, he had complete confidence in his theory of finding new lands to the west, and his unshakable faith in his idea and in his purpose constitutes the most heroic aspect of his first voyage. Of recent years, great interest and much historical discussion have been aroused in connection with real or imagined pre-Columbian discoveries of America, especially with the discovery by the Northmen. But all attempts to diminish the glory of Columbus's achievement by proving that the results of previous discoveries were known to him have, as Hubert Howe Bancroft declares, signally failed. Columbus was not the first to conceive the possibility of reaching the east by sailing west. Toscanelli, the Italian astronomer who made the map which Columbus used, and Others among his contemporaries entertained the theory, but the Genoese sailor was the first to act upon this belief. Supposing, as he did to his latest day, that he had found the eastern coast of India and not another continent, Columbus gave the name of Indies to the islands he discovered, whose inhabitants he also called Indians. Yet, he did not have the honor of giving his own name to the new world, which he made known to mankind. In the following pages, his own unstudied account of the first voyage and discovery, and the narrative from the biography of Columbus by his son, furnish a very complete history of the enterprise from which so large a part of the world's later development has followed. It should be noted, however, that both of the accounts manifest the not unnatural desire to give full prominence to the part taken by Columbus himself. His able coadjutors, the Pinzons, scarce receive such adequate mention as they are given by more modern narrators. The letter to Gabriel Sanchez appears here in a careful edition, one of the treasured possessions of the New York Public Library, Lennox Library, through the courtesy of whose officers it is presented in this work. It is the first letter of Columbus, giving the earliest information of his discovery, and is here rendered in a new translation, as contained in the little volume published in 1892 by the trustees of the Lennox Library as a, quote, tribute to the memory of the great discoverer, end quote. Christopher Columbus Letter of Christopher Columbus, to whom our age owes much, concerning the islands recently discovered in the Indian Sea, for the search of which, eight months before, 
he was sent under the auspices and at the cost of the most invincible Ferdinand, King of Spain, addressed to the magnificent Lord Rafael Sanchis, treasurer of the same most illustrious king, and which the noble and learned man Leander de Cosco has translated from the Spanish language into Latin on the third of the Calends of May, 1493, the first year of the pontificate of Alexander the Sixth. Because my undertakings have attained success, I know that it will be pleasing to you. These I have determined to relate, so that you may be made acquainted with everything done and discovered in this our voyage. On the thirty-third day after I departed from Cadiz, I came to the Indian Sea, where I found many islands inhabited by men without number, of all which I took possession for our most fortunate king with proclaiming heralds and flying standards no one objecting to the first of these i gave the name of the blessed saviour on whose aid relying i had reached this as well as the other islands but the indians call it guanahani i also called each one of the others by a new name for i ordered one island to be called santa maria of the conception another Fernandina, another Isabella, another Juana, and so on with the rest. As soon as we had arrived at that island, which I have just now said was called Juana, I proceeded along its coast toward the west for some distance. I found it so large and without perceptible end that I believed it to be not an island, but the continental country of Cathay, seeing however no towns or cities situated on the sea coast but only some villages and rude farms with whose inhabitants i was unable to converse because as soon as they saw us they took flight i proceeded farther thinking that i would discover some city or large residences at length perceiving that we had gone far enough that nothing new appeared and that this way was leading us to the north, which I wished to avoid, because it was winter on the land, and it was my intention to go to the south. Moreover, the winds were becoming violent. I therefore determined that no other plans were practicable, and so, going back, I returned to a certain bay that I had noticed, from which I sent two of our men to the land, that they might find out whether there was a king in this country, or any cities. These men travelled for three days, and they found people and houses without number, but they were small and without any government, therefore they returned. Now, in the meantime, I had learned from certain Indians whom I had seized there that this country was indeed an island, and therefore I proceeded toward the east, keeping all the time near the coast, for 322 miles, to the extreme ends of this island. From this place I saw another island to the east, distant from this Juana 54 miles, which I called forthwith Hispania, and I sailed to it, and I steered along the northern coast, as at Juana, toward the east, 564 miles, and the said Juana and the other islands there appear very fertile. This island is surrounded by many very safe and wide harbors, not excelled by any others that I have ever seen. Many great and salubrious rivers flow through it. There are also many very high mountains there. All these islands are very beautiful and distinguished by various qualities. They are accessible and full of a great variety of trees stretching up to the stars, the leaves of which I believe are never shed, for I saw them as green and flourishing as they are usually in Spain in the month of May. Some of them were blossoming, some were bearing fruit, some were in other conditions, each one was thriving in its own way. The nightingale and various other birds without number were singing in the month of November when I was exploring them. 
There are, besides, in the said island Juana, seven or eight kinds of palm trees, which far excel ours in height and beauty, just as all the other trees, herbs, and fruits do. There are also excellent pine trees, vast plains and meadows, a variety of birds, a variety of honey, and a variety of metals, excepting iron. In the one which was called Hispania, as we said above, there are great and beautiful mountains, vast fields, groves, fertile plains, very suitable for planting and cultivating, and for the building of houses. The convenience of the harbors in this island, and the remarkable number of rivers contributing to the healthfulness of man, exceed belief unless one has seen them. The trees, pasturage, and fruits of this island differ greatly from those of Juana. This Hispania, moreover, abounds in different kinds of spices, in gold and in metals. On this island, indeed, and on all the others which I have seen, and of which I have knowledge, the inhabitants of both sexes go always naked, just as they came into the world, except some of the women, who use a covering of a leaf or some foliage, or a cotton cloth, which they make themselves for that purpose. All these people lack, as I said above, every kind of iron. They are also without weapons, which indeed are unknown, nor are they competent to use them, not on account of deformity of body, for they are well formed, but because they are timid and full of fear. They carry for weapons, however, reeds baked in the sun, on the lower ends of which they fasten some shafts of dried wood rubbed down to a point, and, indeed, they do not venture to use these always, for it frequently happened when I sent two or three of my men to some of the villages that they might speak with the natives, a compact troop of the Indians would march out, and as soon as they saw our men approaching, they would quickly take flight, children being pushed aside by their fathers and fathers by their children. And this was not because any hurt or injury had been inflicted on any one of them, for to everyone whom I visited and with whom I was able to converse, I distributed whatever I had, cloth and many other things, no return being made to me but they are by nature fearful and timid. Yet when they perceive that they are safe, putting aside all fear, they are of simple manners and trustworthy and very liberal with everything they have, refusing no one who asks for anything they may possess and even themselves inviting us to ask for things. They show greater love for all others than for themselves. They give valuable things for trifles, being satisfied even with a very small return, or with nothing. However, I forbade that things so small and of no value should be given to them, such as pieces of plates, dishes and glass, likewise keys and shoe straps, although if they were able to obtain these it seemed to them like getting the most beautiful jewels in the world. It happened, indeed, that a certain sailor obtained in exchange for a shoe-strap as much worth of gold as would equal three golden coins, and likewise other things for articles of very little value, especially for new silver coins, and for some gold coins, to obtain which they gave whatever the seller desired, as, for instance, an ounce and a half and two ounces of gold, or thirty and forty pounds of cotton, with which they were already acquainted. They also traded cotton and gold for pieces of bows, bottles, jugs, and jars, like persons without reason, which I forbade, because it was very wrong. And I gave to them many beautiful and pleasing things that I had brought with me, no value being taken in exchange, in order that I might the more easily make them friendly to me, that they might be made worshippers of Christ, and that they might be full of love toward our king, queen, and prince, and the whole Spanish nation. 
also that they might be zealous to search out and collect and deliver to us those things of which they had plenty and which we greatly needed. These people practice no kind of idolatry. On the contrary, they firmly believe that all strength and power and in fact all good things are in heaven and that I had come down from thence with these ships and sailors. And in this belief I was received there after they had put aside fear. Nor are they slow or unskilled, but of excellent and acute understanding. And the men who have navigated that sea give an account of everything in an admirable manner, but they never saw people clothed, nor these kind of ships. As soon as I reached that sea, I seized by force several Indians on the first island, in order that they might learn from us, and in like manner, tell us about those things in these lands of which they themselves had knowledge. And the plan succeeded, for in a short time we understood them and they us, sometimes by gestures and signs, sometimes by words, and it was a great advantage to us. They are coming with me now, yet always believing that I descended from heaven, although they have been living with us for a long time and are living with us today. And these men were the first who announced it wherever we landed, continually proclaiming to the others in a loud voice, Come, come, and you will see the celestial people. Whereupon both women and men, both children and adults, both young men and old men, laying aside the fear, caused a little before, visited us eagerly, filling the road with a great crowd, some bringing food and some drink, with great love and extraordinary goodwill. On every island there are many canoes of a single piece of wood, and, though narrow, yet in length and shape similar to our rowboats, but swifter in movement. They steer only by oars. Some of these boats are large, some small, some of medium size. Yet they row many of the larger rowboats with eighteen cross benches, with which they cross to all those islands, which are innumerable, and with these boats they perform their trading and carry on commerce among them. I saw some of these rowboats or canoes, which were carrying seventy and eighty rowers. In all these islands there is no difference in the appearance of the people, nor in the manners and language, but all understand each other mutually, a fact that is very important for the end which I suppose to be earnestly desired by our most illustrious king, that is, their conversion to the holy religion of Christ, to which in truth, as far as I can perceive, they are very ready and favorably inclined. I said before how I proceeded along the island Juana in a straight line, from west to east, 322 miles, according to which course, and the length of the way, I am able to say that this Juana is larger than England and Scotland together. For, besides the said 322,000 paces, there are two more provinces in that part which lies toward the west, which I did not visit. One of these the Indians call Anan, whose inhabitants are born with tails. They extend to 180 miles in length, as I have learned from those Indians I have with me, who are all acquainted with these islands. But the circumference of Hispania is still greater than all Spain, from Colonia to Fontarabia. This is easily proved, because its fourth side, which I myself passed along in a straight line from west to east, extends 540 miles. This island is to be desired and is very desirable, and not to be despised, in which, although, as I have said, I solemnly took possession of all the others for our most invincible king, and their government is entirely committed to the said king, yet I especially took possession of a certain large town in a very convenient location, and adapted to all kinds of gain and commerce, 
to which we give the name of our Lord of the Nativity. And I commanded a fort to be built there forthwith, which must be completed by this time, in which I left as many men as seemed necessary, with all kinds of arms and plenty of food for more than a year. Likewise, one caravel, and for the construction of others, men skilled in this trade and in other professions, and also the extraordinary good will and friendship of the king of this island toward us, for those people are very amiable and kind, to such a degree that the said king gloried in calling me his brother, and if they should change their minds, and should wish to hurt those who remained in the fort, they would not be able, because they lack weapons, they go naked, and are too cowardly. For that reason, those who hold the said fort are at least able to resist easily this whole island without any imminent danger to themselves, so long as they do not transgress the regulations and command which we gave. In all these islands, as I have understood, each man is content with only one wife, except the princes or kings who are permitted to have twenty. The women appear to work more than the men. I was not able to find out surely whether they have individual property, for I saw that one man had the duty of distributing to the others, especially refreshments, food, and things of that kind. I found no monstrosities among them, as very many supposed, but men of great reverence and friendly nor are they black like the Ethiopians. They have straight hair, hanging down. They do not remain where the solar rays send out the heat, for the strength of the sun is very great here, because it is distant from the equinoctial line, as it seems, only 26 degrees. On the tops of the mountains, too, the cold is severe, but the Indians, however, moderate it, partly by being accustomed to the place, and partly by the help of very hot victuals, of which they eat frequently and immoderately. And so I did not see any monstrosity, nor did I have knowledge of them anywhere excepting a certain island named Charis, which is the second in passing from Hispania to India. This island is inhabited by a certain people who are considered very warlike by their neighbors. These eat human flesh. The said people have many kinds of rowboats, in which they cross over to all the other Indian islands and seize and carry away everything that they can. They differ in no way from the others, only that they wear long hair like the women. They use bows and darts made of reeds, with sharpened shafts fastened to the larger end, as we have described. On this account they are considered warlike, wherefore the other Indians are afflicted with continual fear, but I regard them as of no more account than the others. These are the people who visit certain women, who alone inhabit the island, Mateunin, which is the first in passing from Hispania to India. These women, moreover, perform no kind of work of their sex, for they use bows and darts, like those I have described of their husbands. They protect themselves with sheets of copper, of which there is great abundance among them. They tell me of another island greater than the aforesaid Hispania, whose inhabitants are without hair, and which abounds in gold above all the others. I am bringing with me men of this island, and of the others that I have seen, who give proof of the things that I have described. Finally, that I may compress in few words the brief account of our departure and quick return, and the gain, I promise this, that if I am supported by our most invincible sovereigns with a little of their help, as much gold can be supplied as they will need. Indeed, as much of spices, of cotton, of chewing gum, which is only found in Chios. Also, as much of aloes wood, and as many slaves for the navy as their majesties will wish to demand. 
Likewise, rhubarb and other kinds of spices which I suppose these men whom I left in the said fort have already found and will continue to find, since I remained in no place longer than the winds forced me except in the town of the Nativity, while I provided for the building of the fort and for the safety of all which things although they are very great and remarkable yet they would have been much greater if i had been aided by as many ships as the occasion required truly great and wonderful is this and not corresponding to our merits but to the holy christian religion and to the piety and religion of our sovereigns because what the human understanding could not attain that the divine will has granted to human efforts for God is wont to listen to his servants who love his precepts, even in impossibilities, as has happened to us on the present occasion, who have attained that which hitherto mortal men have never reached. For if any one has written or said anything about these islands, it was all with obscurities and conjectures. No one claims that he had seen them, from which they seemed like fables. Therefore, let the king and queen, the princes and their most fortunate kingdoms, and all other countries of Christendom, give thanks to our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who has bestowed upon us so great a victory and gift. Let religious processions be solemnized. Let sacred festivals be given. Let the churches be covered with festive garlands. Let Christ rejoice on earth as he rejoices in heaven when he foresees coming to salvation so many souls of people hitherto lost. Let us be glad also as well on account of the exaltation of our faith as on account of the increase of our temporal affairs of which not only Spain but universal Christendom will be partaker. These things that have been done are thus briefly related. Farewell. Lisbon, the day before the Ides of March. Christopher Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean Fleet. End of Section 21 Read by Linda Johnson, August 2021「Section 22 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Columbus Discovers America, A.D. 1492, by Ferdinand Columbus. All the conditions which the admiral demanded being conceded by their Catholic majesties, he set out from Granada on May 21, 1492, for Palos, where he was to fit out the ships for his intended expedition that town was bound to serve the crown for three months with two caravels which were ordered to be given to columbus and he fitted out these and a third vessel with all care and diligence the ship in which he personally embarked was called the santa maria the second vessel named the pinta was commanded by martin alonso pinzon and the third named the nina which had square sails was under the command of Vincent Yanez Pinzon, the brother of Alonso, both of whom were inhabitants of Palos. Being furnished with all necessaries, and having ninety men to navigate the three vessels, Columbus set sail from Palos on August 3, 1492, shaping his course directly for the Canaries. During this voyage, and indeed in all the four voyages which he made from Spain to the West Indies, the admiral was very careful to keep an exact journal of every occurrence which took place, always specifying what winds blew, how far he sailed with each particular wind, 
what currents were found, and everything that was seen by the way, whether birds, fishes, or any other thing. Although, to note all these particulars with a minute relation of everything that happened, showing what impressions and effects answered to the course and aspect of the stars, and the differences between the seas which he sailed and those of our countries might all be useful, yet, as I conceive that the relation of these particulars might now be tiresome to the reader, I shall only give an account of what appears to me necessary and convenient to be known. On Saturday, August 4th, the next day after sailing from Palos, the rudder of the Pinta broke loose. The admiral strongly suspected that it was occasioned by the contrivance of the master on purpose to avoid proceeding on the voyage, which he had endeavored to do before they left Spain, and he therefore ranged up alongside of the disabled vessel to give every assistance in his power. But the wind blew so hard that he was unable to afford any aid. Pinzon, however, being an experienced seaman, soon made a temporary repair by means of ropes, and they proceeded on their voyage. But on the following Tuesday, the weather becoming rough and boisterous, the fastenings gave way, and the squadron was obliged to lay to for some time to renew the repairs. From this misfortune of twice breaking the rudder, a superstitious person might have foreboded the future disobedience of Pinzon to the admiral, as through his malice the Pinta twice separated from the squadron, as shall be afterward related. Having applied the best remedy they could to the disabled state of the rudder, the squadron continued its voyage and came in sight of the Canaries at daybreak of Thursday, August 9th but owing to contrary winds, they were unable to come to anchor at Gran Canaria until the 12th. The admiral left Pinzon at Gran Canaria to endeavor to procure another vessel instead of that which was disabled, and went himself with the Niña on the same errand to Gomera. The admiral arrived at Gomera on Sunday, August 12th, and sent a boat on shore to inquire if any vessel could be procured there for his purpose. The boat returned next morning, and brought intelligence that no vessel was then at that island, but that Doña Beatrix de Bobadilla, the proprietrix of the island, was then at Gran Canaria in a hired vessel of forty tons, belonging to one Gradeuna of Seville, which would probably suit his purpose and might perhaps be got. He therefore determined to await the arrival of that vessel at Gomera, believing that Pinzon might have secured a vessel for himself at Gran Canaria, if he had not been able to repair his own. After waiting two days, he dispatched one of his people in a bark, which was bound from Gomera to Gran Canaria to acquaint Pinzon where he lay, and to assist him in repairing and fixing the rudder. Having waited a considerable time for an answer to his letter, he sailed with the two vessels from Gomera on August 23rd for Gran Canaria, and fell in with the bark on the following day, which had been detained all that time on its voyage by contrary winds. He now took his man from the bark, and sailing in the night past the island of Tenerife, the people were much astonished at observing flames bursting out of the lofty mountain called El Pico, or the Peak of Tenerife. On this occasion, the admiral was at great pains to explain the nature of this phenomenon to the people by instancing the example of Etna and several other known volcanoes. Passing by Tenerife, they arrived at Gran Canaria on Saturday, August 25th, and found that Pinzon had only got in there the day before. From him, the admiral was informed that Doña Beatrix had sailed for Gomera on the 20th with the vessel, which he was so anxious to obtain. His officers were much troubled at the disappointment, but he, who always endeavored to make the best of every occurrence, 
observed to them that, since it had not pleased God that they should get this vessel, it was perhaps better for them, as they might have encountered much opposition in pressing it into the service, and might have lost a great deal of time in shipping and unshipping the goods. Wherefore, lest he might again miss it if he returned to Gomera, he resolved to make a new rudder for the Pinta at Gran Canaria, and ordered the square sails of the Nina to be changed to round ones, like those of the other two vessels, that she might be able to accompany them with less danger and agitation. The vessels being all refitted, the admiral weighed anchor from Gran Canaria on Saturday, September 1st, and arrived next day at Gomera, where four days were employed in completing their stores of provisions and of wood and water. On the morning of Thursday, September 6, 1492, the admiral took his departure from Gomera and commenced his great undertaking by standing directly westward, but made very slow progress at first on account of calms. On Sunday, September 9th, about daybreak, they were nine leagues west of the island of Ferro. Now, losing sight of land and stretching out into utterly unknown seas, many of the people expressed their anxiety and fear that it might be long before they should see land again. But the admiral used every endeavor to comfort them with the assurance of soon finding the land he was in search of, and raised their hopes of acquiring wealth and honor by the discovery. To lessen the fear which they entertained of the length of way they had to sail, he gave out that they had only proceeded fifteen leagues that day, when the actual distance sailed was eighteen, and to induce the people to believe that they were not so far from Spain as they really were, he resolved to keep considerably short in his reckoning during the whole voyage, though he carefully recorded the true reckoning every day in private. On Wednesday, September 12th, having got to about 150 leagues west of Ferro, they discovered a large trunk of a tree, sufficient to have been the mast of a vessel of 120 tons, and which seemed to have been a long time in the water. At this distance from Ferro, and for somewhat farther on, the current was found to set strongly to the northeast. Next day, when they had run fifty leagues farther westward, the needle was observed to vary half a point to the eastward of north, and next morning the variation was a whole point east. This variation of the compass had never been before observed, and therefore the admiral was much surprised at the phenomenon, and concluded that the needle did not actually point toward the polar star, but to some other fixed point. Three days afterward, when almost one hundred leagues farther west, he was still more astonished at the irregularity of the variation, for having observed the needle to vary a whole point to the eastward at night, it pointed directly northward in the morning. On the night of Saturday, September 15th, being then almost three hundred leagues west of Ferro, they saw a prodigious flash of light or fireball drop from the sky into the sea at four or five leagues distance from the ships toward the southwest. The weather was then quite fair and serene like April, the sea perfectly calm, the wind favorable from the northeast, and the current setting to the northeast. The people in the Nina told the admiral that they had seen the day before a heron and another bird which they called rabo de junco these were the first birds which had been seen during the voyage and were considered as indications of approaching land but they were more agreeably surprised next day sunday september sixteenth by seeing great abundance of yellowish green seaweeds which appeared as if newly washed away from some rock or island Next day the seaweed was seen in much greater quantity, and a small live lobster was observed among the weeds. From this circumstance, many affirmed that they were certainly near the land. The sea water was afterward noticed to be only half so salt as before, 
and great numbers of tunny fish were seen swimming about, some of which came so near the vessel that one was killed by a bearded iron. Being now 360 leagues west from Ferro, another of the birds, called Rabo de Junco, was seen. On Tuesday, September 18th, Martin Alonso Pinzon, who had gone ahead of the admiral in the Pinta, which was an excellent sailor, lay to for the admiral to come up, and told him that he had seen a great number of birds fly away westward, for which reason he was in great hopes to see land that night. Pinzon even thought that he saw land that night about fifteen leagues distant to the northward, which appeared very black and covered with clouds. All the people would have persuaded the admiral to try for land in that direction, but, being certainly assured that it was not land, and having not yet reached the distance at which he expected to find the land, he would not consent to lose time in altering his course in that direction. But as the wind now freshened, he gave orders to take in the topsails at night, having now sailed eleven days before the wind, due westward with all their sails up. All the people in the squadron being utterly unacquainted with the seas they now traversed, fearful of their danger at such unusual distance from any relief, and, seeing nothing around but sky and water, began to mutter among themselves and anxiously observed every appearance. On September 19th, a kind of seagull called Alcatraz flew over the admiral's ship, and several others were seen in the afternoon of that day, and as the admiral conceived that these birds would not fly far from land, he entertained hopes of soon seeing what he was in quest of. He therefore ordered a line of two hundred fathoms to be tried, but without finding any bottom. The current was now found to set to the southwest. On Thursday, September 20th, two Alcatraces came near the ship about two hours before noon, and soon afterward a third. On this day, likewise, they took a bird resembling a heron, of a black color with a white tuft on its head, and having webbed feet like a duck. Abundance of weeds were seen floating in the sea, and one small fish was taken. About evening, three land birds settled on the rigging of the ship and began to sing. These flew away at daybreak, which was considered a strong indication of approaching the land, as these little birds could not have come from any far distant country, whereas the other large fowls, being used to water, might much better go far from land. The same day an alcatraz was seen. Friday, the 21st, another Alcatraz and Rabo de Junco were seen, and vast quantities of weeds as far as the eye could carry toward the north. These appearances were sometimes a comfort to the people, giving them hopes of nearing the wished-for land, while at other times the weeds were so thick as in some measure to impede the progress of the vessels, and to occasion terror lest what is fabulously reported of Santa Maro in the frozen sea might happen to them, that they might be so enveloped in the weeds as to be unable to move backward or forward. Wherefore they steered away from those shoals of weeds as much as they could. Next day, being Saturday, September 22nd, they saw a whale and several small birds. The wind now veered to the southwest, sometimes more and sometimes less to the westward. And though this was adverse to the direction of their proposed voyage, the admiral, to comfort the people, alleged that this was a favorable circumstance, because, among other causes of fear, they had formerly said they should never have a wind to carry them back to Spain, as it had always blown from the east ever since they left Ferro. They still continued, however, to murmur, alleging that this southwest wind was by no means a settled one, and, as it never blew strong enough to swell the sea, it would not serve to carry them back again through so great an extent of sea as they had now passed over. In spite of every argument used by the admiral, 
assuring them that the alterations in the wind were occasioned by the vicinity of the land, by which likewise the waves were prevented from rising to any height, they were still dissatisfied and terrified. On Sunday, September 23rd, a brisk gale sprung up west-northwest with a rolling sea, such as the people had wished for. Three hours before noon, a turtle dove was observed to fly over the ship, toward evening an alcatraz, a river fowl, and several white birds were seen flying about, and some crabs were observed among the weeds. Next day, another alcatraz was seen, and several small birds which came from the west. Numbers of small fishes were seen swimming about, some of which were struck with harpoons, as they would not bite at the hook. The more that the tokens mentioned above were observed, and found not to be followed by the so anxiously looked-for land, the more the people became fearful of the event, and entered into cabals against the admiral, who they said was desirous to make himself a great lord at the expense of their danger. They represented that they had already sufficiently performed their duty in adventuring farther from land and all possibility of succor than had ever been done before, and that they ought not to proceed on the voyage to their manifest destruction. If they did, they would soon have reason to repent their temerity, as provisions would soon fall short, the ships were already faulty and would soon fail, and it would be extremely difficult to get back so far as they had already gone. None could condemn them in their own opinion for now turning back, but all must consider them as brave men for having gone upon such an enterprise and venturing so far. That the admiral was a foreigner who had no favor at court, and as so many wise and learned men had already condemned his opinions and enterprise as visionary and impossible, there would be none to favor or defend him, and they were sure to find more credit if they accused him of ignorance and mismanagement than he would do, whatsoever he might now say for himself against them. Some even proceeded so far as to propose, in case the admiral should refuse to acquiesce in their proposals, that they might make a short end of all disputes by throwing him overboard, after which they could give out that he had fallen over while making his observations, and no one would ever think of inquiring into the truth. They thus went on day after day, muttering, complaining, and consulting together, and though the admiral was not fully aware of the extent of their cabals, he was not entirely without apprehensions of their inconstancy in the present trying situation, and of their evil intentions toward him. He therefore exerted himself to the utmost to quiet their apprehensions and to suppress their evil design, sometimes using fair words and at other times fully resolved to expose his life rather than abandon the enterprise. He put them in mind of the due punishment they would subject themselves to if they obstructed the voyage. To confirm their hopes, he recapitulated all the favorable signs and indications which had been lately observed, assuring them that they might soon expect to see the land. But they, who were ever attentive to these tokens, thought every hour a year in their anxiety to see the wished-for land. On Tuesday, September 25th, near sunset, as the admiral was discoursing with Pinzon, whose ship was then very near, Pinzon suddenly called out, Land! Land, sir! Let not my good news miscarry! And pointed out a large mass in the southwest, about twenty-five leagues distant, which seemed very like an island. This was so pleasing to the people that they returned thanks to God for the pleasing discovery, and although the admiral was by no means satisfied of the truth of Pinzon's observation, yet to please the men, and that they might not obstruct the voyage, he altered his course and stood in that direction a great part of the night. Next morning, the 26th, 
they had the mortification to find the supposed land was only composed of clouds, which often put on the appearance of distant land. And to their great dissatisfaction, the stems of the ships were again turned directly westward, as they always were, unless when hindered by the wind. Continuing their course, and still attentively watching for signs of land, they saw this day an alcatraz, a rabo de junco, and other birds as formerly mentioned. On Thursday, September 27th, they saw another alcatraz coming from the westward and flying toward the east, and great numbers of fish were seen with gilt backs, one of which they struck with a harpoon. A rabo de junco likewise flew past. The currents, for some of the last days, were not so regular as before, but changed with the tide, and the weeds were not nearly so abundant. On Friday, the 28th, all the vessels took some of the fishes with gilt backs, and on Saturday, the 29th, they saw a rabo de junco, which, although a sea fowl, never rests on the waves, but always flies in the air, pursuing the alcatraces. Many of these birds are said to frequent the Cape de Verde Islands. They soon afterward saw two other alcatraces and great numbers of flying fishes. These last are about a span long, and have two little membranous wings like those of a bat, by means of which they fly about a pike length high from the water and a musket shot in length, and sometimes drop upon the ships. In the afternoon of this day, they saw abundance of weeds lying in length north and south, and three alcatraces pursued by a rabo de junco. On the morning of Sunday, September 30th, four rabo de juncos came to the ship, and from so many of them coming together it was thought the land could not be far distant, especially as four alcatraces followed soon afterward. Great quantities of weeds were seen in a line stretching from west-northwest to east-northeast, and a great number of the fishes, which are called emperadores, which have a very hard skin and are not fit to eat. Though the admiral paid every attention to these indications, he never neglected those in the heavens, and carefully observed the course of the stars. He was now greatly surprised to notice at this time that Charles's Wayne, or the Ursa Major constellation, appeared at night in the west, and was northeast in the morning. He thence concluded that their whole night's course was only nine hours, or so many parts in twenty-four of a great circle, and this he observed to be the case regularly every night. It was likewise noticed that the compass varied a whole point to the northwest at nightfall and came due north every morning at daybreak. As this unheard-of circumstance confounded and perplexed the pilots, who apprehended danger in these strange regions and at such unusual distance from home, the admiral endeavored to calm their fears by assigning a cause for this wonderful phenomenon. He alleged that it was occasioned by the polar star making a circuit round the pole by which they were not a little satisfied. Soon after sunrise on Monday, October 1st, an alcatraz came to the ship, and two more about ten in the morning, and long streams of weeds floated from east to west. That morning the pilot of the admiral's ship said that they were now 578 leagues west from the island of Ferro. In his public account, the admiral said they were 584 leagues to the west, but in his private journal he made the real distance 707 leagues, or 129 more than was reckoned by the pilot. The other two ships differed much in their computation from each other and from the admiral's pilot. The pilot of the Niña, in the afternoon of the Wednesday following, said they had only sailed 540 leagues, and the pilot of the Pinta reckoned 634. Thus they were all much short of the truth, but the admiral winked at the gross mistake, 
that the men, not thinking themselves so far from home, might be the less dejected. The next day, being Tuesday, October 2nd, they saw abundance of fish, caught one small tunny, and saw a white bird with many other small birds, and the weeds appeared much withered and almost fallen to powder. Next day, seeing no birds, they suspected that they had passed between some islands on both hands and had slipped through without seeing them, as they guessed that the many birds which they had seen might have been passing from one island to another. On this account they were very earnest to have the course altered one way or the other in quest of these imaginary lands. But the admiral, unwilling to lose the advantage of the fair wind which carried him due west, which he accounted his surest course, and afraid to lessen his reputation by deviating from course to course in search of land, which he always affirmed that he well knew where to find, refused his consent to any change. On this the people were again ready to mutiny, and resumed their murmurs and cabals against him. But it pleased God to aid his authority by fresh indications of land. On Thursday, October 4th, in the afternoon, above, forty sparrows together and two alcatraces flew so near the ship that a seaman killed one of them with a stone. Several other birds were seen at this time, and many flying fish fell into the ships. Next day there came a rabo de junco and an alcatraz from the westward, and many sparrows were seen. About sunrise on Sunday, October 7th, some signs of land appeared to the westward, but being imperfect, no person would mention the circumstance. This was owing to fear of losing the reward of thirty crowns yearly for life, which had been promised by their Catholic majesties to whoever should first discover land, and to prevent them from calling out, land, land, at every turn without just cause, it was made a condition that whoever said he saw land should lose the reward if it were not made out in three days, even if he should afterward actually prove the first discoverer. All on board the admiral's ship, being thus forewarned, were exceedingly careful not to cry out land on uncertain tokens, but those in the Nina which sailed better and always kept ahead believing that they certainly saw land, fired a gun, and hung out their colors in token of the discovery. But the farther they sailed, the more the joyful appearance lessened, till at last it vanished away. But they soon afterward derived much comfort by observing great flights of large fowl and others of small birds going from the west toward the southwest. Being now at a vast distance from Spain, and well assured that such small birds would not go far from land, the admiral now altered his course from due west, which had been hitherto, and steered to the southwest. He assigned as a reason for now changing his course, although deviating little from his original design, that he followed the example of the Portuguese, who had discovered most of their islands by attending to the flight of birds, and because these, they now saw, flew almost uniformly in one direction. He said, likewise, that he had always expected to discover land about the situation in which they now were, having often told them that he must not look to find land until they should get 750 leagues to the westward of the Canaries, about which distance he expected to fall in with Hispaniola, which he then called Sipango, and there is no doubt that he would have found this island by his direct course if it had not been that it was reported to extend from north to south. Owing, therefore, to his not having inclined more to the south, he had missed that and others of the Caribbee islands, whither those birds were now bending their flight, and which had been for some time upon his larboard hand. It was from being so near the land that they continually saw such great numbers of birds. And on Monday, October 8th, twelve singing birds of various colors came to the ship, and, after flying round it for a short time, held on their way. 
many other birds were seen from the ship flying toward the southwest and that same night great numbers of large fowl were seen and flocks of small birds proceeding from the northward and all going to the southwest in the morning a jay was seen with an alcatraz several ducks and many small birds all flying the same way with the others and the air was perceived to be fresh and odoriferous as it is at seville in the month of april but the people were now so eager to see land and had been so often disappointed that they ceased to give faith to these continual indications insomuch that on wednesday the tenth although abundance of birds were continually passing both by day and night they never ceased to complain the admiral upbraided their want of resolution and declared that they must persist in their endeavors to discover the indies for which he and they had been sent out by their catholic majesties it would have been impossible for the admiral to have much longer withstood the numbers which now opposed him but it pleased god that in the afternoon of thursday october eleventh such manifest tokens of being near the land appeared that the men took courage and rejoiced at their good fortune as much as they had been before distressed from the admiral's ship a green rush was seen to float past and one of those green fish which never go far from the rocks the people in the pinta saw a cane and a staff in the water and took up another staff very curiously carved and a small board and great plenty of weeds were seen which seemed to have been recently torn from the rocks those of the nina besides similar signs of land saw a branch of a thorn full of red berries which seemed to have been newly torn from the tree from all these indications the admiral was convinced that he now drew near to the land and after the evening prayers he made a speech to the men in which he reminded them of the mercy of god in having brought them so long a voyage with such favorable weather and in comforting them with so many tokens of a successful issue to their enterprise which were now every day becoming plainer and less equivocal he besought them to be exceedingly watchful during the night as they well knew that in the first article of the instructions which he had given to all the three ships before leaving the canaries they were enjoined when they should have sailed seven hundred leagues west without discovering land to lay to every night from midnight till daybreak and as he had very confident hopes of discovering land that night he required every one to keep watch at their quarters and besides the gratuity of thirty crowns a year for life which had been graciously promised by their sovereigns to him that first saw the land he engaged to give the fortunate discoverer a velvet doublet from himself after this as the admiral was in his cabin about ten o'clock at night he saw a light on shore but it was so unsteady that he could not certainly affirm that it came from land he called to one pedro gutierrez and desired him to try if he could perceive the same light who said he did but one rodrigo sanchez of segovia on being desired to look the same way could not see it because he was not up time enough as neither the admiral nor gutierrez could see it again above once or twice for a short space which made them judge it to proceed from a candle or torch belonging to some fisherman or traveller who lifted it up occasionally and lowered it again or perhaps from people going from one house to another because it appeared and vanished again so suddenly being now very much on their guard they still held on their course until about two in the morning of friday october twelfth when the pinta which was always far ahead owing to her superior sailing made the signal of seeing land which was first discovered by rodrigo de triana at about two leagues from the ship but the thirty crowns a year were afterward granted to the admiral who had seen the light in the midst of darkness a type of the spiritual light which 
he was the happy means of spreading in these dark regions of error. Being now so near land, all the ships lay to, everyone thinking it long till daylight that they might enjoy the sight they had so long and anxiously desired. When daylight appeared, the newly discovered land was perceived to consist of a flat island, fifteen leagues in length, without any hills, all covered with trees, and having a great lake in the middle. The island was inhabited by great abundance of people, who ran down to the shore filled with wonder and admiration at the sight of the ships, which they conceived to be some unknown animals. The Christians were not less curious to know what kind of people they had fallen in with, and the curiosity on both sides was soon satisfied as the ships soon came to anchor. The admiral went on shore with his boat, well armed, and having the royal standard of Castile and Leon displayed, accompanied by the commanders of the other two vessels, each in his own boat, carrying the particular colors which had been allotted for the enterprise, which were white, with a green cross, and the letter F on one side, and on the other the names of Ferdinand and Isabella crowned. The whole company kneeled on the shore, and kissed the ground for joy, returning God thanks for the great mercy they had experienced during their long voyage through seas hitherto unpassed, and their now happy discovery of an unknown land. The admiral then stood up, and took formal possession in the usual words for their Catholic majesties of this island, to which he gave the name of San Salvador. All the Christians present admitted Columbus to the authority and dignity of admiral and viceroy, pursuant to the commission which he had received to that effect, and all made oath to obey him as the legitimate representative of their Catholic majesties, with such expressions of joy and acknowledgment as became their mighty success. And they all implored his forgiveness of the many affronts he had received from them through their fears and want of confidence. Numbers of the Indians or natives of the island were present at these ceremonies, and perceiving them to be peaceable, quiet, and simple people, the admiral distributed several presents among them. To some he gave red caps, and to others strings of glass beads which they hung about their necks, and various other things of small value, which they valued as if they had been jewels of high price. After the ceremonies, the admiral went off in his boat, and the Indians followed him even to the ships, some by swimming, and others in their canoes, carrying parrots, clues of spun cotton yarn, javelins, and other such trifling articles to barter for glass beads, bells, and other things of small value. Like people in the original simplicity of nature, they were all naked, and even a woman who was among them was entirely destitute of clothing. Most of them were young, seemingly not above thirty years of age, of a good stature, with very thick black lank hair, mostly cut short above their ears, though some had it down to their shoulders, tied up with a string about their head, like women's tresses. Their countenances were mild and agreeable, and their features good, but their foreheads were too high, which gave them rather a wild appearance. They were of a middle stature, plump and well-shaped, but of an olive complexion like the inhabitants of the canaries or sunburnt peasants. Some were painted with black, others with white and others again with red. In some, the whole body was painted, in others only the face, and some only the nose and eyes. They had no weapons like those of Europe, neither had they any knowledge of such, for when our people showed them a naked sword, they ignorantly grasped it by the edge. Neither had they any knowledge of iron, as their javelins were merely constructed of wood, having their points hardened in the fire and armed with a piece of fish bone. Some of them had scars of wounds on different parts, 
and being asked by signs how these had been got they answered by signs that people from other islands came to take them away and that they had been wounded in their own defense they seemed ingenious and of a voluble tongue as they readily repeated such words as they once heard there was no kind of animals among them excepting parrots which they carried to barter with the christians among the articles already mentioned and in this trade they continued on board the ships till night when they all returned to the shore in the morning of the next day being october thirteenth many of the natives returned on board the ships in their boats or canoes which were all of one piece hollowed like a tray from the trunk of a tree some of these were so large as to contain forty or forty-five men while others were so small as only to hold one person with many intermediate sizes between these extremes these they worked along with paddles formed like a baker's peel or the implement which is used in dressing hemp these oars or paddles were not fixed by pins to the sides of the canoes like ours but were dipped into the water and pulled backward as if digging their canoes are so light and artfully constructed that if overset they soon turn them right again by swimming and they empty out the water by throwing them from side to side like a weaver's shuttle and when half emptied they ladle out the rest with dried calabashes cut in two which they carry for that purpose this second day the natives as said before brought various articles to barter for such small things as they could procure in exchange jewels or metals of any kind were not seen among them except some small plates of gold which hung from their nostrils and on being questioned from whence they procured the gold they answered by signs that they had it from the south where there was a king who possessed abundance of pieces and vessels of gold and they made our people to understand that there were many other islands and large countries to the south and southwest they were very covetous to get possession of anything which belonged to the christians and being themselves very poor with nothing of value to give in exchange as soon as they got on board if they could lay hold of anything which struck their fancy though it were only a piece of a broken glazed earthen dish or porringer they leaped with it into the sea and swam on shore with their prize if they brought anything on board they would barter it for anything whatever belonging to our people even for a piece of broken glass insomuch that some gave sixteen large clues of well-spun cotton yarn weighing twenty-five pounds for three small pieces of portuguese brass coin not worth a farthing their liberality in dealing did not proceed from their putting any great value on the things themselves which they received from our people in return but because they valued them as belonging to the christians whom they believed certainly to have come down from heaven and they therefore earnestly desired to have something from them as a memorial in this manner all this day was spent and the islanders as before went all on shore at night end of section twenty two read by linda johnson august 2021section 23 of the great events by famous historians volume 8 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by jennifer painter the great events by famous historians volume 8 edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and john rudd conspiracy rebellion and execution of perkin warbeck a d fourteen ninety two francis bacon soon after his accession to the throne of england henry the seventh married elizabeth of york daughter of edward the fourth uniting the rival houses of york and lancaster 
But notwithstanding this adjustment of the rival interests, the rule of Henry, the Lancastrian, failed to satisfy the Yorkists, and this party, with the aid of Margaret of Burgundy, sister of Edward IV, and James IV of Scotland, set up two impostors, one after the other, to claim the English throne. At the same time, there was living a real heir of the House of York, young Edward, Earl of Warwick, son of the Duke of Clarence, brother to Edward IV. Henry had taken the precaution to keep this genuine Yorkist in the tower. In 1487, a spurious Earl of Warwick appeared in Ireland. Receiving powerful support in that country, he was actually crowned in the Cathedral of Dublin. In order to defeat this imposture, Henry exhibited the real Earl to the people of London. He also vanquished the army of the Pretender at Stoke in June 1487. This false earl was found to be Lambert Simnel, son of an Oxford joiner. He became a scullion in King Henry's kitchen. The second of these impostors, known as Perkin Warbeck, contrived to make himself a figure of some importance in the history of England. Supposedly born in Flanders, he first appears upon the historic stage in 1492, when he landed at Cork. Going soon after to France, he was recognised by the court as Duke of York, according to his claim. How he was coached for his part, and how the drama in which he played it was acted out, are told by Bacon in what is perhaps the best specimen we have of that great author's style in historical composition. Warbeck was executed in 1499, and, although Bacon gives us no dates, the whole history, covering about seven years, may be said to form a practically continuous series of incidents. The character of this adventurer has been made quite prominent in literature, having been the subject of Ford's tragedy, The Chronicle History of Perkin Warbeck, 1634, of a play by Charles Macklin, King Henry VII, or The Popish Impostor, 1716, and of Joseph Elderton's drama, The Pretender, this youth, of whom we are now to speak, was such a mercurial as the like hath seldom been known, and could make his own part if at any time he chanced to be out. Wherefore, this being one of the strangest examples of a personation that ever was in elder or later times, it deserveth to be discovered and related to at the full, although the king's manner of showing things by pieces and by dark lights hath so muffled it that it hath been left almost as a mystery to this day. The Lady Margaret, whom the king's friends call Juno, because she was to him as Juno was to Aeneas, stirring both heaven and hell to do him mischief, for a foundation of her particular practices against him, did continually, by all means possible, nourish, maintain, and divulge the flying opinion that Richard, Duke of York, second son to Edward the Fourth, was not murdered in the tower, as was given out, but saved alive, for that those who were employed in that barbarous act, having destroyed the elder brother, were stricken with remorse and compassion toward the younger, and set him privily at liberty to seek his fortune. There was a townsman of Tournai that had borne office in that town, whose name was John Osbeck, a convert Jew, married to Catherine de Faro, whose business drew him to live for a time with his wife at London in King Edward's days, during which time he had a son by her, and being known in the court, the king, either out of a religious nobleness because he was a convert, or upon some private acquaintance, did him the honour to be godfather to his child, and named him Peter. But afterward, proving a dainty and effeminate youth, he was commonly called by the diminutive of his name, Peterkin or Perkin, for as for the name of Warbeck, it was given him when they did but guess at it, before examinations had been taken. But yet he had been so much talked of by that name, as it stuck by him after his true name of Osbeck was known. While he was a young child, his parents returned with him to Tournai, there he was placed in the house of a kinsman of his called John Stenbeck, 
at Antwerp, and so roved up and down between Antwerp and Tournai, and other towns of Flanders, for a good time living much in English company, and having the English tongue perfect. In which time, being grown a comely youth, he was brought by some of the espials of the Lady Margaret into her presence, who, viewing him well, and seeing that he had a face and personage that would bear a noble fortune, and finding him otherwise of a fine spirit and winning behaviour, thought she had now found a curious piece of marble to carve out an image of a Duke of York. She kept him by her a great while, but with extreme secrecy. The while she instructed him by many cabinet conferences, first in princely behaviour and gesture, teaching him how he should keep state, and yet with a modest sense of his misfortunes. Then she informed him of all the circumstances and particulars that concerned the person of Richard, Duke of York, which he was to act, describing unto him the personages, lineaments, and features of the king and queen, his pretended parents, and of his brother and sisters, and divers others that were nearest to him in his childhood, together with all passages, some secret, some common, that were fit for a child's memory until the death of King Edward. Then she added the particulars of the time from the king's death until he and his brother were committed to the tower, as well during the time he was abroad as while he was in sanctuary. As for the times while he was in the tower, and the manner of his brother's death and his own escape, she knew they were things that a very few could control, and therefore she taught him only to tell a smooth and likely tale of those matters, warning him not to vary from it. It was agreed likewise between them what account he should give of his peregrination abroad, intermixing many things which were true, and such as they knew others could testify, for the credit of the rest, but still making them to hang together with the part he was to play. She taught him likewise how to avoid sundry captious and tempting questions which were like to be asked of him. But this she found him so nimble and shifting as she trusted much to his own wit and readiness, and therefore laboured the less in it. Lastly, she raised his thoughts with some present rewards and further promises, setting before him chiefly the glory and fortune of a crown if things went well and a sure refuge to her court if the worst should fall. After such time, as she thought he was perfect in his lesson, she began to cast with herself from what coast this blazing star should first appear, and at what time it must be upon the horizon of Ireland, for there had the like meteor strong influence before, the time of the apparition to be when the king should be engaged in a war with France, but well she knew that whatsoever should come from her would be held suspected. And therefore, if he should go out of Flanders immediately into Ireland, she might be thought to have some hand in it. And besides, the time was not yet ripe, for that the two kings were then upon terms of peace. Therefore she wheeled about, and to put all suspicion afar off, and loath to keep him any longer by her, for that she knew secrets are not long lived, she sent him unknown into Portugal with the Lady Brampton, with the Lady Brampton, an English lady that embarked for Portugal at that time, with some privado of her own, to have an eye upon him, and there he was to remain, and to expect her further directions. In the meantime she omitted not to prepare things for his better welcome and accepting, not only in the Kingdom of Ireland, but in the Court of France, he continued in Portugal about a year, and by that time the King of England called his Parliament and declared open war against France. Now did the sign reign, and the constellation was come, under which Perkin should appear, and therefore he was sent straight unto by the Duchess to go for Ireland, according to the first designment. In Ireland he did arrive at the town of Cork, when he was thither come, his own tale was, when he made his confession afterward, that the Irishman, finding him in some good clothes, came flocking about him, and bare him down that he was the Duke of Clarence that had been there before, and after, that he was the base son of Richard the Third. 
and lastly that he was Richard, Duke of York, second son to Edward the Fourth. But that he, for his part, renounced all these things, and offered to swear upon the holy evangelists that he was no such man, till at last they forced it upon him, and bade him fear nothing, and so forth. But the truth is that immediately upon his coming into Ireland, he took upon him the said person of the Duke of York, and drew unto him complices and partakers by all the means he could devise. Insomuch as he wrote his letters unto the earls of Desmond and Kildare to come into his aid and be of his party, the origins of which letters are yet extant. Somewhat before this time, the Duchess had also gained unto her a near servant of King Henry's own, one Stephen Freon, his secretary for the French tongue, an active man, but turbulent and discontented. This Freon had fled over to Charles, the French king, and put himself into his service at such time as he began to be in open enmity with the king. Now King Charles, when he understood of the person and attempts of Perkin, ready of himself to embrace all advantages against the King of England, instigated by Freon, and formally prepared by the Lady Margaret, forthwith dispatched one Lucas and this Freon in the nature of ambassadors to Perkin, to advertise him of the King's good inclination to him, and that he was resolved to aid him to recover his right against King Henry, a usurper of England and an enemy of France, and wished him to come over unto him at Paris. Perkin thought himself in heaven now that he was invited by so great a king in so honourable a manner, and imparting unto his friends in Ireland, for their encouragement, how fortune called him, and what great hopes he had, sailed presently into France. When he was come to the court of France, the king received him with great honour, saluted and styled him by the name of the Duke of York, lodged him and accommodated him in great state, and the better to give him the representation and the countenance of a prince, assigned him a guard for his person, whereof Lord Congressal was captain. The courtiers likewise, though it be ill mocking with the French, applied themselves to their king's bent, seeing there was reason of state for it. At the same time there appeared unto Perkin divers Englishmen of quality, Sir George Neville, Sir John Taylor, and about one hundred more, and among the rest this Stephen Freon, of whom we spake, who followed his fortune both then and for a long time after, and was, indeed, his principal counsellor and instrument in all his proceedings. But all this on the French king's part was but a trick, the better to bow King Henry to peace. And therefore, upon the first grain of incense that was sacrificed upon the altar of peace at Boulogne, Perkin was smoked away. Yet would not the French king deliver him up to King Henry, as he was laboured to do, for his honour's sake, but warned him away and dismissed him. And Perkin, on his part, was ready to be gone, doubting he might be caught up underhand. He therefore took his way into Flanders, unto the Duchess of Burgundy, pretending that, having been variously tossed by fortune, he directed his course thither as to a safe harbour, no ways taking knowledge that he had ever been there before, but as if that had been his first address. The Duchess, on the other part, made it as new strange to see him, pretending, at the first, that she was taught and made wise by the example of Lambert Simnel, how she did admit of any counterfeit stuff, though, even in that, she said she was not fully satisfied. She pretended at the first, and that was ever in the presence of others, to pose him and sift him, thereby to try whether he were indeed the very Duke of York or no. But, seeming to receive full satisfaction by his answers, she then feigned herself to be transported with a kind of astonishment, mixed of joy and wonder, at his miraculous deliverance, receiving him as if he were risen from death to life, and inferring that God, who had in such wonderful manner preserved him from death, did likewise reserve him for some great and prosperous fortune. As for his dismission out of France, they interpreted it 
not as if he were detected or neglected for a counterfeit deceiver, but contrariwise, that it did show manifestly unto the world that he was some great matter, for that it was his abandoning that, in effect, made the peace, being no more but the sacrificing of a poor distressed prince unto the utility and ambition of two mighty monarchs. Neither was Perkin, for his part, wanting to himself, either in gracious or princely behaviour, or in ready or apposite answers, or in contenting and caressing those that did apply themselves unto him, or in petty scorn and disdain to those that seemed to doubt of him. But in all things did notably acquit himself, insomuch as it was generally believed, as well among great persons as among the vulgar, that he was indeed Duke Richard. Nay, himself, with long and continued counterfeiting, and with oft telling a lie, was turned by habit almost into the thing he seemed to be, and from a liar to a believer. The Duchess, therefore, as in a case out of doubt, did him all princely honour, calling him always by the name of her nephew, and giving the delicate title of the White Rose of England, and appointed him a guard of thirty persons, halberdiers, clad in a party-coloured livery of murray and blue, to attend his person. Her court likewise, and generally the Dutch and strangers, in their usage toward him, expressed no less respect. The news hereof came blazing and thundering over into England, that the Duke of York was sure alive. As for the name of Perkin Warbeck, it was not at that time come to light, but all the news ran upon the Duke of York, that he had been entertained in Ireland, bought and sold in France, and was now plainly avowed and in great honour in Flanders. These fames took hold of divers, in some upon discontent, in some upon ambition, in some upon levity and desire of change, and in some few upon conscience and belief, but in most upon simplicity, and in divers out of dependence upon some of the better sort, who did in secret favour and nourish these brewies. And it was not long ere these rumours of novelty had begotten others of scandal and murmur against the king and his government, taxing him for a great taxer of his people and discountenancer of his nobility. The loss of Britain and the peace with France were not forgotten, but chiefly they fell upon the wrong that he did his queen, in that he did not reign in her right. Wherefore they said that God had now brought to light a masculine branch of the house of York, that would not be at his courtesy, howsoever he did oppress his poor lady. And yet, as it fareth with things which are current with the multitude and which they affect, these fames grew so general that the authors were lost in the generality of the speakers, they being like running weeds that have no certain root, or like footings up and down, impossible to be traced. But after a while these ill humours drew to a head, and settled secretly in some eminent persons, which were Sir William Stanley, Lord Chamberlain of the King's Household, the Lord Fitzwater, Sir Simon Montfort, and Sir Thomas Thwaites. These entered into a secret conspiracy to favour Duke Richard's title. Nevertheless, none engaged their fortunes in this business openly, but two, Sir Robert Clifford and Master William Barley, who sailed over into Flanders, sent indeed from the party of the conspirators here to understand the truth of those things that passed there, and not without some help of monies from hence, provisionally to be delivered if they found and were satisfied that there was truth in these pretenses. The person of Sir Robert Clifford, being a gentleman of fame and family, was extremely welcome to the Lady Margaret, who, after she had conference with him, brought him to the sight of Perkin, with whom he had often speech and discourse, so that in the end, one either by the Duchess to affect or by Perkin to believe, he wrote back into England that he knew the person of Richard Duke of York as well as he knew his own, and that this young man was undoubtedly he. By this means all things grew prepared to revolt and sedition here, and the conspiracy came to have a correspondence between Flanders and England. The king, on his part, was not asleep, but to arm or levy forces yet, he thought, would but show fear, 
and do this idol too much worship. Nevertheless, the ports he did shut up, or at least kept a watch on them, that none should pass to or fro that was suspected. But for the rest, he chose to work by countermines. His purposes were two, the one to lay open the abuse, the other to break the knot of the conspirators. To detect the abuse there were but two ways. The first, to make it manifest to the world that the Duke of York was indeed murdered. The other to prove that, were he dead or alive, yet Perkin was a counterfeit. For the first, thus it stood. There were but four persons that could speak upon knowledge to the murder of the Duke of York. Sir James Tyrrell, the employed man from King Richard, John Dighton and Miles Forrest, his servants, the two butchers or tormentors, and the priest of the tower that buried them. Of which four, Miles Forrest and the priest were dead, and there remained alive only Sir James Tyrrell and John Dighton. These two the king caused to be committed to the tower and examined touching the manner of the death of the two innocent princes. They agreed both in a tale, as the king gave out, to this effect, that King Richard, having directed his warrant for the putting of them to death to Brackenbury, the lieutenant of the tower, was by him refused, whereupon the king directed his warrant to Sir James Tyrrell to receive the key of the tower from the lieutenant for the space of a night for the king's special service. That Sir James Tyrrell accordingly repaired to the tower by night, attended by his two servants aforenamed, whom he had chosen for that purpose. That himself stood at the stair-foot, and sent these two villains to execute the murder. That they smothered them in their beds, and that done, called up their master to see their naked dead bodies, which they had laid forth. That they were buried under the stairs, and some stones cast upon them. That when the report was made to King Richard that his will was done, he gave Sir James Tyrrell great thanks, but took exception to the place of their burial, being too base for them that were king's children. Whereupon another night, by the king's warrant renewed, their bodies were removed by the priest of the tower, and buried by him in some place which, by means of the priest's death soon after, could not be known. Thus much was then delivered abroad to be the effect of those examinations, but the king, nevertheless, made no use of them in any of his declarations, whereby, as it seems, those examinations left the business somewhat perplexed, and as for Sir James Tyrrell, he was soon after beheaded in the tower yard for other matters of treason. But John Dighton, who it seemeth spake best for the king, was forthwith set at liberty, and was the principal means of divulging this tradition. Therefore, this kind of proof being left so naked, the king used the more diligence in the latter for the tracing of Perkin. To this purpose he sent abroad into several parts, and especially into Flanders, divers secret and nimble scouts and spies, some feigning themselves to fly over unto Perkin, and to adhere to him, and some, under other pretense, to learn, search, and discover all the circumstances and particulars of Perkin's parents, birth, person, travels up and down, and in brief to have a journal, as it were, of his life and doings. Others he employed in a more special nature and trust, to be his pioneers in the main countermine. The King of Scotland, James IV, having espoused the cause of Warbeck, and attended him upon an invasion of England, though he would not formally retract his judgment of Perkin, wherein he had engaged himself so far, yet, in his private opinion, upon often speech with the Englishman and diverse other advertisements, began to suspect him for a counterfeit. Wherefore, in a noble fashion, he called him under him and recounted the benefits and favours that he had done him in making him his ally and in provoking a mighty and opulent king by an offensive war in his quarrel for the space of two years together, nay, more, that he had refused an honourable peace whereof he had a fair offer, if he would have delivered him, and that, to keep his promise with him, he had deeply offended both his nobles and people, whom he might not hold in any long discontent. 
and therefore required him to think of his own fortunes and to choose out some fitter place for his exile, telling him withal that he could not say but the English had forsaken him before the Scottish, for that, upon two several trials, none had declared themselves on his side. But nevertheless, he would make good what he said to him at his first receiving, which was that he should not repent him for putting himself into his hands, for that he would not cast him off, but help him with shipping and means to transport him where he should desire. Perkin, not descending at all from his stage-like greatness, answered the king in few words, that he saw his time was not yet come, but, whatsoever his fortunes were, he should both think and speak honour of the king. Taking his leave, he would not think on Flanders, doubting it was but hollow ground for him since the treaty of the Archduke, concluded the year before, but took his lady and such followers as would not leave him, and sailed over into Ireland. When Perkin heard of the late Cornwall insurrection, he began to take heart again, and advised upon it with his council, which were principally three, Hearn, a mercer that fled for debt, Skelton, a tailor, and Astley, a scrivener, for Secretary Freon was gone. These told him that he was mightily overseen, both when he went into Kent and when he went into Scotland, the one being a place so near London and under the king's nose, and the other a nation so distasted with the people of England, that if they had loved him ever so well, yet they could never have taken his part in that company. But if he had been so happy as to have been in Cornwall at the first, when the people began to take arms there, he had been crowned at Westminster before this time, for these kings, as he had now experience, would sell poor princes for shoes. But he must rely wholly upon people, and therefore advised him to sail over with all possible speed into Cornwall, which accordingly he did, having in his company four small barks with some six score or seven score fighting men. He arrived in September at Whitsand Bay, and forthwith came to Bodmin, the blacksmith's town, where they assembled under him to the number of three thousand men of the rude people. There he set forth a new proclamation stroking the people with fair promises, and humouring them with invectives against the king and his government. And as it fareth with smoke, that never loseth itself till it be at the highest, he did now before his end raise his style, entitling himself no more Richard, Duke of York, but Richard the Fourth, King of England. His council advised him by all means to make himself master of some good walled town, as well to make his men find the sweetness of rich spoils, and to allure to him all loose and lost people, by like hopes of booty, as to be a sure retreat to his forces in case they should have any ill day or unlucky chance of the field. Wherefore they took heart to them, and went on, and besieged the city of Exeter, the principal town for strength and wealth in those parts. Perkin, hearing the thunder of arms and preparations against him from so many parts, raised his siege and marched to Taunton, beginning already to squint one eye upon the crown and another upon the sanctuary. Though the Cornish men were become, like metal often fired and quenched, churlish, and that would sooner break than bow, swearing and vowing not to leave him till the uttermost drop of their blood were spilt. He was at his rising from Exeter between six and seven thousand strong, many having come unto him after he was set before Exeter upon fame of so great an enterprise, and to partake of the spoil, though upon the raising of his siege some did slip away. When he was come near Taunton he dissembled all fear, and seemed all the day to use diligence in preparing all things ready to fight. But about midnight he fled with three score horses to Bewdley in the New Forest, where he and divers of his company registered themselves sanctuary men, leaving his Cornish men to the four winds, but yet thereby easing them of their vow, and using his wonted compassion not to be by when his subject's blood should be spilt. The king, as soon as he heard of Perkin's flight, sent presently five hundred horse to pursue and apprehend him, 
before he should get either to the sea or to that same little island called a sanctuary. But they came too late for the latter of these, therefore all they could do was to beset the sanctuary and to maintain a strong watch about it till the king's pleasure were further known. Perkin, having at length given himself up, was brought into the king's court, but not to the king's presence, though the king, to satisfy his curiosity, saw him sometimes out of a window or in passage. He was in show at liberty, but guarded with all care and watch that were possible, and willed to follow the king to London. But from his first appearance upon the stage, in his new person of a sycophant or juggler, instead of his former person of a prince, all men may think how he was exposed to the derision not only of the courtiers, but also of the common people, who flocked about him as he went along, that one might know afar off where the hour was by the flight of birds, some mocking, some wondering, some cursing, some prying and picking matter out of his countenance and gesture to talk of, so that the false honour and respects which he had so long enjoyed were plentifully repaid in scorn and contempt. As soon as he was come to London, the king gave also the city the solace of this May game, for he was conveyed leisurely on horseback, but not in any ignominious fashion, through Cheapside and Cornhill to the Tower, and from thence back again unto Westminster, with the churm of a thousand taunts and reproaches. But to amend the show, there followed a little distance of Perkin, an inward counsellor of his, one that had been Sergeant Farrier to the king. This fellow, when Perkin took sanctuary, chose rather to take a holy habit than a holy place, and clad himself like a hermit, and in that weed wandered about the country till he was discovered and taken. But this man was bound hand and foot upon the horse, and came not back with Perkin, but was left at the tower, and within few days after, executed. Soon after, now that Perkin could tell better what himself was, he was diligently examined, and after his confession taken, an extract was made of such parts of it as were thought fit to be divulged, which was printed and dispersed abroad, wherein the king did himself no right, for as there was a laboured tale of particulars of Perkin's father and mother, and grandsire and grandmother, and uncles and cousins, by names and surnames, and from what places he travelled up and down, so there was little or nothing to purpose of anything concerning his designs or any practices that had been held with him, nor the Duchess of Burgundy herself, that all the world did take knowledge of, as the person that had put life and being into the whole business, so much as named or pointed at. So that men, missing of that they looked for, looked about for they knew not what, and were in more doubt than before. But the king chose rather not to satisfy than to kindle coals. It was not long but Perkin, who was made of quicksilver, which is hard to hold or imprison, began to stir. For, deceiving his keepers, he took him to his heels and made speed to the sea coasts. But presently all corners were laid for him, and such diligent pursuit and search made as he was fain to turn back and get him to the house of Bethlehem, called the Priory of Sheen, which had the privilege of sanctuary, and put himself into the hands of the prior of that monastery. The prior was thought a holy man, and much reverenced in those days. He came to the king, and besought the king for Perkin's life only, leaving him otherwise to the king's discretion. Many about the king were again more hot than ever to have the king take him forth and hang him. But the king, that had a high stomach, and could not hate any that he despised, bid, Take him forth and set the knave in the stocks. And so, promising the prior his life, he caused him to be brought forth. And within two or three days after, upon a scaffold set up in the palace court at Westminster, he was fettered and set in the stocks for the whole day and the next day after the like was done by him at the cross in Cheapside, and in both places he read his confession, of which we made mention before, and was from Cheapside conveyed and laid up in the tower. 
but it was ordained that this winding ivy of a plantagenet should kill the true tree itself for perkin after he had been a while in the town began to insinuate himself into the favour and kindness of his keepers servants of the lieutenant of the tower sir john digby being four in number strangeways blewett astwood and long roger these varlets with mountains of promises he sought to corrupt to obtain his escape but knowing well that his own fortunes were made so contemptible as he could feed no man's hopes and by hopes he must work for rewards he had none he had contrived with himself a vast and tragical plot which was to draw into his company edward plantagenet earl of warwick then prisoner in the tower whom the weary life of a long imprisonment and the often and renewing fears of being put to death had softened to take any impression of counsel for his liberty this young prince he thought these servants would look upon though not upon himself and therefore after that by some message by one or two of them he had tasted of the earl's consent it was agreed that these four should murder their master the lieutenant secretly in the night and make their best of such money and portable goods of his as they should find ready at hand and get the keys of the tower and presently let forth perkin and the earl but this conspiracy was revealed in time before it could be executed and in this again the opinion of the king's great wisdom did surcharge him with a sinister fame that perkin was but his bait to entrap the earl of warwick and in the very instant while this conspiracy was in working as if that also had been the king's industry it was fated that there should break forth a counterfeit earl of warwick a cordwainer's son whose name was ralph wilford a young man taught and set on by an augustin friar called patrick they both from the parts from suffolk came forward into kent where they did not only privily and underhand give out that this wilford was the true earl of warwick but also the friar finding some light credence in the people took the boldness in the pulpit to declare as much and to incite the people to come into his aid whereupon they were both presently apprehended and the young fellow executed and the friar condemned to perpetual imprisonment this also happening so opportunely to represent the danger to the king's estate from the earl of warwick and thereby to colour the king's severity that followed together with the madness of the friar so vainly and desperately to divulge a treason before it had gotten any manner of strength and the saving of the friar's life which nevertheless was indeed but the privilege of his order and the pity in the common people which if it run in a strong stream doth ever cast up scandal and envy made it generally rather talk than believe that all was but the king's device but howsoever it was hereupon perkin that had offended against grace now the third time was at last proceeded with and by commissioners of oyer and determiner arraigned at westminster upon divers treasons committed and perpetrated after his coming on land within this kingdom for so the judges advised for that he was a foreigner and condemned and a few days after executed at tyburn where he did again openly read his confession and take it upon his death to be true this was the end of this little cockatrice of a king that was able to destroy those that did not espy him first it was one of the longest plays of that kind that had been in memory and might perhaps have had another end if he had not met with a king wise stout and fortunate end of section twenty three Section 24 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Savonarola's Reforms and Death. The French Invade Italy 
A. D. fourteen ninety four. Pasquale Valari Jean C. L. Sismondi. Girolamo Savonarola, the great moral, political, and religious reformer of Italy, was born in Ferrara, September twenty first, fourteen fifty two. He was of noble family studied medicine, but renounced his intended profession and became a Dominican monk. In 1491, he became prior of St. Mark's, Florence. When he began to preach in the Church of St. Mark on the sins of the time, he applied to Italy the prophetic language of the Apocalypse. He predicted the restoration of the Church in Italy through severe divine visitations. His power in the pulpit was overwhelming, and the fame of his preaching was spread abroad, many regarding him as an inspired prophet. In his denunciations, he spared neither wealth nor position, laity nor clergy, and he exhorted the people to order their lives by the simple rules of Scripture. Savonarola refused to pay the customary homage of his office to the ruler of Florence, who at this time was Lorenzo de' Medici. His own office, the preacher declared, was received not from Lorenzo, but from God. Overlooking this light, Lorenzo tried by all means to win Savonarola's favor, but the reformer persisted in denouncing him. When a committee asked the preacher to desist from his denunciations and prophetic warnings, he bade them tell Lorenzo to repent of his sins, adding that, if he threatened banishment, the ruler himself would soon depart, while his censor would remain in Florence. In 1492, Lorenzo died and his son Piero succeeded him. But Savonarola now became the most powerful man in the Republic, and he exerted himself for reformation of his own monastery, the Church, and the State itself. Soon he prophesied the downfall of the Medici, against whom he arrayed a considerable part of the Florentine people. He predicted that one should come over the Alps and wreak vengeance upon the tyrants of Italy. In 1494, Charles VIII of France invaded Italy warred against Naples, and advanced on Florence. Piero de' Medici, thoroughly frightened, surrendered his strongholds and agreed to pay Charles 200,000 ducats. Of Savonarola's career from this time, and the state of Florence up to the day of his death, the two authors here selected give faithful and vivid narratives. In Romola, George Eliot portrays the character and acts of this great reformer with a legitimate intensifying, for artistic purposes, of the certified facts of history. Pasquale Villari The month of November, 1494, began under sinister auspices in Florence. The unexpected, almost incredible news of the surrender of fortresses which had cost the Republic prolonged sieges and enormous expense, and formed the key of the whole Tuscan territory, instantly raised a tumult among the people, and the general fury was increased by letters received from the French camp and the accounts of the returned envoys. For they told with what ease honorable terms might have been wrested from the king, with what a mixture of cowardice and self-assertion Piero de' Medici had placed the whole republic at the mercy of Charles the Eighth. All gave free vent to their indignation, and the people began to gather in the streets and squares. Some of the crowd were seen to be armed with old weapons, which had been hidden away for more than half a century, and from the wool and silk manufactories, strong, broad-set, dark-visaged men poured forth. On that day, it seemed as though the Florentines had leapt back a century, and that, after patient endurance of sixty years' tyranny, they were now decided to reconquer their liberty by violence and bloodshed. Nevertheless, in the midst of this general excitement, men's minds were daunted by an equally general feeling of uncertainty and distrust. It was true that the Medici had left no soldiers in Florence, and that the people could at any moment make themselves masters of the whole city, but they knew not whom to trust, nor whom to choose as their leader. The old champions of liberty had nearly all perished during the last sixty years, either at the block or in persecution and exile. The few men, at all familiar with state affairs, were those who had always basked in the favor of the Medici, and the multitude just freed from slavery would inevitably recur to license if left to themselves. This, therefore, was one of those terrible moments when no one could foretell what excesses and what atrocities might not be committed. All day the people streamed aimlessly through the streets, 
like an impetuous torrent. They cast covetous glances on the houses of the citizens who had amassed wealth by acts of oppression, but they had no one to lead them. Only at the hour of Savonarola's sermon, they all flocked instinctively to the Duomo. Never had so dense a throng been gathered within its walls. All were too closely packed to be able to move, and when at last Savonarola mounted the pulpit, he looked down upon a solid and motionless mass of upturned faces. Unusual sternness and excitement were depicted on every countenance, and he could see steel corslets flashing here and there in the cloaked crowd. The friar was now the only man having any influence over the people, who seemed to hang on his words and look for safety to him alone. One hasty word from his mouth would have sufficed to cause all the houses of the principal citizens to be sacked, to revive past scenes of civil warfare, and lead to torrents of blood. For the people had been cruelly trampled on, and were now panting for a cruel revenge. He therefore carefully abstained from all allusion to politics. His heart was overflowing with pity. He bent forward with outstretched arms from the pulpit, and, in tones which echoed throughout the building, proclaimed the law of peace and charity and union. Behold, the sword has come upon you. The prophecies are fulfilled. The scourge is begun. Behold, these hosts are led by the Lord. O Florence, the time of singing and dancing is at an end. Now is the time to shed floods of tears for thy sins. Thy sins, O Florence. Thy sins, O Rome. Thy sins, O Italy, they have brought these chastisements upon thee. Repent ye then, give alms, offer up prayers, be united. O my people, I have long been as thy father. I have labored all the days of my life to teach ye the truths of faith and of godly living. Yet I have received naught but tribulation, scorn, and contumely. Give me at least the consolation of seeing ye do good deeds. My people, what desire hath ever been mine but to see ye saved, to see ye united? Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But I have said this so many times, I have cried to thee so many times, I have wept for thee, O Florence, so many times, that it should be enough. To thee I turn, O Lord, to thee, who didst die for love of us and for our sins. Forgive, forgive, O Lord, the Florentine people that would fain be thy people. In this strain he continued to exhort his hearers to charity, faith, and concord with such succeeding earnestness and fervor that he was exhausted and almost ill for several days after. These sermons were less eloquent than some of the others, since he was too deeply moved for reflection or for studied effects, but the tenderness with which he spoke dominated and soothed the people, who, fresh from the tumults without, entered this place of peace to hear the words of the gospel. So magical was the power of Savonarola's voice in those days that, in all this great stir of public excitement, not a single excess was committed, and the revolution that seemed on the point of being affected by violence on the piazza was quietly and peacefully accomplished within the walls of the palace. And this miracle, unprecedented in Florentine history, is unanimously attributed by the historians of the time to Savonarola's beneficial ascendancy over the minds of the people. On November 4th, the Seigneury called a special meeting of the Council of Seventy, in order to decide what course to adopt. All the members were adherents and nominees of the Medici, but were so enraged by the cowardly surrender of the fortresses that they already had the air of a Republican assembly. According to the old Florentine law and custom, no one was allowed to speak unless invited to do so by the seigneury, and was then only expected to support the measures which they had proposed. But in moments of public excitement, neither this nor any other law was observed in Florence. On this day, there was great agitation in the council. The safety of the country was at stake. The seigneury asked everyone for advice, and all wished to speak. Yet so much were men's minds daunted by the long habit of slavery that when Messer Luca Corsini broke through the old rule and, rising to his feet uninvited, began to remark that things were going badly, the city falling into a state of anarchy, and that some strong remedy was required, everyone felt amazed. Some of his colleagues began to murmur, others to cough, and at last he began to falter and became so confused that he could not go on with his speech. 
However, the debate was soon reopened by Jacopo di Tenai de Nerli, a youth of considerable spirit who warmly seconded Corsini's words. But he, too, presently began to hesitate, and his father, rising in great confusion, sought to excuse him in the eyes of the assembly by saying that he was young and foolish. Lastly, Piero di Gino Caponi rose to his feet, with his finely proportioned form, white hair, fiery glance, and a certain air of buoyant courage like that of a warhorse at sound of trumpet. He attracted universal attention and reduced all to silence. He was known to be a man of few but resolute words, and of still more resolute deeds. He now spoke plainly and said, Piero de' Medici is no longer fit to rule the state. The Republic must provide for itself. The moment has come to shake off this baby government. Let ambassadors be sent to King Charles, and, should they meet Piero by the way, let them pass him without salutation, and let them explain that he has caused all the evil, and that the city is well disposed to the French. Let honorable men be chosen to give a fitting welcome to the king, but, at the same time, let all the captains and soldiery be summoned in from the country and hidden away in cloisters and other secret places. And besides the soldiery, let all men be prepared to fight in case of need, so that when we shall have done our best to act honestly towards this most Christian monarch, and to satisfy with money the avarice of the French, we may be ready to face him and show our teeth if he should try us beyond our patience, either by word or deed. And above all, he said in conclusion, it must not be forgotten to send Father Guillermo Savonarola as one of the ambassadors for he has gained the entire love of the people. He might have added, because he has the entire respect of the king, for Charles had conceived an almost religious veneration for the man who had so long foretold his coming, and declared it to be ordained by the Lord. The new ambassadors were elected on November 5th, and consisted of Pandolfo Rochelai, Giovanni Cavalcanti, Piero Caponi, Tenai de Nerli, and Savonarola. The latter allowed the others to precede him to Lucca, where they hoped to meet the king, while he followed on foot according to his usual custom, accompanied by two of his brethren. But, before starting, he again addressed the people, and preached a sermon ending with these words, The Lord hath granted thy prayers, and wrought a great revolution by peaceful means. He alone came to rescue the city when it was forsaken of all. Wait, and thou shalt see the disasters which will happen elsewhere. Therefore be steadfast in good works, O people of Florence, be steadfast in peace. If thou wouldst have the Lord steadfast in mercy, be thou merciful toward thy brethren, thy friends, and thy enemies. Otherwise thou too shalt be smitten by the scourges prepared for the rest of Italy. Misericordium volo, crieth the Lord unto ye. Woe to him that obeyeth not his commands. After delivering this discourse, he started for Pisa, where the other ambassadors, and also the king, speedily arrived. Meanwhile, disturbances went on increasing, and the populace seemed already intoxicated with license. The dwellings of Giovanni Guidi, notary and chancellor of the Riformagioni, and of Antonio Miniati, manager of the Monte, were put to the sack, for both these men, having been faithful tools of the Medici, and their subtle counselors in the art of burdening the people with insupportable taxes were objects of general hatred. The house of Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici was also pillaged, together with the garden by St. Mark's, in which so many treasures of art had been collected by Lorenzo. So far, with the exception of a few dagger thrusts, no blood had been shed, but many were eager for conflict, and it would have certainly begun had not Savonarola's partisans done their best to keep the peace and had not the friar been hourly expected from Pisa, whither he had repaired on the thirteenth day of the month with a second embassy. The signori also endeavored to quell the disturbances by means of edicts of the severest kind. But the popular discontent was now heightened by the arrival of other envoys from Pisa with very unsatisfactory tidings. They had informed the king that Florence was friendly to him, and already preparing to welcome him with all the honors due to his royalty. They only asked that, being received as a friend, he should bear himself in that light, and deign to name his terms at once, so that free vent might be given to the public joy. But the only reply Charles condescended to give 
was that, once in the great town, all should be arranged. And it was evident from His Majesty's coldness that the solicitations of Piero de' Medici, his earnest prayers, lavish promises of money, and submissive obedience had turned him not in his favor. Consequently, the ambassadors had to leave without any definite answer, and could only say that the monarch was by no means well disposed to the Republic. But when the foiled envoys had left Pisa, Savonarola repaired to the French camp, and, passing through that great host of armed men, made his way to the king's presence. Charles, who was surrounded by his generals, received him very kindly, and thereupon, without wasting much time in preliminaries, the friar, in sonorous and almost commanding accents, addressed him with a short exhortation beginning as follows. O most Christian king, thou art an instrument in the hand of the Lord, who sendeth thee to relieve the woes of Italy, as for many years I have foretold. And he sendeth thee to reform the church, which now lieth prostrate in the dust. But if thou be not just and merciful, if thou shouldst fail to respect the city of Florence, its women, its citizens, and its liberty, if thou shouldst forget the task the Lord hath sent thee to perform, then will he choose another to fulfill it. His hand shall smite thee, and chastise thee with terrible scourges. These things say I unto you in the name of the Lord. The king and his general seemed much impressed by Savonarola's menacing words, and to have full belief in them. In fact, it was the general feeling of the French that they were divinely guided to fulfill the Lord's work, and Charles felt a strong veneration for the man who had prophesied his coming, and foretold the success of his expedition. Consequently, the friar's exhortation inspired him with real terror, and also decided him to behave more honorably to the Florentines. Thus, when Savonarola returned to the city shortly after the other ambassadors, he was the bearer of more satisfactory intelligence. As the king's intentions were still unknown, fresh relays of ambassadors were sent out to him. But meanwhile, French officers and men passed the gates in little bands of fifteen or so at a time, and were seen roving about the town unarmed, jaunty and gallant, bearing pieces of chalk in their hands to mark the houses on which their troops were to be billeted. While affecting an air of contemptuous indifference, they were unable to hide their amazement at the sight of so many splendid buildings, and at every turn were confounded by the novel scenes presented to their gaze. But what struck them most of all was the grim severity of the palaces, which appeared to be impregnable strongholds, and the towns still scarred with the marks of fierce and sanguinary faction fights. Then, on November 15th, they witnessed a sight that sent a thrill of fear to their souls. Whether by accident or design, a rumor suddenly spread through the town that Piero de' Medici was nearing the gates. Instantly, the bell of the seigneury clanged the alarm. The streets swarmed with a furious mob. Armed men sprang, as by magic, from the earth and rushed toward the piazza. Palace doors were barred. Towers bristled with defenders. Stockades began to be built across the streets. And on that day, the French took their first lesson in the art of barricades. It was soon ascertained that the rumor was false, and the tumult subsided as quickly as it had risen. But the foreign soldiers were forced to acknowledge that their tactics and stout battalions would be almost powerless, hemmed in those streets against this new and unknown mode of warfare. In fact, the Florentines looked on the Frenchmen with a certain pert assurance, as if they would say, we shall see. For having now regained its liberty, this people thought itself master of the world and almost believed that there was nothing left for it to fear. Meanwhile, splendid preparations were being made in the Medici Palace for the reception of King Charles. His officers were to be lodged in the houses of the principal citizens, and the streets through which he was to pass were covered with awnings and draped with hangings and tapestries. On November 17th, the seigneury assembled on a platform erected by the San Frediano Gate and numbers of young Florentine nobles went forth to meet the king, who made his state entry at the twenty-first hour of the day. The members of the seigneury then rose and advanced toward him to pay their respects, while Messer Luca Corsini, being deputed to that office, stood forth to read a written address. But just at that moment, rain began to fall, the horses grew restless and hustled against one another, and the whole ceremony was thrown into confusion. Only Messer Francesco Gaddi 
one of the officers of the palace, had sufficient presence of mind to press his way through the throng and make a short speech, suited to the occasion in French, after which the king moved forward under a rich canopy. The monarch's appearance was in strange contrast with that of the numerous and powerful army behind him. He seemed almost a monster with his enormous head, long nose, wide gaping mouth, big white purblind eyes, very diminutive body, extraordinarily thin legs, and misshapen feet. He was clad in black velvet and a mantle of gold brocade, bestrode a tall and very beautiful charger, and entered the city riding with his lance leveled, a martial attitude then considered as a sign of conquest. All this rendered the meanness of his person the more grotesquely conspicuous. By his side rode the haughty cardinal of St. Piero in Vincoli, the cardinal of St. Malo, and a few marshals. At their heels came the royal bodyguard of one hundred bowmen, composed of the finest young men in France, and then two hundred French knights marching on foot with splendid dresses and equipment. These were followed by the Swiss vanguard, resplendent and party-colored, bearing halberds of burnished steel, and with rich waving plumes on their officers' helmets. The faces of these men expressed the mountaineer spirit of daring and the proud consciousness of being the first infantry in Europe while the greater part of them had scornfully thrown aside the cuirass, preferring to fight with their chests bared. The center consisted of Gascon infantry, small, light, agile men, whose numbers seemed to multiply as the army advanced. But the grandest sight was the cavalry, comprising the flower of the French aristocracy and displaying finely wrought weapons, mantles of gorgeous brocade, velvet banders embroidered with gold, chains of gold, and other precious ornaments. The cuirassiers had a terrible aspect, for their horses seemed like monsters with their crop tails and ears. The archers were men of extraordinary height, armed with very long wooden bows. They came from Scotland and other northern countries, and, in the words of a contemporary historian, seemed to be beast-like men. Paravano uomini bestiali. This well-ordered and disciplined army, composed of so many different nationalities, with such varied attire and strange weapons, was as new and amazing a sight to Florence as to almost all Italy, where no standing armies were as yet in existence, and mercenaries the only soldiery known. It is impossible to give the number of the forces accompanying the king to Florence, for his artillery were marching toward Rome by another route. He had left garrisons in many strongholds, and sent on another body of men by Romagna. Gaudi, who witnessed the entrance of the French, says that their numbers amounted to 12,000. Runicini, who was also present, estimated them at a lower figure, others at a higher. In any case, the city and suburbs were crammed with them. The procession marched over the Ponte Vecchio, Old Bridge, which was gay with festive decorations and sounds of music wound around the piazza amid a crowd of triumphal cars, statues, etc., and, passing the Canto dei Pazzi, made the tour of the cathedral square and halted before the great door of the church. The people shouted the name of France with cries of applause, but the king only smiled inanely and stammered some inappropriate words in Italian. Entering the Duomo, he was met by the signory, who, to avoid the pressure of the armed host, had been obliged to come around by the back streets. After joining in prayers with their royal guest, they escorted him to the sumptuous palace of the Medici, and the soldiers dispersed to their quarters. That night and the next, the whole city was a blaze of illuminations. The intervening day was devoted to feasting and amusements, and then the terms of the treaty began to be discussed. The terms of the treaty stood as follows that there should be a good and faithful friendship between the Republic and the King, that their subjects should have reciprocal protection, that the King should receive the title of Restorer and Protector of the Liberty of Florence, that he should be paid 120,000 florins in three installments, that he was not to retain the fortresses for more than two years, and if the Neapolitan expedition finished before that date, he was then to give them up without delay, that the Pisans were to receive pardon as soon as they should resume their allegiance to Florence. 
It was also stipulated that the decree putting a price on the heads of the Medici should be revoked, but that the states of Giuliano and Cardinal Giovanni were to remain confiscated until all Piero's debts had been paid, and that the said Piero was to remain banished to a distance of two hundred miles and his brothers of one hundred from the Tuscan border. After the agreement had been drawn up in regular official form, the contracting parties met in the Duomo to swear to the observance of all its clauses, and in the evening there was a general illumination of the city, although the people gave no signs of their previous goodwill towards the king. But no sooner was one difficulty disposed of than another arose. When all was concluded, Charles relapsed into his normal state of inertia and showed no disposition to depart. The city was thronged by the French quartered in the houses and the Italian soldiery hidden on all sides. The shops were shut up and all traffic suspended. Everything was in a state of uncertainty and disorder, and the continual quarrels between the natives and the foreigner might at any moment provoke the most serious complications. There were perpetual robberies and murders by night, a most unusual state of things for Florence, and the people seemed to be on the verge of revolt at the least provocation. Thus matters went on from day to day, and consequently all honest citizens vainly did their utmost to hasten the king's departure, and the universal suspense was heightened by the impossibility of finding any way of forcing him to a decision. At last another appeal was made to Savonarola, who was exerting all his influence to keep the people quiet, and whose peaceful admonitions during this period of danger and confusion had been no less efficacious than the heroic defiance of Piero Capone. The friar's sermons at this time were always directed to the general welfare. He exhorted the citizens to lay aside their animosities and ambitions, to attend the councils at the palace in a righteous spirit, and with a view not to their personal interests but to the general good, and with the firm resolve to promote the unity and concord of their city. Then, indeed, would they be acceptable in the Lord's sight. He addressed himself to every class of the people in turn, proving to all that it would be to their own advantage, both in this life and the next, to labor for the defense of liberty and the establishment of unity and concord. When asked to seek the king and endeavor to persuade him to leave, he cheerfully undertook the task and hastened to the royal abode. The officers and lords and attendants were at first inclined to refuse him admittance, fearing that his visit might defeat their plan of pillaging the treasures of this sumptuous palace. But remembering the veneration in which the friar was held by the king, they dared not refuse his demand and allowed him to pass. Charles, surrounded by his barons, received him very graciously, and Savonarola went straight to the point by saying, Most Christian prince, thy stay here is causing great injury both to our own city and thy enterprise. Thou losest time, forgetful of the duty imposed on thee by providence, and to the serious hurt of thy spiritual welfare and worldly fame. Hearken now to the voice of God's servant. Pursue thy journey without delay. Seek not to bring ruin on the city, and thereby rouse the anger of the Lord against thee. So at last, on November 28th, at the twenty-second hour of the day, the king departed with his army, leaving the people of Florence very badly disposed toward him. Among their many just causes of complaint was the sack of the splendid palace in which he had been so liberally and trustfully entertained. Nor were common soldiers and inferior officers alone concerned in this robbery. The hands of generals and barons were equally busy, and the king himself carried off objects of the greatest value, among other things a precious intaglio representing a unicorn, estimated by Cumanis to be worth about 7,000 ducats. With such an example set by their sovereign, it may be easily imagined how the others behaved, and Cumanis himself tells us, that they shamelessly took possession of everything that tempted their greed. Thus the rich and marvelous collections formed by the Medici were all lost, excepting what had been placed in safety at St. Mark's, for the few things left behind by the French were so much damaged that they had to be sold. Nevertheless, the inhabitants were so rejoiced to be finally rid of their dangerous guests that no one mourned over these thefts. On the contrary, public thanksgivings were offered up in the churches, and the people went about the streets with their old gaiety and lightheartedness, and the authorities began to take measures to provide for the urgent necessities of the new republic. 
During this interval, the aspect of Florentine affairs had entirely changed. The partisans of the Medici had disappeared from the city as if by magic. The popular party ruled over everything, and Savonarola ruled the will of the whole population. He was unanimously declared to have been a prophet of all that had occurred. The only man that had succeeded in controlling the king's conduct on his entry into Florence, the only man who had induced him to depart, accordingly all hung on Savonarola's lips for counsel, aid, and direction as to their future proceedings. And, as though the men of the old state saw the need of effacing themselves to make way for new blood, several prominent representatives and friends of the Medici house died during this period. Angelo Poliziano had passed away this year on September 24th, loaded with as much infamy and public opprobrium as a man could well bear. He was accused of numberless vices and unlimited profligacy, but the chief cause of all the hatred lavished on him was the general detestation already felt for Piero de' Medici, the approach of his downfall and that of all his adherents. Nor was the public rancor at all softened by the knowledge that the last utterances of the illustrious poet and learned scholar had been the words of a penitent Christian. He had requested that his body should be clothed in the Dominican habit and interred in the church of St. Mark, and there his ashes repose beside the remains of Giovanni Piccadella Mirandola, who expired on the very day of Charles the Eighth's entry into Florence. Pico had long entertained a desire to join the fraternity of St. Mark's, but delaying too long to carry out his intent, was surprised by death at the early age of thirty-two years. On his deathbed, he, too, had besought Savonarola to allow him to be buried in the robe he had yearned to wear. The end of these two celebrated Italians recalled to mind the last hours and last confession of Lorenzo the Magnificent, and was by many regarded as a sign that the Medicin adherents had been unwilling to pass away without acknowledging their crimes, without asking pardon from the people whom they had so deeply oppressed, and from the friar, who was, as it were, the people's best representative. It was certainly remarkable that all these men should turn to the convent of St. Mark, whence had issued the first cry of liberty and the first sign of war against the tyranny of the Medici. End of section 24. Read by Marianne Barrier, Raleigh, North Carolina, April 26, 2022. Section 25 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Savonarola's Reforms and Death the French Invade Italy, A.D. 1494, by Jean C. L. Sismondi. At the moment that Florence expelled the Medici, the Republic was divided among three different parties. The first was that of the enthusiasts, directed by Girolamo Savonarola, who promised the miraculous protection of the divinity for the reform of the church and establishment of liberty. These demanded a democratic constitution. They were called the Pianoni. The second consisted of men who had shared power with the Medici, but who had separated from them who wished to possess alone the powers and profits of government, and who endeavoured to amuse the people by dissipations and pleasures in order to establish at their ease an aristocracy. These were called the Arabiati. The third party was composed of men who remained faithful to the Medici, but, not daring to declare themselves, lived in retirement. They were called Biji. These three parties were so equally balanced in the Balia, named by the Parliament, on December the 2nd, 1494, that it soon became impossible to carry on the government. Girolamo Savonarola took advantage of this state of affairs to urge that the people had never delegated their power to a Balia, which did not abuse the trust. The people, he said, 
would do much better to reserve this power to themselves and exercise it by a council into which all the citizens could be admitted his proposition was agreed to more than one thousand eight hundred florentines furnished proof that either they their fathers or their grandfathers had sat in the magistracy they were consequently acknowledged citizens and admitted to sit in the general council this council was declared sovereign on july the first fourteen ninety five it was invested with the election of magistrates hitherto chosen by lot and a general amnesty was proclaimed to bury in oblivion all the ancient dissensions of the florentine republic so important a modification of the constitution seemed to promise this republic a happier futurity the friar savonarola who had exercised such influence in the council evinced at the same time an ardent love of mankind deep respect for the rights of all great sensibility and an elevated mind though a zealous reformer of the church and in this respect a precursor of luther who was destined to begin his mission twenty years later he did not quit the pale of orthodoxy he did not assume the right of examining doctrine he limited his efforts to the restoration of discipline the reformation of the morals of the clergy and the recall of priests as well as other citizens to practise the gospel precepts but his zeal was mixed with enthusiasm he believed himself to be under the immediate inspiration of providence he took his own impulses for prophetic revelations by which he directed the politics of his disciples the piagnoni he had predicted to the florentines the coming of the french into italy he had represented to them charles the eighth as an instrument by which the divinity designed to chastise the crimes of the nation he had counselled them to remain faithful to their alliance with that king the instrument of providence even though his conduct especially in reference to the affairs of pisa had been highly culpable this alliance however ranged the florentines among the enemies of pope alexander the sixth one of the founders of the league which had driven the french out of italy he accused them of being traitors to the church and to their country for their attachment to a foreign prince alexander equally offended by the projects of reform and by the politics of savonarola denounced him to the church as a heretic and interdicted him from preaching the monk at first obeyed and procured the appointment of his friend and disciple the dominican friar bonvicino of pescia as his successor in the church of st mark but on christmas day fourteen ninety seven he declared from the pulpit that god had revealed to him that he ought not to submit to a corrupt tribunal he then openly took the sacrament with the monks of st mark and afterwards continued to preach in the course of his sermons he more than once held up to reprobation the scandalous conduct of the pope whom the public voice accused of every vice and every crime to be expected of a libertine so depraved a man so ambitious perfidious and cruel a monarch and a priest intoxicated with absolute power in the meantime the rivalry encouraged by the court of rome between the religious orders soon procured the pope a champion eager to combat savonarola he was a dominican the general of the augustines that order whence martin luther was soon to issue friar mariano de ginezano signalized himself by his zeal in opposing savonarola he presented to the pope friar francis of apulia of the order of minor observantines who was sent to florence to preach against the florentine monks in the church of santa croce this preacher declared to his audience that he knew savonarola pretended to support his doctrine by a miracle for me he said i am a sinner i have not the presumption to perform miracles nevertheless let a fire be lighted and i am ready to enter it with him i am certain of perishing but christian charity teaches me not to withhold my life if in sacrificing it i might precipitate into hell a heresiarch who has already drawn into it so many souls 
this strange proposition was rejected by savonarola but his friend and disciple friar dominic bonvincio eagerly accepted it francis of apulia declared that he would risk his life against savonarola only meanwhile a crowd of monks of the dominican and franciscan orders rivalled each other in their offers to prove by the ordeal of fire on one side the truth on the other the falsehood of the new doctrine enthusiasm spread among the two convents many priests and seculars and even women and children more especially on the side of savonarola earnestly requested to be admitted to the proof the pope warmly testified his gratitude to the franciscans for their devotion the seigneury of florence consented that two monks only should devote themselves for their respective orders and directed the pile to be prepared the whole population of the town and country to which a signal miracle was promised received the announcement with transports of joy on april the seventeenth fourteen ninety eight a scaffold dreadful to look on was erected in the public square of florence two piles of large pieces of wood mixed with faggots and broom which should quickly take fire extended each eighty feet long four feet thick and five feet high they were separated by a narrow passage of two feet to serve as a passage by which the two priests were to enter and pass the whole length of the piles during the fire every window was full every roof was covered with spectators almost the whole population of the republic was collected round the place the portico called the loggia di lanzi divided in two by a partition was assigned to the two orders of monks the dominicans arrived at their station chanting canticles and bearing the holy sacrament the franciscans immediately declared that they would not permit the host to be carried amid flames they insisted that the friar bonvencino should enter the fire as their own champion was prepared to do without this divine safeguard the dominicans answered that they would not separate themselves from their god at the moment when they implored his aid the dispute upon this point grew warm several hours passed away the multitude which had waited long and began to feel hunger and thirst lost patience a deluge of rain suddenly fell upon the city and descended in torrents from the roofs of the houses all present were drenched the piles were so wet that they could no longer be lighted the crowd disappointed of a miracle so impatiently looked for separated with the notion of having been unworthily trifled with savonarola lost all his credit he was henceforth rather looked on as an impostor next day his convent was besieged by the arabiati eager to profit from the inconstancy of the multitude he was arrested with his two friends domenico bombencino and silvestro maruffi and led to prison the pianoni his partisans were exposed to every outrage from the populace two of them were killed their rivals and old enemies exciting the general ferment for their destruction even in the seigneury the majority was against them and yielded to the pressing demands of the pope the three imprisoned monks were subjected to a criminal prosecution alexander the sixth dispatched judges from rome with orders to condemn the accused to death conformably with the laws of the church the trial opened with the torture savonarola was too weak and nervous to support it he vowed in his agony all that was imputed to him and with his two disciples was condemned to death the three monks were burned alive may twenty third fourteen ninety eight in the same square where six weeks before a pile had been raised to prepare them a triumph End of section 25. Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 26 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8, 
edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Discovery of the Mainland of North America by the Cabots, A.D. 1497, by Samuel Edward Dawson. Newfoundland prides itself on being the oldest colony of the English crown. By virtue of John Cabot's discovery, in A.D. 1497, she also claims the honor of being the first portion of the New World continent to be discovered and made known by Europeans. This was fourteen months before Columbus, on his third expedition, beheld the American mainland. At the close of the fifteenth century, the impelling motive of discovery among the Old World nations and their adventurous mariners was the hope of finding a short western passage to the riches of the East Indies. This was the chief lure of the period, added to the ambition of Old World monarchs to extend their territorial possessions and bring them within the embrace of their individual flags. Henry the Seventh of England aided the Cabots, father and son, to fit out two expeditions from Bristol to explore the coasts of the New World and extend the search for hitherto unknown countries. The result of these enterprises was the discovery of Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as other lands, and England's claim to the possession of the greater portion of North American continent. Probably no question in the history of this continent has been the subject of so much discussion as the lives and voyages of the two Cabots, their personal character, their nationality, the number of voyages they made, and the extent and direction of their discoveries have been, and still are, keenly disputed over. The share, moreover, of each in the credit due for the discoveries made is a very battleground for historians. Some learned writers attribute everything to John Cabot. Others would put him aside and award all the credit to his second son, Sebastian. The dates, even, of the voyages are disputed, and very learned professors of history in Portugal do not hesitate to declare that the voyages are apocryphal, the discoveries pretended, and the whole question a mystification. Nevertheless, solely upon the discoveries of the Cabots have been rested the original claim of the English race to a foothold upon the continent. In the published annals of England, however, no contemporary records of them exist, nor was there for sixty years in English literature any recognition of their achievements. The English claims rest almost solely upon second-hand evidence from Spanish and Italian authors, upon contemporary reports of Spanish and Italian envoys at the English court, upon records of the two letters patent issued, and upon two or three entries lately discovered in the accounts of disbursements from the privy purse of King Henry the Seventh. These are our title deeds to this continent. The evidence is doubtless conclusive, but the whole subject of Western discovery was undervalued and neglected by England for so long a period that it is no wonder if Portuguese savants deny the reality of those voyages, seeing that their nation has been supplanted by a race which can now show so little original evidence of its claim. It is not my intention to wander over all the debatable ground of the Cabot voyages, where every circumstance bristles with conflicting theories. The original authorities are few and scanty, but mountains of hypotheses have been built upon them, and too often the suppositions of one writer have been the facts of a succeeding one. Step by step the learned students before alluded to have established certain propositions which appear to me to be true, and which I shall accept without further discussions. Among these I count the following. 1. That John Cabot was a Venetian of Genoese birth, naturalized at Venice on March 28, 1476, after the customary fifteen years of residence, and that he subsequently settled in England with all his family. 2. That Sebastian, his second son, was born in Venice, and when very young, was taken by his father to England with the rest of the family. 3 that on petition of John Cabot and his three sons, Louis, Sebastian, and Sancio, letters patent of King Henry the Seventh were issued, under date March 5, 1496, empowering them at their own expense to discover and take possession for England of new lands, not before found by any Christian nation. 4. That John Cabot, accompanied perhaps by his son Sebastian, sailed from Bristol early in May 1497, he discovered and landed upon some parts of America between Cape Cod in Massachusetts and Cape Chidley in Labrador, that he returned to Bristol before the end of July of the same year, that, whatever might have been the number of vessels which started, 
The discovery was made by John Cabot's own vessel, the Matthew of Bristol, with a crew of eighteen men. Five. That thereupon, and in consideration of this discovery made by John Cabot, King Henry the Seventh granted new letters patents drawn solely to John Cabot, authorizing a second expedition on a more extended scale and with fuller royal authority, which letters patent were dated February third, fourteen ninety eight that this expedition sailed in the spring of 1498 and had not returned in October. It consisted of several ships and about 300 men. That John and Sebastian Cabot sailed on this voyage. When it returned is not known. From the time of sailing of this expedition, John Cabot vanishes into the unknowable, and from thenceforth Sebastian alone appears in the historical record. These points are now fully supported by satisfactory evidence, mostly documentary and contemporary as for john cabot sebastian said he died which is one of the few undisputed facts in the discussion but if sebastian is correctly reported in ramusio to have said that he died at the time when the news of columbus's discovery reached england then sebastian cabot told an untruth because the letters patent of fourteen ninety eight were addressed to john cabot alone the son had a gift of reticence concerning others including his father and brothers which in these latter days has been the cause of much wearisome research to scholars to avoid further discussion of the preceding point is however a great gain from among the numerous opinions concerning the landfall of john cabot three theories emerge which may be seriously entertained all three being supported by evidence of much weight one that it was in newfoundland two that it was on the labrador coast three that it was on the island of cape breton until a comparatively recent period it was universally held by english writers that newfoundland was the part of north america first seen by cabot the name newfoundland lends itself to this view for in the letters patent of fourteen ninety eight the expression quote, land and isles of late found end quote, and the wording of the award recorded in the king's privy purse accounts august tenth fourteen ninety seven Quote, to him that found the new isle ten pounds end quote, seem naturally to suggest the island of newfoundland of our day and this impression is strengthened by reading the old authors who spell it as richard woodburn in fifteen eighty eight newfoundland in three words with connecting hyphens and often with the definite article the newfoundland a cursory reading of the whole literature of american discovery before eighteen thirty one would suggest that idea and some writers of the present day still maintain it authors of other nationalities have however always disputed it and have pushed the english discoveries far north to labrador and even to greenland champlain who read and studied everything relating to his profession concedes to the english the coast of labrador north of fifty six degrees and the regions about davis strait and the maps which for a long period with a few notable exceptions were made only by Spaniards, Portuguese, and Italians, bear out Champlain's remonstrances. It seems, moreover, on a cursory consideration of the maps, probable that a vessel on a westerly course passing south of Ireland should strike somewhere on the coast of Newfoundland, about Cape Bonavista, and, Cabot being an Italian, that very place suggests itself by its name as his probable landfall the english who for the most part have had their greatness thrust upon them by circumstances neglected cabot's discovery for fifty years and during that time the french and portuguese took possession of the whole region and named all the coasts then when the troubled reign of henry the eighth was over the english people began to wake up and in fact rediscovered cabot and his voyages a careful study however of the subject will be likely to lead to the rejection of the newfoundland landfall plausible as it may at first sight appear in the year eighteen thirty one richard biddle a lawyer of pittsburgh pennsylvania published a memoir of sebastian cabot which led the way to an almost universal change of opinion he advanced the theory that labrador was the cabot landfall in fourteen ninety seven his book is one of great research and though confused in its arrangement is written with much vigor and ability but biddle lost the historian in the advocate his book is a passionate brief for sebastian cabot for he strangely conceives the son to have been wronged by the ascription to john cabot of any portion of the merit of the discovery of america not only would he suppress the elder cabot 
but he covers the well-meaning Haklut with opprobrium and undermines his character by insinuations, much as a criminal lawyer might be supposed to do to an adverse witness in a jury trial. Valuable as the work is, there is a singular heat pervading it, fatal to the true historic spirit. Haklut is the pioneer of the literature of English discovery and adventure, at once the recorder and inspirer of noble effort. He is more than a translator. He spared no pains nor expense to obtain from the lips of seamen their own versions of their voyages. And if discrepancies are met with in a collection so voluminous, it is not surprising and need not be ascribed to a set purpose, for Haklut's sole objective in life seems to have been to record all he knew or could ascertain of the maritime achievements of the age. Biddle's book marks an epoch in the controversy. In truth, he seems to be the first who gave minute study to the original authorities and broke away from the tradition of Newfoundland. He fixed the landfall on the coast of Labrador, and Humboldt and Cole added the weight of their great learning to his theory. Harris, who in his John and Sebastian Cabot had written in favor of Cape Breton, has, in his latest book, The Discovery of America, gone back to Labrador as his faith in the celebrated map of 1544 gradually waned, and his esteem for the character of Sebastian Cabot faded away. Such changes of view, not only in this, but in other matters, render Mr. Harris's books somewhat confusing, although the student of American history can never be sufficiently thankful for his untiring research. The discovery in Germany by von Martius in 1843 of an engraved Mappe Monde, bearing date of 1544, and purporting to be issued under the authority of Sebastian Cabot, soon caused a general current of opinion in favor of a landfall in Cape Breton. The map is unique, and is now in the National Library at Paris. It bears no name of publisher, nor place of publication. Around it, for forty years, controversy has waxed warm. Cole does not accept the map as authentic. Davezac, on the contrary, gives it full credence. The tide of opinion has set of late in favor of it, and in consequence in favor of the Cape Breton landfall, because it bears, plainly inscribed upon that island, the words Prima Tierra Vista, and the legends which are around the map identify beyond question that as the landfall of the first voyage. Dr. Dean, in Winter's Narrative and Critical History, supports this view. Markham, in his introduction to the volume of the Haklit Society in 1893, also accepts it. And our own honorary secretary, the late Sir John Burinot, in his learned and exhaustive monograph on Cape Breton, inclines to the same theory. I do not propose here to discuss the difficult problems of this map. For many years, under the influence of current traditions and cursory reading, I believe the landfall of John Cabot to have been in Newfoundland, but a closer study of the original authorities has led me to concur in the view which places it somewhere on the island of Cape Breton. At the threshold of an inquiry into the Prima Tierra Vista, or landfall of 1497, it is before all things necessary to distinguish sharply, in every recorded detail, between the first and second voyages. I venture to think that, if this had always been done, much confusion and controversy would have been avoided. It was not done by the older writers, and the writers of later years have followed them without sufficiently observing that the authorities they were building upon were referring almost solely to the second voyage. Even when some occasional detail of the first voyage was introduced, the circumstances of the second voyage were interwoven and became dominant in the narrative, so that the impression of one voyage only remains upon the mind. We must therefore always remember the antithesis which exists between them. Thus the first voyage was made in one small vessel with a crew of eighteen men, the second with five ships and three hundred men. The first voyage was undertaken with John Cabot's own resources, the second with the royal authority to take six ships and their outfit on the same conditions as if for king's service. The first voyage was a private venture, the second an official expedition. The first voyage extended over three months and was provisioned for that period only. The second was victualled for twelve months and extended over six months at least, for how much longer it is not known. The course of the first voyage was south of Ireland, then for a while north and afterward west, 
with the pole star on the right hand. The course of the second, until land was seen, was north, into northern seas, towards the North Pole, in the direction of Iceland, to the Cape of Labrador, at 58 degrees north latitude. On the first voyage no ice was reported, on the second the leading features were bergs and floes of ice, and long days of Arctic summer. On the first voyage Cabot saw no man, on the second he found people clothed with, quote-unquote, beast skins. During the whole of the first voyage John Cabot was the commander. On the second voyage he sailed in command, but who brought the expedition home, and when it returned, are not recorded. It is not known how or when John Cabot died, and although the letters patent for the second voyage were addressed to him alone, his son Sebastian, during forty-five years, took the whole credit in every subsequent mention of the discovery of America without any allusion to his father. This antithesis may throw light upon the suppression of his father's name in all the statements attributed to or made by Sebastian Cabot. He may always have had the second voyage in his mind. His father may have died on the voyage. He was marvelously reticent about his father. The only mention which occurs is on the map seen by Haklut, and on the map of 1544, supposed, somewhat rashly, to be a transcript of it. There the discovery is attributed to John Cabot and to Sebastian, his son, and that has reference to the first voyage. From these considerations it would appear that those who place the landfall at Labrador are right, but it is the landfall of the second voyage, the voyage Sebastian was always talking about, not the landfall of John Cabot in 1497. If Sebastian Cabot had not been so much wrapped up in his own vainglory, we might have had a full record of the eventful voyage which revealed to Europe the shores of our Canadian dominion first of all the lands on the continents of the Western Hemisphere. Fortunately, however, there resided in London at that time a most intelligent Italian, Raimondo di Soncino, envoy of the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza, one of those despots of the Renaissance who almost atoned for their treachery and cruelty by their thirst for knowledge and love of arts. Him Soncino kept informed of all matters going on at London, and especially concerning matters of cosmography, to which the Duke was much devoted. From his letters we are enabled to retrace the momentous voyage of the little Matthew of Bristol across the Western Ocean, not the sunny region of steady trade winds by whose favouring influence Columbus was wafted to his destination, but the boisterous reaches of the northern Atlantic, over that quote-unquote still vexed sea, which shares with one or two others the reputation of being the most storm-tossed region in the world of ocean that the land discovered was supposed to be a part of asia appears very clearly from the same letters it was in the territory of the grand cam the land was good and the climate temperate and cabot intended on his next voyage after occupying that place to proceed farther westward until he should arrive at the longitude of japan which island he evidently thought to be south of his landfall and near the equator. It should be carefully noted that, in all the circumstances on record, which are indisputably referable to his first voyage, nothing has been said of ice or of any notable extension of daylight. These are the marks of the second voyage, for if anything unusual had existed in the length of the day, it would have been at its maximum on Midsummer's Day, June 24th, the day he made land. Nothing is reported in these letters, which indicates a high latitude. Now Labrador is a cold, waste region of rock, swamps, and mountains. Even inside the Strait of Belle-Ile it is so barren and forbidding as to call forth Cartier's off-sighted remark that, quote, it was like the land God gave to Cain, unquote. The coast of Labrador is not the place to invite a second voyage, if it's once seen but the climate of cape breton is very pleasant in early summer and the country is well wooded from the contemporary documents relating specially to the first voyage it is beyond question that cabot saw no human being on the coast though he brought back evidences of their presence at some previous time it is beyond doubt also on the same authority that the voyage lasted not longer than three months and that provisions gave out so that he had not time to land on the return voyage it was, in fact, a reconnoitering expedition to prepare the way for a greater effort and establish confidence in the existence of land across the ocean easily reached from England. 
The distance sailed is given by Soncino at 400 leagues, but Pascualigo, writing to Venice, gives it at 700 leagues, equivalent to 2,226 miles, which is very nearly the distance between Bristol and Cape Breton, as now estimated. All these circumstances concerning the first voyage are derived from John Cabot's own reports, and are extracted from documents dated previous to the return of the second expedition, and therefore are, of necessity, free from admixture of extraneous evidence. Antonio Galvano, an experienced Portuguese sailor and cosmographer, writing in 1563, like the others, knows of one voyage only, which he fixes in 1496. He interweaves, like them, in his narrative many circumstances of the second voyage, but it is important to note that from some independent source is given the landfall at 45 degrees, the latitude very nearly of Cape Breton, on the island of Cape Breton. Another point is also recorded in the letters that, on the return voyage, Cabot passed two islands to the right, which the shortness of his provisions prevented him from examining. This note should not be considered identical with the statement recorded by Soncino in his first letter, for this last writer evidently means to indicate the land which Cabot found and examined. He says that Cabot discovered two large and fertile islands, but the two islands of Pascualigo were passed without examination. They were probably the islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, but that John Cabot had no idea of a northward voyage at that time in his mind would appear from his intention to sail farther to the east on his next voyage, until he reached the longitude of Sipango. Moreover, the reward recorded in the King's Privy Purse accounts, quote, to him that found the new isle, end quote, and the wording, thrice repeated, of the second letter's patent, quote, the land and isles of late found by the said John, end quote, indicates that it was not at that time known whether the mainland of Cathay had been reached, or, as in the discoveries of Columbus, islands upon the coast of Asia. From the preceding narrative, based solely upon documents written within twelve months of the event, which documents are records of statements taken from the lips of John Cabot, the chief actor, at the very time of his return from the first voyage, it will, I trust, appear that in 1497, at a time of year when the ice was not clear from the coasts of Labrador, he discovered a part of America in a temperate climate, and that this was done without the name of Sebastian Cabot once coming to the surface, excepting when it appears in the patent of 1496, together with the names of Luis and Sancio, his brothers. While the circumstances recorded are incompatible with a landfall at Labrador, they do not exclude the possibility of a landfall on the eastern coast of Newfoundland, which is so varied in its character as to correspond with almost any conditions likely to be found in a landfall on the American coast. But inasmuch as, from other reasons, it will, I think, appear that the landfall was at Cape Breton, it will be a shorter process to prove by a positive argument where it was, than to show by a negative argument where it was not. I might here borrow the quaint phrase of Herodotus and say, now I have done speaking of John Cabot. He has beyond doubt discovered the eastern coast of this our Canada, and he has organized a second expedition, and he has sailed in command. Forthwith, upon such sailing, he vanishes utterly, and his second son, Sebastian, both of his brothers having in some unknown way also vanished, emerges, and from henceforth becomes the whole Cabot family. It behooves us, therefore, if we wish to grasp the whole subject, to inquire what manner of man he was. Sebastian Cabot was born in Venice, and when still very young, was taken to England with the rest of his family by his father. He was then, however, old enough to have learned the humanities and the properties of the sphere, and to this latter knowledge he became so addicted that he, early in life, formed fixed ideas. He is probably entitled to the merit of having urged the practical application of the truths that the shortest course from point to point upon the globe lies upon a great circle, and also that the great circle uniting Western Europe with Cathay passes over the North Pole. This fixed idea of the younger Cabot pervaded all his life and shows in all his reported conversations. He adhered to it with the pertinacity of a Columbus, and in his later life, after his return to England, his efforts, which in youth were directed to a northwest passage, 
went out towards a north east passage to Catay. John Cabot's genius was more practical, as the second letter of Raimondo of Soncino shows. His intention was to occupy on the second voyage the landfall he had made, and then push on to the east, west as we call it now, and south. The diversion of that expedition to the coast of Labrador would indicate that the death of the elder Cabot and the assumption of command by his son occurred early in the voyage. Sebastian Cabot seems to have been not so much a great sailor as a great nautical theorizer. Gomara says he discovered nothing for Spain, and beyond doubt his expedition to La Plata cannot be considered successful, for it was intended to reach the Moluccas. One fixed idea of his life was the course to Cathay by the north. That idea he monopolized to himself. He overvalued its importance and thought to be the Columbus of a new highway to the east. Hence he may have underrated his father's achievements as he brooded over what he considered to be his own great secret. He theorized on the sphere, and he theorized on the variation of the compass, and he theorized on a method of finding longitude by the variation of the needle, so that even Richard Eden, who greatly admired him, wrote as follows. Sebastian Cabot, on his deathbed, told me that he had the knowledge thereof, longitude by variation, by divine revelation, yet so that he might not teach any man. But I think that the good old man in that extreme age somewhat doted, and had not, yet even in the article of death, utterly shaken off all worldly vainglory. These words would seem to contain the solution of most of the mystery of the suppression of John Cabot's name in the narrative of Peter Martyr, Ramusio, Gomara, and all the other writers who derived their information from Sebastian Cabot during his long residence in Spain. And now we may pass on to the consideration of the second voyage, and first among the writers, in order of time, as also in the order of importance, is Peter Martyr of Anghiera, who published his Decades of the New World in 1516. Sebastian Cabot had then been in Spain for four years, high in office and in royal favor. Peter Martyr was his quote-unquote familiar friend and comrade, and tells the Pope, to whom these decades were addressed as letters, that he wrote from information derived from Cabot's own lips. Here, I venture to think, many of the writers on this subject have gone astray, for the whole question changes. Martyr knows of only one voyage, and that was beyond doubt the voyage of 1498. He knows of only one discoverer, and that's the man from whose lips he writes the narrative. The landfall is far north, in a region of ice and perpetual daylight. At the very outset the subject is stated to be, quote-unquote, those northern seas. And then Peter Martyr goes on to say that Sebastian Cabot furnished two ships at his own charges, and that, with three hundred men, he sailed toward the North Pole, where he saw land, and that then he was compelled to turn westward, and after that he coasted to the south until he reached the latitude of Gibraltar, and that he was west of the longitude of Cuba. In other words, he struck land far in the north, and from that point he sailed south along the coast as far as Cape Hatteras. That Labrador was the landfall seems clear for he met large masses of ice in the month of July. These were not merely the bergs of the western ocean, but masses of field ice, which compelled him to change his course from north to west, and finally to turn southward. The same writer states that Cabot himself named a portion of the great land he coasted Bacalaos, because of the quantity of fish, which was so great that they hindered the sailing of his ships, and that these fishes were called Bacalaos by the natives. This statement has given rise to much dispute. As to the quantity of fish, all succeeding writers concur that it was immense beyond conception, and probably the swarming of the salmon up the rivers of our Pacific coast may afford a parallel, but that Cabot did not so name the country is abundantly clear. A very exhaustive note on the word will be found at page 131 of Dr. Bouinot's Cape Breton. Bearing in mind the preceding considerations, the study of the early maps will become profitable, and I would now direct attention to them to ascertain what light they may throw upon the landfall of John Cabot and the island of St. John opposite to it. It must be remembered that John Cabot took the time to go on shore at his landfall and planted the banners of England and St. Mark there. 
At that time of year, and in that latitude, it was light at half past three, but it was five when he saw land, and he had to reach it and perform the ceremonies appropriate for such occasions, so the island opposite could not be far away. The island, then, will be useful to identify the landfall if we find it occurring frequently on the succeeding maps. Don Pedro de Ayala, joint Spanish ambassador at London, wrote on July twenty fifth, fourteen ninety eight, to his sovereigns that he had procured and would send a copy of John Cabot's chart of his first voyage. This map of Juan de la Cosa is evidence that Ayala fulfilled his promise. It is a manuscript map made at the end of the year fifteen hundred by the eminent Biscayan pilot, who, if not the equal of Columbus in nautical and cosmographical knowledge, was easily the second to him. Upon it there is a continuous coastline from Labrador to Florida, showing that the claim made by Sebastian Cabot of having coasted from a region of ice and snow to the latitude of Gibraltar was accepted as true by La Cosa, whatever later Spanish writers may have said. Recent writers of authority have arrived at the conclusion that, immediately after Columbus and Cabot had opened the way, many independent adventurers visited the western seas, for there are a number of geographical facts recorded on the earliest charts not easy to account for on any other hypothesis. Dr. Justin Windsor shows that La Cosa and others of the great sailors of the earliest years of discovery soon recognized that they had encountered a veritable barrier to Asia, consisting of islands or an island of continental size, through which they had to find a passage to the Golden East. Their views were not, however, generally accepted that la cosa based the northern part of his map upon cabot's discoveries is demonstrated by the english flags marked along the coast and the legend mar descubierto por ingleses because no english but the cabot expeditions had been there and what is evidently intended for cape race is called cao de inglaterra the english flags mark off the coast from that cape to what may be considered as cape hatteras cabot as before stated confidently expected to reach Katai. He sailed for that as his objective point, and he was looking for a broad western ocean, so that narrow openings were to him simply bays of greater or less depth. The sailors of those early voyages coasted from headland to headland, upon which the recesses of the sinuosities of the coast are not completed lines, and it must be borne in mind that in sailing between Newfoundland and Cape Breton, the bold and peculiar contour of both can be seen at the same time. This is possible in anything like clear weather, but in the bright weather of Midsummer Day, Cape Ray would necessarily have been seen from St. Paul's, and the opening might well have been taken for a deep indentation of the coast. Between Cabo Descubierto and Cabo San Jorge, such an indentation is shown on the map, but the line is closed, showing that Cabot did not sail through. Cabo Descubierto, the discovered cape, and close to it, Mar Descubierto por Ingleses. What can be more evident, then, that the spot where Europeans first touched the American continent is thus indicated? Why otherwise should it especially be called the discovered cape, if not because this cape was first discovered? It is stated elsewhere that on the same day, opposite the land, an island was also discovered, and in fact, upon the Madrid facsimile, two small islands are found, one of which is near Cabo Descubierto. The name, the discovered cape, at the extreme end of a series of names, tells its own story. Cabot overran Cape Reyes and went south of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon without seeing them, and continuing on a westerly course, hit Cape Breton at its most easterly point. An apt illustration occurs in a voyage made by the ship Bonaventure in 1591, recorded in Haklut. She overshot Cape Reyes without knowing it, and came to the soundings on the bank south of St. Peter's, where they found twenty fathoms, and then the course was set northwest by north for Cape Ray. The course was sharply altered towards a definite and known point, but if he did not see Cape Reyes, not knowing what was before him, Cabot would have had no object in abruptly altering his course, but continuing his westerly course would strike the east point of Cape Breton. That point, then, and not Cape North, would be the discovered Cape, La Prima Vista, and there, not far off, quote-unquote, over against the land, opposite the land, ex adverso, he would find Scatari Island, which would be the island of St. John, 
so continually attendant on cape breton upon the succeeding maps if this theory be accepted all becomes clear and the little matthew having achieved success having demonstrated the existence of cathay within easy reach of england returned home noticing and naming the salient features of the south coast of newfoundland she had not too much time to do it for she was back in bristol in thirty-four days at most this theory is further confirmed by the circumstance recorded by pasqualigo that as cabot returned he saw two islands on the right which he had not time to examine being short of provisions these islands would be saint pierre and miquelon for there are two and only two important islands possible to be seen at the right on the south coast of newfoundland on the homeward course la cosa beside the two small islands above noted has marked on his map three larger islands isla de la trinidad san grigor and isla verde but they are not laid down on the map in the places of saint pierre and miquelon nor are there any islands existing in the positions shown isla de la trinidad is doubtless the peninsula of burin as would appear by its position almost in contact with the land and its very peculiar shape in coasting along it would appear as an island for the isthmus is very narrow and saint pierre and miquelon would be clearly seen as islands on the right as for the bearings of the coast it will appear by a comparison with champlain's large map that they are compass bearings for they are the same on both i have dwelt at length upon the map of la cosa because for our northern coasts it is in effect john cabot's map after the return of the second expedition the english made a few voyages but soon fell back into the old rut of their iceland trade the expedition was beyond question a commercial failure and therefore like the practical people they are they neglected that new continent which was destined to become the chief theatre for the expansion of their race their fishermen were for many years to be found in small numbers only on the coast and as before their supply of codfish was drawn from iceland where they could sell goods in exchange meantime the bretons and normans and the basques of france and spain and the portuguese grasped that which england practically abandoned that landfall which cabot gave her in fourteen ninety seven cost much blood and treasure to win back in seventeen fifty eight the french fishermen were on the coast as early as fifteen o four and the names on la cosa's map were displaced by french names still surviving on the south coast and on what is called the french shore of newfoundland robert thorne in fifteen twenty seven and no doubt others unrecorded in vain urged upon the english government to vindicate its right according to the papal bulls and the treaty of tordesillas the new lands were portuguese east of a meridian three hundred seventy leagues west of the cape of verd islands and spanish to the west of it bacalaos and labrador were considered to be portuguese and upon the maps when any mention is made of english discoveries they are accordingly relegated to greenland or the far north of labrador the whole claim of england went by abandonment and default the portuguese as the reverend dr patterson has shown named all the east coast of newfoundland and their traces are even yet found on the coasts of nova scotia and of cape breton therefore it is that the maps we have now to refer to are not so much spanish as portuguese they will tell us nothing of the english nor of cabot but we shall be able to follow his island of st john the only one of his names which survived the outlines of some very early maps are given by kunstmann kretschmer and windsor but until fifteen o five they have no bearing upon our problem in that year reiner's map was made and although newfoundland forms part of tierra firma the openings north and south of it are plainly indicated by unclosed lines cape race has received its permanent name razo and although only the east coast of newfoundland is named there is no possibility of mistaking the easternmost point of cape breton just opposite ex adverso is laid down and named the island of samjoa in latitude forty six degrees the precise latitude of scatari island here then in fifteen o five is in this island of st john and independent testimony to the landfall of fourteen ninety seven not off cape north which does not yet appear nor inside the gulf for it is not even indicated but in the atlantic ocean at the cape of cape breton 
the Cabo Descubierto of La Cosa. I have not considered it necessary to prove that if Cabot's landfall were Cape North, he could not have discovered the low-lying shore of Prince Edward Island on the same day. I have preferred to show that Prince Edward Island was not known as an island, and did not appear on any map for one hundred years after John Cabot's death. If Cabot had possessed a modern map, and had been looking for Prince Edward Island, and had pushed on without landing at the North Cape of Cape Breton, and had shaped his course southward, he might have seen it in a long midsummer day, but Cabot did not press on. He landed and examined the country, and found close to it St. John's Island, which he also examined. Upon that easternmost point of this Nova Scotia land of our common country, John Cabot planted the banner of St. George on June 24, 1497, more than one year before Columbus set foot upon the main continent of America. And now, after four hundred years, despite all the chances and changes of this western world, that banner is floating there, a witness to our existing union with our distant motherland across the ocean. End of section 26《Section 27 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 8, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Sea Route to India. Vasco da Gama Sails Around Africa, A.D. 1498. By Gaspar Correa, Part 1. The same goal which attracted the Spaniards westward drew the Portuguese south, the desire to find a sea route to India, and thus garner the enormous profits of the trade in spices and other Indian wealth. In the early years of the 15th century, the Portuguese, overshadowed by the Spanish kingdom, which almost enclosed their country, realized that they could extend their territory only by colonizing beyond seas. They began, therefore, to send out expeditions, and in 1410 discovered the island of Madeira. Soon afterward, discoveries were undertaken by Prince Henry, called the Navigator, whose whole life was given to these enterprises. Before his death, 1460, his Portuguese mariners, in successive voyages, had worked their way well down the western coast of Africa. In 1462, an expedition reached Sierra Leone, almost halfway down the continent. Nine years later, the equator was passed, and in 1486, Bartholomew Diaz sailed around the southern point of Africa, which he had been sent to discover. On his return voyage, 1487, he found the Cape of Good Hope, having before doubled it without knowing that he had done so. To Portuguese navigators, the way to India by this route was soon made clear. In 1497, Vasco da Gama was placed by King Emmanuel I of Portugal in command of an expedition of three small ships sent to discover such a route. He sailed from Lisbon in July of that year, in November doubled the Cape of Good Hope, arrived at Calicut on the Malabar coast of India in May 1498, and in September 1499 returned to Lisbon. He was accompanied by his brother Paolo, who, with other of the celebrated navigator's companions, appears in the following account of this great achievement. The quaint narrative was written by the chronicler who accompanied the expedition in person. The ships being equipped and ready, one Sunday the king went with Queen Doña Maria to hear Mass, which was said pontifically by the Bishop Calcadilla, who also made a discourse in praise of the voyage and holy design of the king in regard to the new discovery which he was commanding to be made. And he called upon the people to pray to the Lord that the voyage might be for his holy service 
and for the exalting of his holy faith, and for the increase of the good and honor of the kingdom of Portugal. At the mass, the good brothers da Gama and their associates were present, richly dressed, and the king showed them great honor and favor as they stood close to the curtain, where also were the principal lords of the realm and gentlemen of the court. Mass being over, the king came out from the curtain and spoke to the captains who placed themselves on their knees before him, and they spoke to him, saying, Sire, the honor we are receiving from your highness is so great that with a hundred bodies and lives which we might expend in your service, we never could repay the least part of it, since greater honors were never shown by a sovereign to his vassals than you have shown us, as the great prince, king, and lord that you are, with such magnanimity and honor, that if at this very moment we should die, our lineage should remain in the highest degree of honor which is possible, only because your highness has chosen and sent us for this work, while you have so many and such noble vassals to whom to commit it, for which we are already recompensed before rendering this service and until we end our lives in performing it. For this we beg of the mercy of the Lord that he direct us, and we may perform such works that he, the Lord, and your highness also, may be served in some measure in this so great favor that has been shown us, as he knows that such is our desire, and should we not be deserving to serve him in this voyage, and so holy undertaking, may the Lord be pleased, though we may pay with our lives for our shortcomings in the work. We promise, Your Highness, that our lives will be the matters of least moment that we shall adventure in this so great favor that has been shown us, and that we will not return before Your Highness with our lives in our bodies without bringing some certain information of that which Your Highness desires. And they all again kissed the hands of the king and of the queen. Then the king came forth from the cathedral and went to his palace, which then was in the residence of the Alcazar in the castle. There went before him the captains, and before them the standard which was carried by their ensign in whom they trusted. And on arriving at the palace, the king dismissed them, and they again kissed his and the queen's hand. Vasco da Gama on a horse, with all the men of the fleet on foot, richly dressed in liveries, and accompanied by all the gentlemen of the court, went down to the wharf on the bank and embarked in their boats, and the standard went in that of Paulo da Gama. Then, taking leave of the gentlemen, they went to the ships, and on their arrival they fired all their artillery, and the ships were dressed out gaily with standards and flags and many ornaments, and the royal standard was at once placed at the top of the mast of Paulo da Gama, for so Vasco da Gama commanded. Discharging all their artillery, they loosened the sails, and went beating to windward on the river of Lisbon, tacking until they came to anchor at Belen, where they remained three days, waiting for a wind to go out. There they made a muster of the crews, and the king was there all the time in the monastery, where all confessed and communicated. The king commanded that they should write down in a book all the men of each ship by name, with the names of their fathers, mothers, and wives of the married men, and the places of which they were native. And the king ordered that this book should be preserved in the house of the mines, in order that the payments which were due should be made upon their return. The king also ordered that a hundred cruzados should be paid to each of the married men for them to leave it to their wives, and forty cruzados to each of the single men for them to fit themselves out with certain things, for, as to provisions, they had not got to lay them in, for the ships were full of them. To the two brothers was paid a gratification of two thousand cruzados to each of them, and a thousand to Nicolas Cuerjo. When it was the day of Our Lady of March, the 25th, 1497, all heard Mass. They then embarked, and loosened the sails, and went forth from the river, 
the king coming out to accompany them in his boat, and addressing them all with blessings and good wishes. When he took leave of them, his boat lay on its oars until they disappeared, as is shown in the painting of his city of Lisbon. Vasco da Gama went in the ship São Rafael, and Paulo da Gama in the São Gabriel, and Nicolas Corjo in the other ship, São Miguel. In each ship there were as many as eighty men, officers and seamen, and the others of the leader's family, servants and relations, all filled with the desire to undertake the labor that was fitting for each, and with great trust in the favors which they hoped for from the king on their return to Portugal. Paulo de Gama, as he went out with the Lisbon River, hauled down the royal standard from the masthead, but at the great supplications of his brother, who gave him good reasons why it was fitting that he should carry it, he again hoisted it. The two companions, standing out to sea, as I have said, made their way toward Cape Verde, and for that purpose they stood well out to sea to make the coast, which they knew they would find, as it advanced much to seaward, as they learned from the sailors who had been in the caravels of Gian Infante. They ran as far as they could to see in the direction of the wind, to double the land without difficulty, and thus they navigated until they made the coast, and having reconnoitred it, they tacked and stood out to sea, hauling on the bowline as much as they could, as so they ran for many days. And as it seemed to them that now they could double the land, they again tacked toward the coast, also on the bowline, against the wind, until they again saw the coast, much farther on than where the caravels had reached, which the masters knew from the soundings which they had got written down from the voyage of Gian Infante, and the days which they found to have less sun by the clocks. Having well ascertained this, they stood out again to sea, thus forcing the ships to windward. They went so far out to the sea toward the south that there was almost not six hours of sunlight in the day, and the wind was very powerful, so that the sea was very fearful to see, without ever being smooth either by day or night. But they always met with storms, so that the crews suffered much hardship. After a month that they had run on this tack, they stood into shore, and went as long as they could, all praying to the Lord that they might have doubled beyond the land. But when they again saw it, they were very sad, though they found themselves much advanced by the signs of the soundings which the pilots took, and they saw land of another shape, which they had not before seen. Seeing that the coast ran out to sea, the masters and pilots were in great confusion, and, doubtful of standing out again to sea, saying that the land went across the sea and had no end to it. This being heard of by Vasco de Gama, according as it was presumed to the information he had from the Jew Zacuto, he told the pilots that they should not imagine such a thing, and that without doubt they would find the end of that land, and beyond it much sea and lands to run by. And he said to them, I assure you that the Cape is very near, and with another tack standing out to sea, when you return, you will find the Cape doubled. This Vasco da Gama said to encourage them, because he saw that they were much disheartened, and with the inclination to wish to put back to Portugal. So he ordered them to put the ships about to sea, which they did much against their will for which reason Vasco da Gama determined to stand on this tack so long as to be able to double the end of the land, and besought all not to take account of their labors, since for that purpose they had ventured upon them, and that they should put their trust in the Lord that they would double the cape. Thus he gave them great encouragement, without ever sleeping or taking repose, but always taking part with them in hardship, coming up at the boatswain's pipe as they all did. So they went on, standing out to sea, till they found it all broken up with the storm, with enormous waves and darkness. As the days were very short, it always seemed night. The masts and shrouds were stayed, because with the fury of the sea the ships seemed every moment to be going to pieces. 
the crews grew sick with fear and hardship, because also they could not prepare their food, and all clamored for putting back to Portugal, and that they did not choose to die like stupid people who sought death with their own hands. Thus they made clamor and lamentation, of which there was much more in other ships. But the captains excused themselves, saying that they would do nothing except what Vasco da Gama did, and he and his companions underwent great labor. As he was a very choleric man, at times with angry words, he made them be silent, although he well saw how much reason they had at every moment to despair of their lives, and they had been going for about two months on that tack, and the masters and pilots cried out to him to take another tack, but the captain major did not choose, though the ships were now letting in much water, by which their labors were doubled, because the days were short and the nights long, which caused them increased fear of death, and at this time they met with such cold rains that the men could not move. All cried out to God for mercy upon their souls, for now they no longer took heed of their lives. It now seemed to Vasco da Gama that the time was come for making another tack, and he comforted himself very angrily, swearing that if they did not double the cape, he would stand out to sea again as many times until the cape was doubled, or there should happen whatever should please God. For which reason, from fear of this, the masters took much more trouble to advance as much as they could, and they took more heart on nearing the land and escaping from the tempest of the sea, and all called upon God for mercy and to give them guidance when they saw themselves out of such great dangers. Thus approaching the land, they found their labor less and the seas calmer, so they went on running for a long time, steering so as to make the land and to ease the ships, which they were better able to do at night when the captain slept, which the other ships did also, as they followed the lantern which Vasco da Gama carried. At night the ships showed lights to one another so as not to part company. Seeing how much they had run and did not find the land, they sailed larger so as to make it, and as they did not find it, and as the sea and wind were moderate, they knew they had doubled the cape, on which great joy fell among them, and they gave great praise to the Lord on seeing themselves delivered from death. The pilots continued to sail more free, spreading all the sails, and running in this manner, one morning they sighted some mountain peaks which seemed to touch the clouds, at which their pleasure was so great that all wept with joy, and all devoutly on their knees said the salve. After running all day till night, they were not able to reach it, and discovered great mountain ridges. So, as it was night, they ran along the coast which lay from east to west, and they took in all the sails, only running under large sails, for these were the orders of the captain major. The next day at dawn they again set all the sails and ran to the land, so that at midday they saw a beach which was all rocky, and running along it they saw deep creeks and such large bays that they could not see the land at the end of them. They also found the mouths of great rivers, from which water came forth to the sea with a powerful current. Here also near the land they found many fish, which they killed with fish spears. The watchmen in the tops were always on the lookout to see if there were shoals ahead. The crews grew sick with fever from the fish which they ate, on which account they ate no more. The pilots, on heaving the lead, found no bottom, so they ran on for three days, and at night they kept away from the land and shortened sail. Sailing in this manner, they fell in with the mouth of a large river, and the captain major ordered a boat to be lowered, and the pilot to sound the entrance of the river, and he said it was superfluous, because if there was a shoal, it would be burst through. Then they took in the sails, excepting the great one, 
with which they entered the river, which was very large, and they went up it, the boat going before and sounding, and approaching land, where they found twelve fathoms, they anchored. There they found very good fish, for the river was of fresh water, but in the whole of the river they found no beach, for there was nothing but rocks and crags. Then Vasco da Gama went to see his brother, and so did Nicholas Coelho, and they all dined with great satisfaction, talking of the hardships they had gone through. When they had finished dining, Vasco da Gama ordered Nicolas Coelho to go in his boat up the river to see if he found any village. He went up more than five leagues without finding anything besides many streams, which came from between the mountains to pour into the river. There were no woods in the country, nothing but stones on both sides of the river, upon which he returned to the captain major. Then, the following day, before the morning, Vasco da Gama again ordered Nicholas Coelho to go in a boat with sails and oars and with provisions to eat, and told him to go as far as the head of the river, to see if he could find anyone to speak to, to learn what country they were in. He went up the river a distance of more than twenty leagues, and returned without having found anything. Then they decided on going out again, and they took in water and wood of the dry trees which, it seems, the river brings down when it comes from the mountain. On that account, the Captain Major wished himself in person to discover the river up to its head, to see whence could come those trees which they found there dry. But the masters said this would be a labor without profit, and that they ought to go out of the river and make for the country which they wished to seek, and they would find it. This seemed good to the Captain Major, and they came out of the river with much labor, as the wind was contrary, and entered the mouth of the river. A strong current of the river, which went out to sea, alone assisted them, and with it they went outside without sails, only towing with the boats which guided them. When the ships returned to sea, they ran along the coast with great precaution, and a good lookout not to run upon any shoals and they entered other great rivers and bays, and they explored everywhere and searched without ever being able to meet with people nor boats in the seas, for all the country was uninhabited, and in entering and leaving the rivers they endured much fatigue and were much vexed at not being able to learn in what country they were. With these detentions and delays they wasted much time and spent all the summer of that country, so they had to run along the coast, because winds were favorable for going ahead, for they were westerly. And because they found everything desolate, without people by land or sea, they agreed unanimously not to enter any more rivers, but to run ahead, and thus they did. For by day they ran under full sail, drawing so near to the land as possible to see if they could make out any village or beach, which as yet they had not seen and by night they stood away to sea and ran under shortened sail navigating in this manner the wind began to moderate and fell calm altogether which happened in november when they had to struggle with another wind with which they stood out to sea fearing some contrary storm might arise then taking in all sail they lay waiting for the springing up of another wind so they went, increasing their distance from the land, till they lost sight of it. For the wind increased continually, and the sea rose greatly. For then the winter of that country was setting in. The masters, seeing that the weather was freshening, took counsel as to returning to land and putting in to some river, until meeting with a change of weather. This they did, and putting about to the land, the wind increased so much that they were afraid of not finding a river in which to shelter, and of being lost, on which account they again stood out to sea, and made ready the ships to meet the storm which they saw rising every moment, so that the water should not come in, with ropes made fast to the masts, and with the shrouds passed over the yards, so that the masts should remain more secure, 
and they took away all the panels from the tops and the sails, so as not to hold the wind. The small sails and the lower sails all struck, and with the foresails only they prepared to weather the storm. Seeing the weather in this state, the pilot and master told the captain major that they had great fear on account of the weather, because it was becoming a tempest, and the ships were weak, and that they thought they ought to put in to land and run along the coast, and return to seek the great river into which they had first entered, because the wind was blowing that way, and they could enter it for all that there was a storm. But when the captain major heard of turning backward, he answered them that they should not speak such words, because, as he was going out of the bar at Lisbon, he had promised to God in his heart not to turn back a single span's breadth of the way which he had made, that on that account they should not speak in that wise, as he would throw into the sea whomsoever spoke such things. At which the crew, in despair, abandoned themselves to the chances of the sea, which was broken up with the increase of the tempest and rising of the gale, which many times chopped round and blew from all parts, and at times fell, so that the ships were in great peril from their great laboring in the waves, which ran very high. Then the storm would again break with such fury that the seas rose toward the sky, and fell back in heavy showers which flooded the ships. The storm raging thus violently, the danger was doubled, for suddenly the wind died out, so that the ships lay dead between the waves, lurching so heavily that they took in water on both sides, and the men made themselves fast not to fall from one side to the other, and everything in the ships was breaking up, so that all cried to God for mercy. Before long the sea came in with more violence, which increased their misfortune, with the great difficulty of working the pumps, for they were taking in much water, which entered both above and below, so they had no repose for either soul or body, and the crews began to sicken and die of their great hardships. At this the pilot and masters and all the people poured out cries and lamentations to the captains, urgently requiring them to put back and seek an escape from death, which they were certain of meeting with by their own will if they did not put about, to which the captains gave no other reply than that they would do no such thing unless the captain major did it. The captain major, seeing the clamors of his crew, answered them with brave words, saying that he had already told them that backward he would not go, even though he saw a hundred deaths before his eyes. Thus he had vowed to God, and let them look to it that it was not reasonable that they should lose all the labors which they had gone through up to this time, that the Lord, who had delivered them until now, would have mercy upon them. They should remember that they had already doubled the Cape of Storms, and were in the region which they had come to seek, to discover India, on accomplishing which, and returning to Portugal, they would gain such great honor and recompenses from the king of Portugal for their children, and they should put their trust in God, who is merciful, and who, from one hour to another, would come with his mercy and give them fair weather, and that they should not talk like people who distrusted the mercy of God. But although the captain major always spoke to them these and other words of great encouragement, they did not cease from their loud clamor and protestations that he would give an account to God of their deaths, of which he would be the cause, and of the leaving desolate their wives and children. All this accompanied by weeping and cries and calls to God for mercy. While they went on this way with their souls in their mouths, the sea began to go down a little, and the wind also, so that the ships could approach to speak one another and all clamored with loud cries that they should put about to seek some place where they could refit the ships, as they could not keep them afloat with the pumps. The crews of the other ships spoke with more audacity, saying that the captain major was but one man, and they were many, and they feared death, while the captains did not fear it, nor took any account of losing their lives. 
The captain major chose that the two other ships should know his design, and he said and swore by the life of the king, his sovereign, that from the spot where he then was, he had not to turn back one span's breadth, even though the ships were laden with gold, unless he got information of that which they had come to seek, and that even if he had near there a very good port, he would not go ashore, lest some of them should retire to a certain death on shore, allowing themselves to remain there, rather than go on with the ships trusting to the mercy of God, in which they had such small reliance, that they made such exclamations from the weakness of their hearts, as if they were not Portuguese, on which account he would undeceive them all, for to Portugal they would not return unless they brought word to the king of that which he had so strongly commended to them, and that he took the same account of death as did any one of them. While they were at this point, a sudden wind arose, with so great a concussion of thunder and darkness, and a stronger blast than they had yet experienced, and the sea rose so much that the ships could not see one another except when they were upheaved by the seas, when they seemed to be among the clouds. They hung out lights so as not to part company, for the anxiety and fear which the Captain Major felt was the losing one of the ships from his company, so that the seamen would put back to Portugal by force, as indeed they had very much such a desire in their hearts. But the captains took very great care of this, because Vasco da Gama, before going out to Lisbon, when conversing alone with the Jew Zacuto in the monastery, had received from him much information as to what he should do during his voyage, and especially recommendations of great watchfulness, never to let the ships part company, because if they separated, it would be the certain destruction of all of them. Vasco da Gama took great care of this personally, and by means of his servants and relations in whom he trusted, and this they attended to with much greater solicitude after they heard the sailors say that they were many, and the captains only a few single men, and, in fact, they had in their minds such an intention of rising up against the captains, and by force putting back to Portugal, and they thought that if it became necessary to arrest them for this and bring them before the king, he would have mercy upon them, and, should they not find mercy, they preferred rather to die there where their wives and children and fathers were, and in their native country, and not in the sea, to be eat by the fishes. With such thoughts, they all spoke to one another secretly, determining to carry it out, and trusting that the king would not hang them all for the good reasons which they would give him, or else, to secure their lives, they would go to Castile until they were pardoned. This was the greatest insolence they were guilty of, and so they decided upon executing their plan. In taking this decision, they did not perceive the danger of death, into which they were going more than ever. End of section 27 Read by Linda Johnson, September 2021